Section 22 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2 The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses by Catherine Cox This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey Chapter 17 Cases rated at AI, IQ 130-140, Part 3 Charles Robert Darwin, 1809-1882 a celebrated English naturalist. AIIQ 135. AIIQ 140. 1. Family standing. The Darwins came from Lincolnshire, where they were people of some position. Charles's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, was noted as a poet, physician, and naturalist. His father took the medical degree with distinction at Edinburgh and became the leading physician at Shropshire, accumulating an abundant fortune. The maternal grandfather, Wedgwood, the famous potter, was a truly experimental genius in artistic manufacture. The mother was gentle and sympathetic, a woman who had derived a liberal education from wide reading and intercourse with notable people. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Darwin's taste for natural history and especially for collecting was well developed by the time he was eight years old. He tried to make out the names of plants and he collected shells, seals, franks, coins, and minerals with the zeal peculiar to him alone of all the children. He was humane, as a result of the teaching and example of his sisters. He never took more than a single egg out of a bird's nest, and though fond of angling, killed the bait worms painlessly with salt and water. Love of dogs amounted with him to a passion. He was fond of solitary walks, and on one occasion he became so absorbed in thought while strolling alone that he walked off a wall. At ten, Charles was much interested in finding new varieties of insects on a trip to the Welsh sea coast. He also made notes on the habits of birds. At twelve, he was first aware of vivid delight in the scenery. At fifteen or sixteen, he became passionately fond of shooting. Before he was sixteen, Charles had developed strong and diversified tastes, much zeal for whatever interested him, and a keen pleasure in understanding any complex subject or thing. He liked Euclid and mechanics, continued to collect minerals, though with but little attempt at classification, and experimented in chemistry with his brother. The headmaster rebuked Darwin for wasting his time on such useless subjects. 2. Education When he was eight years old, Darwin entered a day school, which he attended for a year. From his tenth to his seventeenth year, he attended Dr. Butler's boarding school in Shrewsbury, where the usual classical course was varied with a little ancient geography and history. At sixteen, Darwin entered upon his medical course at Edinburgh, here the instruction was by lectures, and intolerably dull. 3. School standing on progress. Darwin states that he was much slower in learning than his sister. It appears also that he believed his masters and his father considered him a very ordinary boy, rather below the common standard in intellect. Perhaps his true ability was not recognised, for his was the original mind that retains only what itself has created. He could never do versification. He collected a good group of verses, which, with a little patching, would serve for any occasion. He learned and assigned forty or fifty lines of Virgil or Homer while in morning chapel, but according to his own report, he then forgot every verse within forty-eight hours. 4. Friends and Associates At school, aged nine to sixteen, Darwin made many friends among his schoolmates. 5. Reading Before he was sixteen, he read Shakespeare, Byron and Scott. Wonders of the world first gave him the desire to travel in remote lands. At Edinburgh, in his seventeenth year, Darwin preferred reading for himself to attending lectures. 6. Production and Achievement. See 2.1 for his scientific collections. 7. Evidences of Recursity. No further record. AI IQ 135. Relative cost of data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Darwin remained at Edinburgh until his eighteenth year, and here he became very fond of natural science though he resolved never to study geology. At 17, he read a paper to the Plinian Society on his first discovery. At 18, he was noticed by Sir J. Mackintosh, who said, There is something in that young man that interests me. At 19, Darwin entered Christ's College, Cambridge, in order to study for the ministry. He enjoyed geometry and botany and outdoor sports and pastimes. His chief passion was for collecting beetles. At 22, after reading Humboldt's personal narrative and Sir J. Herschel's introduction to the study of natural philosophy, he felt a vague desire to contribute to science. 
In the summer, he took up the study of geology and accompanied Sedgwick on a tour to North Wales, returning, however, in time for Patridge shooting. At 22, after graduating B.A. as 10th on the list and consequent to a recommendation from Hudson, the Bordley professor, he departed to spend the next five years, aged 22 to 27, accompanying Captain Fitzroy as naturalist on the Beagle. This experience determined his career. He studied geology intently, collected and investigated rocks, fossils and animals, and kept a journal which was later published. In his 23rd or 24th year, he discovered that the pleasure of observing and reasoning was higher than that of sport, and the first idea of writing a book occurred to him. AII IQ 140, relative quotient of data 0.53. Desiderius Erasmus, Gerhard Gerhardson, 1467 to 1536, a famous Dutch classical and theological scholar and satirist, AIIQ 135, AIIQ 140. Because of his own indifference to such matters, the dates of Erasmus's early life can only be approximate. 1. Family standing. Erasmus's father belonged to a respectable family of South Holland, whose members prevented his marriage to the lady of his choice. He fled to Italy, and hearing a false rumour of his betrothed's death, became a monk, but he afterwards aided in the support of his illegitimate child, Erasmus. The mother, the daughter of a Dutch physician, was devoted to her son. 2. Development to 817. 1. Interests. Erasmus, from his earliest years, had a passion for learning, he was checked, threatened, reprimanded. He was refused access to books, but they could not be wholly kept from him, and devoured all that he could get, and he constantly wrote verses, essays, anything that came to hand. 2. Education At the age of four, he was sent to school to an uncle. When he was found to have a good voice, he was taken to Utrecht and placed in the cathedral choir. At nine, he was sent to the famous school at Deventer. His mother accompanied him and cared for him as before. He later referred to this school as a barbarous place, meaning that it was practical rather than scientific, and that it did not introduce the pupil from the outset to the models of Latin style. Orphaned at thirteen, Erasmus was sent by his guardians to the school of the Brethren of the Common Life at bois le duc Here he spent, or as himself says, wasted about three years. His education after this time was self-directed at the monastery in which he became a novitiate. 3. School standing and progress. Erasmus says of himself that he made at four but little progress in those unattractive studies for which he was not made by nature. But he was probably not a backward scholar. Though he looked upon his life, aged 9 to 13, at Deventer, as a wasted time of struggle and hardship, yet the fact is that he was making rapid progress. And at the close of his four years, there he found himself at thirteen the equal in learning of many other lads. It is said that Cynthium, his teacher, having heard Erasmus recite, kissed him and said, Go on, Erasmus, you will some day reach the very summit of learning. The little boy soon showed talent, had an extraordinary memory, learned Horace and Terence by heart, and composed verse of his own. At thirteen, he had made good progress, had acquired a ready style, and some good authors was Satis Palatus. 4. Friends and Associates Erasmus's early associates were members of the family and teachers. Certain monks assisted his relatives in a sort of conspiracy to force the boy into priesthood, and they were finally successful. When Erasmus was about fifteen, a childhood friend in a monastery of Steyn, which he now entered, soon came to regard Erasmus as a kind of private tutor, and kept him at his instruction whole nights long, much to the injury, Erasmus says, of his poor little body. 5. Reading. C. 2, 1, and 3. 6. Production and Achievement. As a boy of about eleven, Erasmus got up mimic debates, and challenged other boys to dispute with him on points of language or literature in approved university style. He once composed what he considered an excellent Latin letter to his master, which he expected to be complimented. But the master only told him to mind his handwriting and attend to his punctuation. Between thirteen and fifteen he was always at work, writing prose, writing verse, verse in preference, which came easier. He composed whole heroic poems. He addressed a sapphic ode to the Archangel Michael. At fifteen he became a novice in the monastery of Steen. 7. Evidences of precocity. See 2. 1, 3, and 6. AIIQ 135, relative quotient of data 0.11. 
3. Development from 17 to 26. From the age of 15 to the early 20s, Erasmus lived in the monastery at Steen, in tireless and careful study, self-directed. At 20 he wrote De Contemptu Mundi, in praise of monastic life. The work shows great acquisition of knowledge and power. The Bishop of Cambrai, planning to go to Italy, wanted a young scholar of good parts to help him out with his necessary Latin, and so invited the youthful scholar to join his court. Though the journey to Italy was postponed, the bishop kept the young man at the Episcopal Court, and later gave him money enough to get to Paris. At twenty-four or twenty-five, Erasmus attended the college Montagu, where he acquired a knowledge of Greek that made him a few years later the most learned teacher in Paris. AII IQ 140, relative coast of data 0.11. Charles Guillaume Etienne, 1778-1845, a French dramatist, poet, and journalist. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family standing. Mega records state that the maternal ancestors of Etienne were members of an old family of Chamonili, who owned at one time considerable property. The father, the son of an iron master, was unable to beat the financial crisis of 1786. Of the mother and her family, no record has been found. 2. Development to 17. 1. Interests. Not a recorded specifically, but is noted that Etienne's gentle spirit was profoundly impressed by his military experience. He remained faithful to his flag to the end, but after the defeat and the insurrection, he discarded his musket and his uniform forever, and returned to seek peace at bar le duc 2. Education Brought up as an orphan in the home of his uncle, Etienne was instructed by the curé of the village. Later the youth became a brilliant student at Langres, Gray and Bar le Duc, finishing his studies at fourteen. At sixteen, he was sent to an uncle at Lyons to learn business methods and to enter upon a commercial career. But the revolution frustrated the plan, and all the citizens were called to arms. 3. School standing and progress. Etienne distinguished himself by success at school. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement. At 16, Etienne joined a battalion of grenadiers to fight for the rights of man. But the campaign was a matter of months only, and the youth soon returned to bar le duc The character of his employment for the next two years is not stated. 7. Evidences of precocity. No record beyond statements in 2, 2 and 3. AI IQ 135, relative coast of data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Having married at 18, Etienne left his clerkship and small law practice and set out for Paris to seek his fortune, but for a time he managed only a bare existence. At 19, however, he obtained a position in a military store and an addition engaged in journalism. At 21, he began to write little plays, usually in collaboration with other playwrights. His debut as a stage writer was made with La Rive, and from then on numerous theatres presented his works. Becoming better known, he made the acquaintance of writers, such as Berton and Dallerac. In spite of his literary fertility, Etienne's financial conditions was not much improved for the reward of playwriting was small. However, he was able at the end of his 21st year to bring his wife to Paris. During the following years, he wrote copiously for the theatre, chiefly short comedies, farces and comic operas. At 24, in collaboration with Martinville, he wrote and published a history of the French theatre in four volumes and at 25 a comedy in one act, and Les Marais en Bonne Fortune, a comedy in three acts. AIIIQ 140, relative coast to data 0. 0.60. Sir John Franklin, 1786 to 1847, a celebrated English Arctic explorer. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. John Franklin was descended from the same stock as Benjamin Franklin. His forebears were a substantial country gentlemen. The paternal grandfather reduced the family fortunes so that his survivors had to enter trade. But Franklin's grandmother, a wonder of ability, of masculine capacity and great resolution of character, started a draper's shop with her son, Sir John's father, and it prospered so that the son was able to marry into a farmer's family and own a freehold. The mother, who was noted for her kindly and affectionate disposition, was the daughter of a substantial farmer. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. 
At the age of ten, John, having walked across country, viewed the sea for the first time, and at once found he would be a sailor. From that day, his interests were all connected with sea life and exploration. 2. Education. At the age of ten, he was sent to school at St. Ives, and at twelve was transferred to the grammar school at Louth. Then at fourteen, his father arranged for him a short cruise to an merchantman trading between Havre and Lisbon, hoping thereby to discourage the boy's love of the sea. But on his return from the trip, John was more determined than ever, and the father saw no other course than to secure him a berth. Besides engaging in such studies as astronomy and navigation, he mentions in the letter, working hard in his leisure time at French and Latin. 3. School standing and progress. No mention is made of Franklin's progress in school, but on board ship he proved such an excellent pupil that he was commended by his instructors for his progress and ability. 4. Friends and Associates Captain Flinders, who commanded the investigator during her Australian voyage of discovery and survey, became Franklin's lifelong friend. It was this officer who taught the lad navigation. 5. Reading Young Franklin, in a letter to his sister, written at the age of 16, mentions reading the letters of Junius, Shakespeare, Pope, Smollett, as well as books on navigation, French and Latin. 6. Production and Achievement John Franklin, who first appointed as a volunteer at the age of 14, 11 months later he received his baptism of fire at Copenhagen. In 15 he sailed with the investigator to the South Seas, the chief purpose of the cruise being to survey the south coast of Australia. At Sydney, where the ship put in to refit, a temporary observatory was erected and Franklin was appointed astronomical assistant. For his services he received the nickname of Mr. Tycho Bray, from Governor King of New South Wales. 7. Evidences of Precocity At an early age, John Franklin showed evidences of great curiosity. He would persist in watching the neighbours come and go even when severely punished for so doing. He was a lad full of adventurous aspirations. He always tried to outdo his fellows in their projects, and it is told of him that when they were specifying their own particular kinds of manly achievement, he would be satisfied with nothing less than to construct a ladder whereby to climb to heaven. For him, obstacles existed only to be overcome. AI IQ 135, real of coach of data 0.75. 3. Development from 17 to 26. The officers and the crew of the investigator started home from Australia, but suffered shipwreck, and after rescue, young Franklin found himself in Canton. Here he joined an East Indian man, and after a brush with the French and route, during which he served as a signal lieutenant with zeal and alacrity, he reached England in his nineteenth year. He joined the Bellerophon, first as a common seaman, but he was soon promoted midshipman and served for a year blockading Brest. Then followed the Battle of Trafalgar, in which Franklin, aged nineteen and a half, served with very conspicuous zeal and ability, and had a marvellous escape from death. For two years more, the youth served with his ship, and was then transferred to the Bedford, with which for five years he was engaged in sea patrol work. He served in South American waters, and also in the blockade of Flushing and Texel, showing skill in his profession, as well as tenacity, judgment, and self-command in service. He was early appointed, about the age of 22, master's mate with the rank of acting lieutenant. AII IQ 135, relief coast of data 0. 0.75. Jacob Ludwig Karl Grimm, 1785-1863, a German philologist and writer. AII IQ 135, AII IQ 140. 1. Family standing. Grimm's ancestors can be traced back at least two centuries, during which they occupied pulpits or public offices. Jacob's grandfather and his great-grandfather were both pastors. His father, a lawyer and magistrate of Stainau, was a studious, methodical, lovable man who died when Jacob was 11 years old. The father's sister, a serious and rather severe woman, was devoted to her nephews and showed her interest in many practical ways. Grimm's mother was a gentle, cheerful woman, deeply devoted to her children. Her death occurring when Jacob was 23 was the greatest sorrow in his whole life. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. When a little lad of six, Jacob and his brother, Wilhelm, ran about the countryside collecting butterflies and insects. Later, Jacob developed a special interest in botany. At school, he was fond of drawing. 2. Education. Grimm was first taught by his father in rather an unmethodical way and after his parents' death by the town teacher, from whom there was not much to learn. 
When he was thirteen, he was educated with his brother Wilhelm at their aunt's expense at Kassel. The course included geography, natural history, anthropology, ethics, physics, logic, philosophy, philology, and history. Slow to begin, Jacob appeared backward at first. Then all at once, he began to learn rapidly. 3. School standing in progress. On his withdrawal from the Lyceum at Kassel, Jacob, at seventeen, received a certificate for merit for superior mental gifts and unlimited industry. 4. Friends and Associates Jacob's chief friend was his brother Wilhelm, one year his senior. The two were inseparable companions, were neither at work or play, and had remarkably similar interests. Jacob held his mother in great esteem and loved her dearly. At the Lyceum, he was friendly with Ernst Malsberg and Paul Wighand, both of whom later became writers of distinction. 5. Reading Jake was very fond of reading at an early age. At Lyceum, his favourite poets were Schiller and Goethe. 6. Production and Achievement His school reputation was high. See 2, 3. 7. Evidences of Precocity Jacob learned to read at a remarkably youthful age, and with remarkable speed. There is no other specific record. AI IQ 135, relative quotient data point six zero. 3. Development from 17 to 26. On leaving the Lyceum, Grimm went to the University of Marburg. He was unhappy at having to leave behind his brother, who was very ill at the time. Nevertheless, he plunged into work in order to qualify as a lawyer as soon as possible. Grimm was especially interested in the lectures of Savigny. The latter noticed his pupil's excellence and gave him permission to use his library. Savigny and Grimm, aged 20, were together for six months at Paris. Then on his return to Germany, Jacob began to seek out a physician. At 21, he secured a post as secretary at Castle, but resigned when the French came about a year later. At 23, he was appointed librarian and auditor to the French king of Westphalia, a position he held for five years. His official duties were more or less nominal, and was able to devote himself to writing, reading, and copying extracts. His first published work on an old German Meistersong appeared when he was 26, and the first part of the famous fairy stories, written in conjunction with his brother, was published a year later. AII IQ 140, relative of data 0 0.60. George Grote, 1794 to 1871, a celebrated English historical writer. AI IQ 135, AII IQ 140. 1. Family Standing. Groot's ancestors were active in business and the professions. His father, a banker, had only contemptuous discouragement for his son's intellectual activities. The mother brought up her children under strict discipline, and we are told that the home life was rendered very uncongenial as a result of her puritanical severity. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. When George finished school at 16, he possessed strong leanings towards intellectual culture, and thereafter he was glad to relieve the monotony of office work by study and concert music. 2. Education Before Grote began to attend school, his mother had already taught him to read and write, and even grounded him in the rudiments of Latin, for she had a strong desire to see him excel in learning. When George was five and a half, his mother induced his father to send him to the grammar school conducted at Seven Oaks by the Reverend Mr. Whitehead, and there he remained for four years. For the six years following, he attended Charterhouse School, whose headmaster was a man of recognised ability as a schoolmaster and of some distinction as a scholar. The quality of many of the students there was such that young Grote was favourably placed between clever competition on the one hand and encouraging assistance from the master on the other. 3. School standing and progress. At the grammar school, he evinced a decided aptitude for study, being rarely found behindhand with his tasks and ranked habitually above boys of his age in the class to which he belonged. In the holidays, his mother caused him to devote a portion of his time to his lessons, to which habit, however, he never showed, or indeed felt any reluctance. It is probable that at Charterhouse School he never got a flogging for any shortcomings on his performance of the tasks although he was occasionally chastised for boyish misdemeanors. 4. Friends and Associates Familiar companions of the Charterhouse school days were the brothers George and Horace Waddington, Connor Thurwall, H. Havelock, the soldier, and Creswell, all of whom were later well-known characters. 5. Reading Grote had contracted a strong taste for the classics at Charterhouse, and he continued to cultivate this interest after going into business. 
6. Production and Achievement Groat's father found it convenient to employ his son in the banking house, and so at 16, George graduated from school into business instead of into college. 7. Evidences of Precocity C2, 1, 2, 3, and 5 AIIQ 135, with a coast of data 0.43 3. Development from 17 to 26 During the 10 years that he was engaged in his father's banking house, Groat, aged 16 to 26, had only his studies and the companionship of a few stimulating friends to relieve the deadening influence of the puritanical home atmosphere. He found pleasure in music and developed a strong interest in political economy, history and metaphysics. At 24, he wrote to a friend, literature still continues to form the greatest attraction to my mind. He fell deeply in love at 21, but waited for five years before marrying, in the vain hope of gaining his father's consent. AII IQ 140, relative kosher data 0.60. Francois Pierre Guillaume Guizot, 1787-1874, a distinguished French historian and statesman. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 155. 1. Family Standing The Guizot family were honourable Protestant bourgeoisie of names. Their father, an able advocate, was active in the liberal political and social movements of the period of the French Revolution. He died on the scaffold during the Reign of Terror. The mother came of similar stock. She was endowed with great strength of character and clearness of judgment as well as with many graceful talents. After her husband's death, she devoted herself to the education of her children. 2. Development to 17. 1. Interests. Guizot's first and only playthings were books. At 15, philosophy began to attract him. A powerful and concentrated ambition manifested itself from the very beginning of his life and seems to have animated his entire existence. 2. Education. When Guizot was seven, he lost his father on the scaffold. Thereafter, his early training was under the direction of his mother. Madame Guizot was eminently fitted for her duties as a mentor, for she had been inspired in her youth with an ardent love for learning. She was firmly resolved to develop the gifts she perceived in her sons, especially the oldest. Because the French schools did not come up to her ideal, she took her children, when her son was eleven, to Geneva, and now she took part in all their lessons, which were directed by a Swiss professor. She studied for and with her children, leading with them a hard and simple life. Young Guizot had excellent instruction under superior professors, in writing, swimming and drawing, and in accordance with the teaching of Rousseau, in a trade, that of joiner. From 11 to 18, the boy attended the Geneva Gymnasium, where he studied classical and modern literature, history and philosophy. 3. School Standing and Progress at 15, Guizot could read in Greek, Thucydides and Demosthenes, in Latin, Cicero and Tacitus, in Italian, Dante and Alfieri, in German, Schiller and Goethe, and in English, Gibbon and Shakespeare. 4. Friends and Associates, no specific record. 5. Reading, C. 2, 2 and 3. 6. Production and Achievement. Guizot became a skilled joiner and excellent in turning. 7. Evidences of Precocity. Of the boy's first seven years, we know only that he early showed natural gifts, and that when he was scarcely six, his mother found him standing on the bookcase ledge, passionately declaiming the imprecations of Camille, which had captivated his imagination. It is said that this precocious boy had neither childhood nor youth, for his interests and activities were always those of an adult. AIIQ 135, relative coast of data 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Guizot was separated from his beloved mother at 18 and sent to Paris to study law. He applied himself to his task dutifully to please her, but his real taste lay in the direction of letters, and he also found an attraction in politics. At 19 he was appointed tutor in the house of the Minister of Switzerland, and here he finally received his mother's consent to devote himself to literature. In a letter to her he said, I feel drawn toward literature and poetry by a charm that makes me miserable, and again, I was intended by nature for a distinguished man of letters. I am oppressed by my thoughts, and I am continually occupied in resisting inclinations. In the following year, he contributed articles anonymously to the Publicist, of which his future wife was the editor. From 20 to 25, he occupied himself with literary labour, a dictionary of synonyms, the lives of the French poets, a translation of Gibbon, and one of a work of Rufus flowed from his pen. 
He was attracted by German philosophy and literature, and contributed articles in German to German reviews and newspapers. In his 25th year, Grisot married Mademoiselle de Moulin. Shortly afterward, he was appointed assistant professor of history at the Sorbonne. At 27, he was appointed secretary general in the Ministry of the Interior, his first step on the path of politics. AIIIQ 155, relative coast of data 0.75. Alexander Hamilton, 1757-1804, an American statesman, AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing Hamilton's father was an attractive Scotchman belonging to an old family of high standing, but incapable of carrying on business successfully. The mother of Huguenot stock was a woman of intellectual superiority and independent mind. 2. Development towards 17. 1. Interests Alexander appears to have been fond of reading and of composition, but he disliked his clerkship and wished there was war. At college his versatility was manifest. He found time for debates, political pamphlets, writing verses, and general society. 2. Education Before he reached 12 years of age, Alexander was given such education as his native land of Nevis afforded. He became equally familiar with both English and French. At 15 he went to New York, where he attended a grammar school in New Jersey for one year. At 16, he passed an entrance examination to Princeton, but this college would not permit him to pass through the curriculum in three years, as he planned to do so, and so he entered King's College, Columbia. There he studied both literary and the medical courses. 3. School Standing and Progress Hamilton worked fast. He planned to cover the college course in less than the regular number of years. 4. Friends and Associates Hamilton won friends and kept them. 5. Reading his early schooling was supplemented by much miscellaneous reading. 6. Production and Achievement At 12, Hamilton became a counting house clerk. At 14, he was entrusted by his master with important missions to other islands and was even left in control of the warehouse as correspondence during his master's absence. Letters written at 13 and 15 show attitudes beyond his years, as well as a remarkable knowledge of market conditions and laws. A description of a tempest, written by Hamilton at 15, so impressed a number of persons, they determined to give him a college education. 7. Evidences of Precocity. C2, 2, 2, and 6. AIIQ 135. Relative coastal data 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Hamilton made an eloquent speech for the election of New York delegates to the First Continental Congress. He included arguments missed by older speakers, and insisted on the duty of resisting the mother country. Before he was 18, he had published a series of pamphlets in defence of the Congress. At 18, he joined a company of volunteers, studied military science, and the following year was appointed captain of a New York company of artillery. At about this time, he qualified for the BA degree. At the age of 20, he was appointed Washington's secretary and aide, a post which he held for four years. Believing that war was his true profession, he now wished for a command. During his 23rd and 24th years, he outlined arguments in favour of a national bank based on readings and occasional reflections, and the following year he prepared a series of six papers on statesmanship. At 23, he married the daughter of General Schuyler. At 25, he was appointed receiver of taxes for New York State, was elected to Congress, and called to the bar. AIIQ 140 Relative coast of data, 0 0.60. Warren Hastings, 1732-1818, an English statesman. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing. Records of the Hastings family date as far back as the time of the Conqueror. Warren Hastings' father was the son of a parish priest. He attended Balliol College and then took holy orders. The mother's family appear to have been small tradespeople. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Warren is said to have been a dreamer. He would lie by the stream at the age of seven, living in fancy in the period when his ancestors were wealthy and great, the owners of vast estates. At Westminster School, Warren, age 10, was fond of swimming and rowing, much addicted to contemplation, ambitious and anxious to excel. 2. Education. He learned to read at a charity dame's school in Churchill. The uncle, who supervised his education, placed him at eight in a small school at Dimington, where he was well taught, but where the lack of good food 
probably stunted his growth and weakened his constitution. At ten, he was sent by his uncle to the renowned Westminster School, where he remained until he was nearly sixteen. A distant relative who took charge of him upon the death of his uncle then put him under the instruction of a writing master of Christ's Hospital to learn bookkeeping and calligraphy. 3. School standing on progress. Young Hastings was distinguished at Westminster for his progress in classical literature. He attracted the attention of his masters, especially the headmaster, by his mental aptitude and his great powers of application. At 14 he was elected, as first on the list, to a King's Scholarship, and the fact was marked by the engraving of his name in gilt letters on the wall of his dormitory. A little later, Warren's guardian decided to remove the boy from school that he might prepare for a career in East India. This decision was sincerely regretted by the Westminster headmaster, who offered to keep the boy in school at no expense, but this did not avail. Under the writing master who next instructed him, Warren acquired the facility of writing well and clearly, but he made no progress in the study of finance. However, he obtained a certificate of his completion of a regular course of merchant's accounts. 4. Friends and Associates Some of his Westminster schoolmates were afterwards distinguished, among others, Lord Shelbourne, later first Marquis of Lansdowne, the poet Cowper, the notorious Churchill, and Warren's lifelong friend, Sir Elijah Impey. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and Achievement At the age of 16, Hastings made application in his own excellent hand for a ridership in the East India Company, and the position was granted though perhaps through his relative's influence. 7. Evidences of Precocity C22 AIIQ 135 Relative Quotient of Data 0.53 3. Development from 17 to 26 Hastings sailed for Calcutta at 17, and there he remained for two years attached to the Secretarial Department. At 21 he was placed in charge of an isolated silk factory. Here, promoted by degree of positions of greater responsibility, he had become second export warehouse keeper by the age of 25. In the meantime, he had taken an active part in several military skirmishes. He married at about 24. AIIQ 140, relative coast of data 0.43. Emmanuel Kant, 1724 to 1804. A celebrated German philosopher, one of the most influential thinkers of modern times, founder of the critical philosophy. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family standing. Both of Kant's parents were simple, upright people, always in the most limited circumstances. The father was a strap maker who worked for himself in a small way. The mother was a woman of great natural ability and strong religious faith. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. No records preserved other than school interests. 2. Education In his earliest years, Kant's mother took her son into the country and there explained to him what she knew of the names and properties of plants and of the mysteries of the skies. Her instruction was not limited to one or two fields. She made a deep impression upon her son and her influence was strong in his life. Before he was eight, Kant attended the nearby school. At eight and a half, by the suggestion of the family patron, the educational reformer Schultz, he was sent to the new Pietist College. This step was taken, doubtless largely as a result of the mother's initiative, for it was she who first recognised the intellectual gifts of her son. In college, under the instruction of an able Latin teacher, Kant made himself familiar with the literature of Rome. He learned long passages from the Latin poets, and these he always retained. At sixteen and a half, having fulfilled the university entrance requirements in Latin and Greek, logic, geography and history, he entered the University of Konigsberg. 3. School standing on progress. Kant did good work at school, but not particularly in the direction of philosophy. From eight and a half to sixteen and a half, a shy boy at the excelled Pietist College, he was industrious and gave evidence of possessing a sound memory, presence of mind, and a gift for keen observation. From nine to fourteen, he retained the first place in his class. No record of his standing at fifteen is preserved. The fact that he was one of those who, in entering the university, aged sixteen and a half, specified no choice of a department is perhaps indicative of his unwillingness to commit himself prematurely. 4. Friends and Associates The latter celebrated philologists, Runken, and the gifted Kund, afterwards a schoolmaster of note, 
formed with Kant a trio of like-minded schoolmates who together planned future careers as classical philologists. 5. Reading. No record is found of other than school reading. 6. Production achievement. C. 2. 3. 7. Evidences of precocity. Apparently no one of his schoolmates or teachers suspected Kant's genius. He stood at the head of his class for five years or more. AIIQ 135. Relative quotient of data, 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Kant entered the University of Konigsberg at 16 and a half and remained there until he was 22. During these years, he was always in straitened means, but he acted as unpaid tutor to the two friends with whom he shared a room. Kant did not confine himself to any one facility, but allowed his studies to range over all the arts and sciences. He derived much assistance from Kutzin, a brilliant young philosopher. Always studious and widely read, young Kant was at first sight attracted by the works of Nijin and Kutzin, whose volumes had introduced the German student to the English scientist and allowed Kant free access to his library. When Kant left the university, he was thoroughly familiar with the Latin and to a lesser degree the Greek classics, but he had already decided that the key to philosophy can be found only in the common understanding. The year that Emmanuel completed his university study, his father died, and so great was the poverty of his family that he was buried at the community's expense. The youth spent the next three years as tutor in the household of a pastor, and his criticism of himself during these years was that there could hardly be a tutor with better theory and worse practice than myself. In his 25th year, his first book, Thoughts on the True Estimation of Living Forces was published. AIIIQ 145, relative coast of data 0.43. Frederick Gottlieb Klopstock, 1724 to 1803, a famous German epic poet. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 155. 1. Family Standing. Klopstock's paternal ancestors were men of standing, pastors, and lawyers. His father was a lawyer a man of ability and courage, strict, pious, and religious, who, curiously, held firmly to a belief in spooks and devils. Klopstock's mother was a simple woman devoted to her seventeen children, of whom Frederick was the oldest. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. From Frederick's eighth to his twelfth year, he and his brothers and sisters lived in the country, where they hunted, fished, and swam. As far as intellectual interests were concerned, it is reported only that, at school, the boy was especially fond of Greek poetry. 2. Education During his early boyhood in the country, Klopstock received some instruction in languages from an uninspiring teacher. At 12, because family financial reverses made tutors no longer a possibility, Frederick entered the gymnasium of his hometown. Here he studied indifferently until an opportunity to enter the Beforta school became an incentive to serious replication and he passed the entrance examinations at 15 with distinction. At Perforta, where he remained until he was 21, he studied Latin and Greek principally, but also Hebrew, logic, mathematics, and music. The teaching in German was so poor as to be practically negligible in its influence. 3. School Standing and Progress Flopstock's Latin style was especially good, and his work in Greek was noteworthy. As a result, he was held in esteem by most of his teachers. During his private hours, he read modern history and began to write poetry in German, Greek, and Latin, which increased his reputation among his schoolfellows. 4. Friends and Associates It is reported that Klopstock was not anxious to have many friends, but that he loved best of all to retire to those places where he could observe the works and wonders of God in nature. 5. Reading In his early school years, he preferred Homer to Virgil, spoke of Sappho with praise, and loved Horace. Later he studied the Swiss poets, seeking from them the solution of his aesthetic problems. It is mentioned also that La Bruyere's characters influenced him. 6. Production and Achievement Always devoted to justice, Klopstock on one occasion delivered orations in the style of Livy on behalf of the lower class, whose rights he considered were being oppressed by the upper class. Because of his fighting spirit, he came near being dismissed. The poet's earliest dated poem was written when he was 17. See also through 3. 7. Evidences of precocity. No further record. AIIQ 135. Relative coast of data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. 
During his later years at Beforta, influenced by Milton and the Swiss critics, Klopstock began to plan a Greek epic. His final school operation was in Latin prose, and on the subject which had begun to preoccupy his thought, the subject matter of the New Testament, and the epic manner of Homer and Virgil to him. Leaving Forta, the young poet went first to Jena, where he stayed six months, and then to Leipzig, a great intellectual centre, where he stayed until he was twenty-three. He had worked hard in both universities, and had produced a number of poems. His great epic, The Messias, was in progress. The first part of it appeared in the literary magazine of the Bremer Contributors, a group of poets. Of the first canto of this work, Bodmer, the Milton translator, said, Milton's spirit lives in the author. He has portrayed a character that is bigger than Satan. This is the great German epic for which I have longed and waited. The Messias was published separately in 1748, when Klopstock was 23, after he had left the university and was engaged as a tutor. Two years later, a third edition of his great work had been called for. The whole intellectual world was stirred, and Klopstock was looked upon as a demigod. In 1751, when the poet was 26, the King of Denmark made him financially independent for life, free to devote himself to his art. AII IQ 155, relative quotient data 0.75. Joseph Louis Lagrange, 1736 to 1813, a celebrated mathematician of French descent. AII IQ 135, AII IQ 165. 1. Family standing. Lagrange's great-grandfather was a cavalry captain. His father was a treasurer of war, who lost a considerable fortune through rash speculation. His mother was the only daughter of a rich physician. 2. Development weighed 17. 1. Interests. A passion for Cicero and Virgil antedated Lagrange's love for mathematics. It was a memoir of Halley, read at 16, that led him to his true field of effort. 2. Education. Lagrange entered the University of Turin at 15, and after reading Halley's work at 16, all his energies were devoted to the study and improvement of mathematical analysis. Within two years, he had amassed all that had been previously done in this direction. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading. Cicero and Virgil, Archimedes and Newton, as well as Halley's on the superiority of analysis, were read with enthusiasm. 6. Production and Achievement. No record. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No further record. AIIQ 135. Relative coefficient of data. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Lagrange's ability was so marked that at 19 he was appointed Professor of Mathematics in the School of Artillery in Turin. Here all these pupils were older than he. At 22 he founded a society which became the Turin Academy of Sciences. At 23 he was elected to the Berlin Academy in recognition of his work on the Calculus of Variations. His paper had demonstrated the insufficiencies of the methods employed by his great scientific contemporaries and presented with extraordinary skill and insight a new treatment of various physical phenomena. Intense application led to a bilious hypochondria when Lagrange was 25. Yet at 26, a second volume of memoirs gave him permanent recognition. This work, justly entitled its author to recognition as the inventor of all methods of variations, carried Lagrange at 26 to the summit of European fame. AII IQ 165, relative coast of data 0 0.60. Alphonse Marie Louise Lamartine, 1790 to 1869, a celebrated French poet. AII IQ 135, AII IQ 150. 1. Family Standing The Lamartines belonged to the lesser nobility, having risen from a humble origin in the 17th century. The poet's father was a chevalier, a soldier, a classical scholar, and a lover of poetry. The mother's family held positions in the household of the Duke of Orleans. Of the mother herself it is reported only that, although a staunch Catholic, she was also an admirer of Russell. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Brought up in the isolation of his father's place of exile, Lamartine lived there in an atmosphere which cultivated intellectual and natural interests. Reading and discussion in outdoor life with swimming and skating occupied his childhood days. At the age of thirteen, and while attending his second school, certain mystic religious emotions transfused his life with strange happiness. At sixteen, the young poet thought seriously of entering upon a military career. 
impelled perhaps by his deep craving for experience. It was about this time that his poetic gift appeared, stimulated by a love affair. 2. Education The child was lulled to sleep by his father's reading aloud of Voltaire, Racine, or La Fontaine. His first teachers were his parents, who had no desire to make a prodigy of him, but wished simply to acquaint him with the pleasures of an intellectual life. They made his early training a part of the game of living. He saw his parents read, and he wanted to read. He saw them write, and he asked for aid in forming the letters. Thus the principles of Russell became the basis of his education. A friend of the family began to instruct young Lamartine when, something before the age of ten, he had outgrown the general training which his family could give. At ten he began to be instructed by the Abbe Dumont in the rudiments of Latin. At eleven he was sent to his first formal school, and at thirteen he went on to a second institution, a Jesuit college whose refined and cultured atmosphere charmed the new pupil. 3. School Stanium Progress At his first school, Lamartine, aged 11 to 13, apparently did well after he had somewhat overcome the first shock of the restricted life. He was taken at 12 as one of a dozen of the best scholars to see Bonaparte's review. The restraint of the school and the brutality of his fellow students made him miserable. He craved liberty, and at last he ran away. He had thoughts of suicide also, but apparently never attempted to carry them into effect. He is returned to school and required to remain there for another year. At the Jesuit College, the boy, aged 13 to 17, did good work and won several prizes. 4. Friends and Associates Before he was 10, Lamartine's associates were chiefly his parents and their friends. He listened with open ears and mind to discussions of philosophy, religion, legislation, history, poetry, fiction and politics. At college he was associated with young men whose tastes and interests were similar to his own, three of whom began his close friends, the shares of his and each other's emotional intellectual experiences. 5. Reading A taste for reading was early developed, and the demand for material soon outran the supply. Before he had reached his teens, Lamartine's eyes turned longingly to the rows of volumes in his parents' sitting room, but his mother sought to moderate his yearning for knowledge and doled out the books with a discriminating hand. The works of Madame de Genlis, Fenelon, B. de Saint-Pierre, Tasso, and Robinson Crusoe delighted him. Voltaire transported him. On the other hand, the fables of La Fontaine appealed not at all. At sixteen, Lamartine read Chateaubriand's Genie du Christianisme with his college friends and was moved to tears, but he saw nonetheless that it was a decadent work. During a vacation spent at the home of a fellow student, Lamartine found Roussel. He feasted on this and on other forbidden fruit in the same library. Six Production and Achievement Lamartine, at sixteen, on long walks out of doors, began to compose charming flowery prayers and mystic verses or hymns, two of which are preserved. His friends were so charmed with them that they secretly made copies. 7. Evidences of Precocity No further record. AI IQ 135, Relative Culture Data 0.75 3. Development from 17 to 26. In 1807, Lamartine, aged 17, left college and walked to his home at Macon. Here he read extensively in the works of Rousseau, Voltaire, Goethe, Chateaubriand, and many others. Or else on horseback, he galloped madly over the countryside or practiced at shooting with his father. Then gradually, as home life began to pour, the love of study, especially the love of literature and poetry, returned with full force. The youth tried to find solace in reading, and in many slight love affairs. At nineteen, he was at Lyons, and almost happy. Here he wished to study law, but this being contrary to his parents' wishes, he turned to literary pursuits. He worked hard and read furiously. Rousseau's Emile was found striking, and he wished to make it his friend and guide. He enjoyed the association of a man of thirty, very learned, very charming, who reads Homer in the original, and who knows all the poets and savants of the day. His friend permitted him the run of his library of some 10,000 volumes. Beside these activities, Lamartine was again occupied with a love affair. At 20, he finally renounced his law course. In the same year, he was elected to the Académie de Sion et Loire. In the following year, an unfortunate love affair caused Lamartine's family to send him to Italy, but there an Italian maiden took his fancy, whereupon he was recalled home. Time hung heavily on his hands, and he was engulfed in melancholy. Age 22. 
In the following year, he was seriously ill, but before his 24th birthday, he had recovered and started political writing. In 1814, he joined the Guards de Corps, but he found the occupation wearisome. Long walks productive of numerous verses were his only relaxation. The next year, in spite of Napoleon's return, Lamartine remained a faithful royalist. He was captured, but shortly released, whereupon he departed for Switzerland. On his return to France, he resigned his commission, tried the diplomatic service but found it dull, and finally threw himself into the arms of the muses. Lamartine's earliest poetic production is recorded at the age of 16, and thereafter he turned out verses frequently, charming little lyrics for the most part in which sweetness blends with sadness. AII IQ 150 Will of Coach of Data, point six two. Gotthold Ephraim Lessing, 1729-1781, a celebrated German dramatist and critic. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing Lessing's father was an educated Lutheran clergyman, of generous heart but conventional views, who continued throughout his life the studious interests which he had displayed with distinction at college. He was descended from a line of solid and influential citizens. The mother, daughter of the pastor whom her husband had succeeded, was conventional in thought and habit, faithful and honest, but not at all remarkable. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. It is said that got hold at five or six objected to being portrayed holding a bird in a bird cage, because it seemed to him a childish pose. He preferred rather to appear with a number of the big books that he liked so well to examine. His intellectual tastes, thus early suggested, appeared definitely when, between the ages of twelve and seventeen, he acquired, from intercourse with his mathematical master at St. Afra, some interest in physical science, an interest he retained throughout his life. His master's enthusiasm so stimulated him that he would stay up till past midnight, which was contrary to the rules, working out problems or engaged in discussion. 2. Education Lessing's first formal lessons were received in the family religious services, which were held twice daily and as the father was the author of a catechism, it is hardly necessary to say that the instruction of his children in the dogmas of the Lutheran faith was not neglected. When the boy was seven, part of his study was under the supervision of a young student, while the older Lessing continued his religious instruction. An artist gave lessons in drawing and aroused in young Lessing an appreciation of art. Before he was eight, and until he had nearly completed his twelfth year, the boy attended the local Latin school conducted by an energetic young rector of liberal views. He was then sent to an uncle, Pastor Linden, to receive preparation for St. Afra. At St. Afra, where he remained from twelve and a half to seventeen, the discipline was strict and much time was spent in the public reading and exposition of the Bible. Great attention was paid to theology, church history, and classical learning, and emphasis was laid strongly upon the capacity to put together Latin and Greek words in the form of verses. Fortunately for Lessing, there were, were also certain free hours during which the boys might study or read what they liked. 3. School study and Progress Young Lessing was offered a St. Afra scholarship at the age of 11, when his youth precluded acceptance. Later at 12 and a half, a special scholarship in the gift of the Karlowitz family was conferred upon him. He then succeeded so well in the entrance examinations, written translation, German into Latin, writing of a Latin distich, Lutheran doctrine, and mathematical problems, that he was placed in the upper half of the entering class. He showed himself industrious, quick to learn, and possessed of a retentive memory. But the warning he received, when he was promoted as ninth in rank to the second class, not to diminish the good impression of his first appearance by pert and willful behaviour, suggests that his deportment did not always equal his scholastic achievement. At thirteen, he was promoted as eighth in his class, but it is said of him at this time that his independence and an inclination to devote himself to whatever attracted him could scarcely be restrained. At thirteen and three-fourths, he was promoted as sixth, and his superior ability was noted in his school report, but at fourteen, he was summoned before the school council because of carelessness in preparing his exercise book. At fourteen and one-fourth, he was in the 19th place, and his general conduct was open to the criticism it received from his master. Between 14 and 17, he is said to have cared very little for exercising in composition. 
It was actual contact with the minds of ancient authors that kindled his sympathy and interest. Of his school days at St. Aphra, listening wrote to his father when he was 21, I saw that one had to learn much there which one could make no use of in the world, and now I see it far more clearly. However, his reports steadily improved, and at the age of 15 and three-fourths he was promoted as first in his class. Then he dropped again, and in a half year was down to the 18th place. In another six months he had risen again to the second place. After completing the six-year course in five years, he entreated his father to set him free. The pastor disliked the idea of his son going away before the proper time, but at last consented to apply for his dismissal. 4. Friends and Associates Although Lessing realised the shortcomings of the headmaster at St. Aphra, he was considerably influenced by the man's intelligent and vigorous mind. He also became attached to his able mathematical instructor, a man of literary and scientific culture. 5. Reading When Gotthold was seven, his father's library was his favourite haunt. He continued his devotion to literary pursuits, and at St. Aphra, under the stimulating influence of his mathematical master, made a considerable acquaintance with the best contemporary literature of Germany. At sixteen he read Whiston's Theory of the Earth and Huygens' Cosmos Theory, and his imagination was fired. He was allowed access to the castle library and began also to read periodical literature. His favourite authors were Theophrastus, Plautus, and Terence, and he began to enjoy the French writers also. 6. Production and Achievement a New Year's greeting to his father, written just before he was fourteen, on the likeness of one year to another, displays, although in a crude form, many of the characteristics of Lessing's latter manner. The style is somewhat stiff, but the ideas are logically arranged, and his meaning shines through his words and absolute distinctness. At fifteen, Gothold translated three books of Euclid, and his severe instructor was satisfied with the result. The same year, the boy began to collect materials for a history of mathematics, at sixteen he wrote a little poem in Haller's style on the plurality of worlds, which seemed to him letter tolerably well expressed. The young author also amused himself by translating and imitating Anacreon. He wrote a play, the young scholar, gave a Latin address at a religious celebration, and responded to the thesis of a graduating student on the long life of man, with a rhymed address in German on the happiness of a short life. 7. Evidences of Recursity the father used later to say that from his earliest years Gothard learned with ease and pleasure and liked, even in his infancy, to while away time by glancing through books. See also 2, 1, 3, 5 and 6. AIIQ 135, relative coast of data point six zero. Three Development from 17 to 26. Lessing's earnest desire to leave St. Aphra, where he had now learned all it had to teach, was realised when, at seventeen and a half, he entered the University of Leipzig. He spent two years at the university, where he soon gave up the idea of studying theology and devoted his attention to the theatre. He obtained the consent of his family to change his course to medicine, and this gave him greater freedom to pursue his own course. The young scholar, a comedy began when he was still at school, was successfully produced before he was nineteen. A little later, on account of financial difficulties, Lessing left Leipzig for Berlin, where he supported himself by making translations and by writing criticisms, reviews, etc. He studied at the University of Wittenberg at 22 and 23, taking the degree of Master of Arts. During the university years, Lessing wrote voluminously. At 22, his first volume of verse and criticism was published. At 24, his works amounted to two volumes which appeared during the year. At 25, two more volumes were published, and Lessing had achieved a recognised place among literary men. The long friendships with the philosopher began the same year. AIIQ 150, relative coast of data 0.75. Giuseppe Joseph Mazzini, 1805-1872, an Italian patriot and revolutionist. AIIQ 135, AIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing Mazzini's father was a well-to-do and charitable physician, a professor of anatomy at the University of Genoa, and secretly an ardent democrat. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Mazzini was fond of study, gymnastics, and fencing. He played the guitar, sang well, was clever at reciting, and had a shrewd sense of humour. At 16 he first became interested in the cause of freedom began to study the revolution, 
organized a group of friends for the discussion of such burning questions as an intellectual resurrection of Italy and planned schemes for smuggling in books prescribed by the police. This definite activity in the cause of freedom brought peace to a mind previously so troubled over his country's wrongs that his mother had actually feared suicide. 2. Education Of Mazzini's earliest education there is no record. At 14 he entered the University of Genoa, which at that time, however, possessed no very high name for scholarship, and enrolled there in the course preparatory to the study of law and medicine. Mazzini was a troublesome scholar, for he rebelled at formalities. He even refused to attend compulsory religious observances, just because they were compulsory. 3. School Standing on Progress In school, Giuseppe was a leader, although he was studious and rather retiring. 4. Friends and Associates at the University of Messini had three close friends, two of whom later achieved recognition. One of these, humorous and brilliant, later wrote good second-rate novels. The other, who was artistic but impulsive and shallow, later became a teacher in Edinburgh. 5. Reading Mazzini had begun to read before he was six. At sixteen, in his patriotic enthusiasm, he developed a passion for the works of the revolutionary writer Foscolo and memorized this author's Jacopo Utis. He read French, Italian, English, and a translation from the German. 6. Production and achievement. No specific record. 7. Evidences of precocity. A delicate child, Mazzini's mind developed more rapidly than his body, and he had begun to devour books of all kinds and to show other signs of intellectual precocity when at 6 he was taken for their first walk. AIIQ 135. Relative coefficient of data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the university, Mazzini's character and exceptional abilities endeared him to his fellow students. The surgeon's profession attracted him, and he would perhaps have prepared to follow it had he not shown a disability for it by fainting the first time he stood by the operating table. At 21, he graduated in law, but he practiced at the bar only a short while. His real bent was toward literature. He read widely. His favorite authors were Dante, Shakespeare, Byron, Goethe, and Schiller. He also admired the Bible. At 21, his first article, Dante, appeared, but by 22, he had renounced pure literature and had begun to use his pen toward influencing political action. He wrote semi-political articles in the Genovese Indicator, and thereby attained a certain amount of fame. At 23 or 24, he entered the secret society of the Carbonari, a revolutionary organization, writing for it a memorandum in French in favor of the liberty of Spain. About this time, he was sent to Tuscany to spread carbonarism, and was arrested by the government and thrown into prison. Demanding proof of his complicity, Mazzini was successful in an action against the government, and after six months was released. While in prison, he thought out a plan for the organization of Young Italy, and on his release, he chose banishment and the opportunity to prepare for latter action rather than do a constant police surveillance at home. AIIIQ 145, relative coastal data 0.53. Baron de Montcrespio, Charles de Secondat, 1689-1755, a celebrated French writer. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing The family of Montesquieu belonged to the genuine nobility of sword and gown. The writer's father, a second son, was Chief Justice of the Court of Guyenne. His mother, who brought her husband to the estate and castle of La Bride, was infinitely sweet and of a charming appearance. She had the mind of a clever man as regards business matters, and was an unusually tender mother. Both parents were nobles of the kind that classed themselves with the people. They chose for the godfather of their son, Charles, a beggar who happened to present himself at the castle gate at the time of the child's birth. A paternal uncle, Baron of Montesquieu, and President de Mortier, in the Parliament of Bordeaux, left his nephew his name, position, and fortune. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Montesquieu's taste for study was insatiable, and the source of his greatest happiness. From his earliest youth he satisfied the activity of his mind by studying the immense collection of different legal codes in reading, Greek, and Roman classics were his chief delight. 2. Education The boy passed his first three years at a nurse among the peasants thus strengthening his constitution and learning to speak the patois. 
His mother, who died before he was eight years old, inspired him in very infancy with a deep respect for the Christian religion. At an early age, Charles was destined by his father for the magistracy, and as a means of preparation, was sent at eleven to the Oratorian School at Julie. Here he remained until he was twenty-two, engaged in the study of classical and especially Roman literature. Three schools standing in progress, known record. Four friends and associates, known record. Five reading. For diversion, Montesquieu read books of history and travel, the driest tracts of jurisprudence, and the Greek and Roman classics. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity. From his infancy, he showed a quickness of intellect which presented what he was later to become. AIIQ 135. Relative coefficient of data, 0. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 20, Montesquieu composed an essay to prove that the heathen philosophers do not deserve eternal damnation. From his Latin studies, he developed his philosophy based on Stoicism and Pyrrhonism. At 22, he left the school at Jewelry, studied law, and was admitted at 25 to the Parliament of Bordeaux, with the title of Consular. The next seven years were spent in scientific study, anatomy, botany, physics, etc. When he was 32, his Persian letters made him famous in a day. AIIQ 140, relative coast of data, 0.43. End of section 22. Section 23 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2, The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 17. Cases rated at AIIQ 130-140, Part 4. Sir Thomas More, 1478-1535 an English statesman and author. AIIQ 135 AIIIQ 135 1. Family standing Moore's father, a judge of the Court of Common Pleas, later transferred to the King's Bench, is ascribed as courteous, affable, gentle, merciful, just and uncorrupted. The author's mother was the daughter of a London sheriff. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Moore was fond of music and learned to play on the viol and the flute. When he was in his teens at Canterbury, he would suddenly step in among the players and make up a part of his own, which made the onlookers more sport than all the players beside. At Oxford, he says, I loved and thought of nothing but my studies. 2. Education Thomas was brought up in the Latin tongue at St. Anthony's in London, where he had an excellent master, Holt, the author of a Latin grammar. At twelve or thirteen, he was placed in the household of Cardinal Morton, Archbishop of Canterbury, and there, with other sons of the gentry, he attended school and learned good breeding. The Cardinal was so delighted with the boy's wit and learning that he placed him in Oxford, and here for nearly two years he came under the influence of the famous Thomas Linacre of the Croisen, the first scholar who brought Greek letters into England and publicly taught them in Oxford. Besides Greek and Latin, Moore learned French, arithmetic, and geometry, and was proficient in rhetoric, logic, and philosophy. At sixteen, he entered New Inn as a law student. 3. School standing and progress. The Cardinal used to say of Thomas, when he was about thirteen, that he would prove a marvellous man. For the short time he was at Oxford, he profited wonderfully in the Latin and Greek tongues, and made a great proficiency in the academic studies. 4. Friends and Associates. No definite record is found except of his excellent teachers, who exerted a great influence upon him. 5. Reading. It is said that Moore read every book of history that he could procure. 6. Production and achievement. Moore early distinguished himself by the composition of poems in Latin and English, and he tried his hand at little comedies. The dates of these are disputed, but they appear to belong to an early period. He also planned nine pageants to be executed in tapestry or painting to represent the history of a human soul, and for these he wrote appropriate mottos in verse. 7. Evidences of precocity. No further record. AIIQ 135, relative cultural data, 0. 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Moore was admitted to 18 on his, as a student at Lincoln's Inn and was accounted a worthy utter barrister in a remarkably short time. At 22, he was admitted to the bar. 
At twenty, his long friendship with Erasmus, ten years his senior, began. His legal studies did not prevent him from following his literary bent. At twenty-two or twenty-three, he lectured on St. Augustine's City of God, and before he was twenty-five, he was appointed for three successive years lecturer at Furnival's Inn. He had at one time a strong desire to join the Carthusian priesthood, and at another he thought of becoming a Franciscan. AIIIQ 135, Relative Quotient Data 0.53 Napoleon Bonaparte, seventeen sixty nine to eighteen twenty one, Emperor of the French, AIIQ one hundred thirty five, AIIIQ one hundred and forty. One family standing. The Bonaparte family was ancient and honourable, and for many generations its members held prominent places in the social and political life of Corsica. Napoleon's father was a lawyer of moderate gifts and ambition, although inclined to frivolity and somewhat ill balanced. The mother was of hardy peasant stock, with a firm will and a strong hand, courageous and energetic. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. When a very little boy, solitary play in a cave attracted Napoleon more than social games. But he was not entirely unsocial, for his first love affair occurred when he was five. Napoleon is said to have preferred playing with little tin soldiers to any other game and the passion for things military, thus early apparent, continued to manifest itself. A little later he organised and led the village boys against the shepherd boys, and soon was acknowledged leader of the former. At fourteen he became campaign leader of the school boys in their snow fighting, and a little later, while attending the military college at Paris, he spent his three hours studying his tactics and planning battles. Soon after he was eight years old, Napoleon began to show interest in history and mathematics so that he was called by the sisters who taught him the little mathematician. He began to work out problems in applied mathematics. At Brayon, his interest was in history, geography and mathematics. His enthusiasm for his homeland, Corsica, often excited the annoyance or even the hatred of his French companions. From being a loyal Corsican, he became a French revolutionary, and even during his school days in Paris, he began to inveigh against the government. 2. Education at home and before he was five, Napoleon had been taught his letters and a little more. His first school was a school for girls, to which his mother sent him in the hope that his tempestuous nature might there be subdued. He attended two more schools before he was eight. His fourth school, the College of Aton in Paris, gave the young iconoclast a half year in training in French and some preparation for the military college at Brienne, which he attended from his tenth to his sixteenth year. He enjoyed at the same time some training in polite manners from a lady in the town who became interested in him. At fifteen, Napoleon was selected as one of the five boys to attend the military college in Paris. One of the others was his own age. The other three were a year younger. During the years in the Paris college, Napoleon, aged fifteen to seventeen, made little progress. But at sixteen, he was able to pass the examination for graduation. Bonaparte's real training as an officer began after he received his commission, and now beside attending classes in science and military tactics, he took lessons in dancing and deportment. 3. School study and progress. Napoleon never learned to spell correctly. His pronunciation of French was often peculiar, and his penmanship abominable, but he learned quickly, and at Aton he was recognised as an able student. Repetition always irked him. At Brienne, he was soon known for his thirst for knowledge and for his superior powers as well as for his awkward speech. But it was only in the exact sciences and in content subjects that he excelled. His Latin and German were poor. While in mathematics, he held the first place and even as early as his twelfth year, he was chosen to exhibit his work in geography. His professor of literature said his rhetoric was granite heated by a volcano. He would go far if circumstances favour wrote an instructor on the back of a school exercise. Professors of history and of mathematics thought well of him, and the young man's general capacity was rated high by the Brian inspector, who recommended him for naval training. At sixteen, after passing his examination, he received this certificate. Reserved and laborious, he is more fond of study than of any pleasure, likes to read good authors, very diligent in abstract sciences, little inquiring to others. He knows thoroughly mathematics and geography, silent, loves solitude, obstinate, haughty, exceptionally given to egoism, talks little, is energetic in his answers, prompt in action, and severe in meeting opposition, has much self-esteem, is ambitious, and striving for all things. This young man is worthy of being favoured. 
but he passed from school without distinction as 42nd in rank. 4. Friends and Associates In Corsica, Napoleon was somewhat social for his tastes. In France, he was entirely solitary. He had few school friends, and none of these was distinguished. His teachers were men who could see his good points, as well as his all too prominent faults. 5. Reading Maria Napoleon, aged 10 to 17, began to read voraciously, especially during play hours. He was interested in works of history, Polybius, Plutarch and the like. He spent hours over the Atlas. At 12 he read Jerusalem Delivered and at 15 Homer. After his appointment as lieutenant at 16, he devoted his many leisure hours to wide reading. He began to study novels and to try his hand at writing them. 6. Production and Achievement a letter written by Napoleon at 14 contains a remarkable characterization of his brother, Joseph. At 16, Napoleon showed his talent for rhetoric by a stirring rhodomontade, full of youthful patriotism, and composed in honor of Paoli's birthday. Napoleon's professional progress is marked by his commission as second lieutenant at the age of 16. 8. Evidences of Precocity because of the ill-shaven appearance of his head in infancy, it is said that he was the member of the family of whom greatness was least to be prognosticated. But Napoleon's uncle was said only a little later, Joseph is the eldest of the family, but Napoleon is its head. AI IQ 135, relevant coverage of data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Napoleon's ambition was to be a writer. He commenced a history of Corsica and sent it for criticism to A. Brunel. Although teeming with faults, it contained, nevertheless, the germ of something good, and the Abe advised rewriting after further research. At this time, Napoleon was engaged in reading the philosophers, Rousseau, Adam Smith, and Voltaire, the classics, Herodotus and Stronabo, books concerning the glittering East, England, and Germany. From these works, he turned to French history, examining its minutest details of revenue, resources, and institutions. Ill health, together with the wretched financial condition of his family, induced a state of despondency, as so Napoleon began to hope for a political upheaval that might change the general condition of things. His illness forced him repeatedly to take leave of absence. At 21, he became a member of a revolutionary club, holding the views of Reynaud. It was at this period that he was described as self-reliant and secretive, ambitious and calculating, masterful but kindly. In spite of his repeated absences, Napoleon was promoted just before his 22nd birthday to the rank of First Lieutenant of Artillery, but now he began to be known for his political views and was consequently disliked by his colonel. At 22, the young officer was again on leave in Corsica. Here he planned to help the organisation of the National Guard, and having determined to be its commander, he succeeded in winning the position against the greatest odds. He was enthusiastic for the cause of liberty. Less than a year later, he was dismissed from the army for overstaying leave, but he was reinstated almost immediately with the rank of captain. He returned to Corsica after the failure of a French expedition in which he had taken part. But when the consulate severed connection with France and announced the Bonapartes by name, Napoleon and his family were obliged to flee. Captain Bonaparte now decided to throw in his lot with the French Republic, and at the age of 24, he was in command of a battery before Toulon. After a period in which he was unable to succeed because of the inefficiency of the higher command, Napoleon was able, under Dugamayer's able generalship, to distinguish himself for his scientific method, intelligence and bravery. His unusual ability was recognised. He was nominated General of Brigade, and at twenty-four and a half, he received his commission and was assigned to the Army of Italy, where he favoured a vigorous offensive. At twenty-five, he was in command of an unsuccessful expedition against Corsica. Thereafter, he was ordered to a command in La Verte, where he continued his military studies until shortly afterward, aged 25 and three quarters, he was ordered to join the Army of the West. AII IQ 140, relative coast of data 0.75. William Penn, 1644 to 1718, an English friend, founder of Pennsylvania. AII IQ 135, AII IQ 150. 1. Family standing. Penn's remote ancestors were peace-loving English squires, but his immediate forebears were seafaring adventurers of some note. His father, the Admiral, who served at one time as Governor of Kinsale, commanded two successful British campaigns, one against the Spaniards, the other against the Dutch. 
He was a man of great ability and some religious perception. The mother's father was a Rotterdam merchant, probably of Anglo-Irish descent. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Before he was 11, Penner received some of those serious impressions that preserved his youth in purity and awakened Pierre's desires in his mind. At home, aged 11 to 15, he took an active grown-up interest in the improvements of his father's estate and, as later at Oxford, in athletic activity and competition. At 11, he had his first religious experience. He heard the preaching of Thomas Lowe, a Quaker, and had seen how impressed were the members of his family and the servants. Soon, time after, while alone in his room, he had a sudden sense of the reality of the existence of God and the possibility of the soul's communion with the Divine Spirit. From that moment, his heart was comforted, and he believed himself called to a holy life. Before he was fifteen, he had further impressions of a similar mystic nature. At college, Penn and his friends held religious meetings for exhortation and prayer, but by the withdrawal from the national way of worship, they brought upon themselves the censure of the college authorities, whose opposition and criticism, however, served only to increase the young student's idol. A little later, hearing low again, Penn's religious zeal was yet more strengthened. 2. Education Until he was eleven, William attended the new and famous Puritan Grammar School at Chigwell, then during a time of family disgrace while his unfortunate father was imprisoned in the tower for exceeding his orders. Young Penn was removed from school and educated at home under a private tutor. After four years of private instruction, the youth now fifteen entered Christ Church, Oxford. 3. School study and progress at his first school, Penn gave evidence of promising talents in his private study at home, aged 11 to 15. He was diligent at Oxford. He advanced rapidly in learning. 4. Friends and Associates At a college, Penn cultivated the acquaintance of those who were most distinguished for talents and virtue. 5. Reading a record. 6. Production and Achievement An elegy in Latin verse written to commemorate the death of the king's brother is preserved from William Penn's hand. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No further record. AIIQ 135. Relative coach data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. While at Oxford, Penn persisted in his unorthodox religious activities, and as a consequence, was expelled aged 18. He returned home, but here he was thrashed and thrown out of doors by the Admiral, his father only to be later forgiven and then sent to Paris in the hope that his serious trend of mind might be dissipated. From Paris, Penn found his way to Saumur, where he studied theology and French. Then he travelled in Switzerland and Italy. At twenty, he was summoned home by his father to look after the estate, and a year later was sent to Lincoln's Inn to study law. During this period, he was, according to Pepe's report, a fine person. He was employed by the king to carry dispatches to the admiral, then on active service against the Dutch. When the young man returned from his mission, the plague was raging in London, so he went to Ireland first, serving with the Duke of Ormond, and later managing his father's estates, aged 21 or 23. During this period he came, for the third time, in contact with a Quaker preacher, Low, and his religious convictions revived. At 24, in spite of the resulting strained relations with his father, Penn began to preach publicly. He published his first treatise, Truth Exalted, at this time. After the appearance of his next work, Penn was committed to the Tower for Blasphemy, where, during his eight months' imprisonment, he wrote what proved to be the greatest of all his works, No Cross, No Crown. In the following year, 1669, his father and his friends obtained his release. He returned to Ireland, there obtained the freedom of the friends who were in jail, and was gladly accepted as their leader. AIIIQ 150, relative kosher data, 0.60. John Baptiste Racine, sixteen thirty nine to sixteen ninety nine, a celebrated French tragic poet. AIIQ one hundred thirty five, AIIIQ one hundred and fifty. One family standing. Racine belonged to a family of the upper bourgeoisie, which had strong Jansenite leanings. His paternal grandmother had entered Port Royal des Champs. His father occupied the considerable government office of Controleur Angrenaire Essel. There is no information concerning his mother, but a maternal aunt, who became abbess of Port Royal, exerted considerable influence upon her nephew. 2. Development weight 17. 1. Interests. Between 12 and 16, Racine was wounded in a fight over the Civil War, then raging in France. 
His schoolmaster, however, considered the boy's scar a token of courage. From his seventeenth year, the young man's enthusiastic interest was in Greek literature. Poetry was his passion, but he was forced to read it by stealth because it was forbidden by the Jensenites. 2. Education At an early age, Racine lost both his parents. Consequently, his childhood until he was sixteen was not a happy one. In his early teens, he was taught the first principles of Latin by some worthy and learned divines. From 16 to 19, as one of a small number of chosen pupils at a Port Royal school, he was instructed in Greek and Latin by excellent masters. 3. School standing and progress. At the Port Royal school, Racine's wonderful memory caused him to make swift progress in Greek and Latin. 4. Friends and associates. The distinguished director of the school, M. D. Sacy, took particular pains with young Racine. Discerning his talents and hoping that he would one day distinguish himself, he took him into his own apartments and gave him the name and treatment of a son. Racine's masters praised him for his docility and his application. 5. Reading From the age of 16, Racine drank eagerly from the Greek classics, especially with, from the works of Sophocles and Euripides. But since he was poor, he could afford nothing better. He read them in the Baslow editions without any Latin translation. In after years, he would quote whole plays from memory, so deep was the impression of these studies. He learned the Greek romance of Theogines and Caraclea by heart. After the sacristan had burned two copies of the book found in his possession. 6. Production and Achievement Sometime between his 16th and 19th year, he wrote six odes. Although he wrote Latin verse at this time more successfully than French, he preferred the French language and began a translation, which he perfected in later life, of some hymns from the Roman breviary. 7. Evidences of precocity. No further record. AIIQ 135. Other data data.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. The directors of the Port Royal School continued to encourage and develop Racine's talents until the youth at 19 left their care to study in the College of Harcourt in Paris. It was at this time that he initiated his career by a sonnet whose character, however, shocked and grieved Port Royal, but an ode written at 21 found favour with the poet Chapelain, at that time ruler of the French Parnassus, and his patron Colbert, who sent Racine a hundred louis from the king. At 22, after a period of service on the estate of a relative, Racine visited the benefice of an uncle in Provence. And there, while enduring much solitude, he made notes on theology and on poetry, wrote a poem, The Bath of Venus, and began a play. On his return to Paris, Racine continued to devote his time to writing. Encouraged by Moliere's approval of the play started in Provence, Racine, probably at the age of 24, wrote La Thebiade. At 25, he wrote an ode which pleased the king and gained for its author a pension as well as an introduction to the older and already famous dramatist. After the success of La Thebiade, presented by Molière's troupe, when Racine was 25, the young poet collaborated with Molière in writing Alexander le Grand, which was produced the following year. AIIQ 150, with of course of data 0 0.60. William Robertson, 1721-1793, a Scottish historian and clergyman in the Church of Scotland. AIIQ 135, AIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing. On the paternal side, Robertson was descended from a respectable family of long standing. His father, a Protestant minister, a man of learning, of refined tastes, and some poetical gifts. The mother was a daughter of a citizen of Dreghorn. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. It is said of Robertson, when he was between 12 and 20, that he liked to trace and elucidate moral and religious truths, and to apply the process of reasoning to everyday subjects. 2. Education. The youth was educated first at a parochial school and later at Dalkith, a seminary renowned for the superiority of its masters, and he was admitted to the University of Edinburgh when he was a little more than 12 years old. C23. 3. Three, school standing and progress. His ardour of study at the university was such as soon gave indicators of his future eminence. The instruction of eminent professors increased his enthusiasm for the study of history, classical literature and philosophy but mathematics and mechanical speculation left him cold. 4. Friends and Associates Many of Robertson's colleagues rose to high reputation. 5. Reading. No specific record. 
6. Production and Achievement. Robertson's notebooks, dated when he was 14 to 16, bear marks of persevering assiduity, unexampled perhaps at so tender an age. He displayed a diligence and laudable ambition for a boy of 10. See also 2, 3. 7. Evidences of precocity. See 2, 2, 3 and 6. AIIQ 135, relative quotient of data 0. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. In 19, Robertson was licensed to preach, and at 22, he is presented to a living at Gladsmuir. At 24, he assumed the care and education of his orphaned brother and six sisters, although it must have appeared fatal to prospects of further study. But this added burden was not allowed to interfere with his regular duties. His superior talents, displayed in the unassuming good sense of his conversation, obtained to him the friendship and patronage of various men of rank. When the Revolution of 45 broke out, Robertson, then 24, cast off his cowl and shouldered his musket to join the ranks of volunteers. But he had already won notice in the service of the church, and 25, he was elected to the Scottish General Assembly. AIIIQ 140, relative coach of data, 0.43. Maximilian Marie Isidore Roberts Pierre, 1758-1794, so named the Incorruptible, a celebrated French revolutionist. AIIQ 135, AIIQ 145. 1. Family Sterning. The Robespierre family held a distinguished position in the community, one which they had achieved through worth rather than fortune. Maximilian's father was a successful lawyer in Arras, where, according to his son, his talents and integrity had procured for him a large clientele and an independent livelihood. His mother was a daughter of a brewer, an adored wife and excellent mother, who devoted her entire time to the education of her children. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. A favourite occupation of young Robin Spears was the construction of small chapels, but his chief delight was in raising birds. When one of his beloved pigeons was lost in a thunderstorm, he was consumed with grief. He had little of a boy's vivacity, and his bilious, melancholy temperament, no less than his condition in life, made him fonder of study than of play. Indeed, so ardent was he in the study of classical history that his teacher called him the Little Roman. 2. Education Robinspierre appears to have received his earliest instruction from his mother, but she died when he was nine, and only a little later the father lost his reason and left home. Thus the boy at ten became the actual head of the family. He left his responsibility and became astonishingly serious and reflective. He was entered at the College of Arras by two aunts who had taken charge of the orphan children, and two years later at twelve, he received from the bishop a scholarship to the College of Louis de Grand in Paris, where he remained in attendance until he was twenty. 3. School Standing in Progress At ten, Robinspierre entered school, and thanks to unusual intelligence and especially to constant application to his work, he found himself soon after at the head of his class. He was one of the best pupils of the college, and it was largely due to the fact that he received a stipend at the college in Paris. When he was 14 and again when he was 16, his name was included in the honour list. He stated at a later date that the admiration of schoolmates, the praise of professors, and the school records were sufficient proof of his success. Endowed with intelligence enough to be above all with the perseverance in work rarely found in a youth, I was able to gain and keep the first rank in my class. This, he states, was pleasing to him, especially because it gave him self-confidence. 4. Friends and Associates In Paris, Robinspierre's friends were Desmoulins, Duport, Duterte, Lebrun, and Soulin. Danton was a schoolmate. Robinspierre became devotedly attached to a canon of Notre Dame, M. de la Roche, who took him under his protection. 5. Reading no record. 6. Production achievement, C2, 1, 2, and 3. 7 Evidences of Precocity, C2, 2 and 3. AI IQ 135, relevant coefficient of data, 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Of Robinspierre's life in Paris, little is known, but according to his own account, he was admired by his schoolmates and praised by his professors. He was chosen to deliver a speech on one occasion, but his production, although distinguished, was considered too republican for the purpose of which it was designed. His school career finished. Robinspierre, at 20, began his professional study of law, but he also found time to read poetry and philosophy, especially Russell. After completing his law studies, he returned, at 23, to his home at Arras. 
Here his professional work brought him some prominence, and his poetical gifts contributed not a little to his advancement. His part in a curious law case made him the foremost lawyer of the town, and for his literary powers he was elected to a society, poetical in name, but political in nature. In his 25th year he was invited to become a member of the RS Academy, and he accepted the invitation for the reason which he stated thus. I wish that my name should acquire such a popularity among my townsmen, that in the days of social reorganization their eyes should turn naturally to me, and anything that would help to bring this about seemed to me desirable. AIIQ 145, relative commercial data, point four three. Adam Smith, 1723 to 1790. A Scottish political economist. AIIQ 135, AIIQ 145. 1. Family standing. Adam Smith's father, a solicitor privileged to practice before the Supreme Court, held the office of Judge Advocate for Scotland, a position of considerable responsibility. He was also controller of the customs in his district and private secretary to the Scottish Minister, the Earl of London. Adam's mother was a daughter of John Douglas, a considerable landed profiteer. She is said to have treated her only son with unlimited indulgence. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Being sickly as a boy, young Adam could not participate in the more active amusements. In consequence, he developed a passion for books. At Glasgow, his favourite pursuits were mathematics and natural philosophy. His first interest in labour problems came, perhaps, from his knowledge of the Kirkcaldy Nailleries. 2. Education. Until he was 14, young Adam attended the Borough School of Kirkcaldy at the time one of the best schools in Scotland. He came then under David Miller, one of the most able schoolmasters of his day. At turn, Adam began the study of Latin. From 14 to 17, he attended Glasgow College, studying Latin, Greek, mathematics and moral philosophy, under three eminent teachers, Alexander Dunlop, Greek, Robert Simpson, who had a European reputation, mathematics, and Francis Hutchison, a thinker of great original power to whom Smith owed much of the bent of his ideas political economy. At 17, Smith entered Balliol College, Oxford. 3. School standing and progress. At Kirkcaldy School, he attracted attention by the extraordinary powers of his memory. At Glasgow, he showed a specially marked predilection for mathematics. As one of the best students of Glasgow College, he was appointed, by vote of his professors, to one of the Snell exhibitors at Balliol College. When just 17, he was matriculated at Oxford. 4. Friends and Associates Among Adam Smith's early schoolmates was John Drysdale, a lifelong friend who became a chaplain to the king. Smith's associates were fond of him because of his unusually friendly and generous temper, and yet in company he was absent-minded, and went alone in the habit of talking to himself. At Glasgow, his friendship for Matthew Stewart, later the distinguished professor, began. Dr. Maclean, afterward embassy chaplain at The Hague, was also a valued associate. Of all his friends, Professor Hutchison, C22, had the greatest influence on him. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and Achievement. It is stated that in his 17th year, Smith wrote an abstract of Hume's treatise on human nature, which was sent to some periodical for publication. 7. Evidences of Precocity, no further record. AIIQ 135, Relative Data, point four three. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Smith spent six years at Oxford at a period when there were no lecturers, sciences were not taught, and tutors were negligent. However, Balliol College possessed one of the best libraries in the university. Smith read widely in many subjects and in many languages, and he employed himself frequently in the practice of translation to improve his style. He scarcely enjoyed the English experience, for he was in poor health and poor spirits the greater part of the time. He associated with the Scottish students, among whom was his friend Douglas, later a bishop, but the northern group remained somewhat aloof from the natives. There is no record of Smith's graduation, but he is called Dominus on the books, perhaps a self-sufficient evidence of his standing. From the age of 23 to 25, he engaged in study at home, and then began as a public lecturer to deliver a course on English literature, which met with considerable success. AIIIQ 145, Left Coast Data, point five three. Edmund Spencer, 1552-1599, an English poet. 
AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing From Lancashire records, it appears that Edmund Spencer's father was John Spencer, a free journeyman in the art of clockmaking. The poet in his writings claimed kinship also with Sir John Spencer of Althrope, whose three daughters married nobility. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests, no record. 2. Education. Probably between the ages of 9 and 17, Edmund attended the Merchant Taylor School, where his name appears on the records of poor scholars and where he was assisted financially by Robert Noel. 3. School study and progress. No record. 4. Friends and associates. There is no record of any of Spencer's schoolmates achieving distinction. 5. Reading. In the translation described below were, as is generally assumed, the poet's work at the age of 16 or 17. He must at that early age have been able to read the Italian and French originals. 6. Production and Achievement Translations from Bailey and Petrarch, later claimed by Spencer as his productions, appeared when the youthful author was 16 or 17 in Vandernot's book, The Theatre of Wordlings, and much later in a book published under Spencer's own name. The translations are charming renderings, showing characteristics typical of the poet's letter style. 7. Evidence of Precocity, C26. AIIQ 135, Relative Coefficient of Data, 0.11. 3. Development from 17 and 26. Spencer was entered when he was about 17 at Pembroke Hall, Cambridge, as a Cesar, or poor scholar. During his university course, he became learned in the Italian and Greek, was well versed in French and Italian literature, and intimate with a group of clever and brilliant men. He received the BA degree at 21 and the MA at 24. Part of the intern was spent in the north where, according to tradition, his unhappy love affair with Rosalind took place. AIIIQ 145, relevant quotient of data, 0.43. William Makepeace Thackeray, 1811-1863, a French novelist, satirist and critic. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing Thackeray was descended, on the paternal side, from a family of English yeomen. His great-grandfather served as headmaster of Harrow School and as chaplain to the Prince of Wales. His grandfather made a fortune in the service of the East India Company. His father, a man of artistic tastes and a collector of pictures, musical instruments and fine horses, was appointed at the age of 17, collector at Mitten Appear, because of his proficiency in Arabic and Persian. He was judge and magistrate at Rangire and led as secretary to the Calcutta Board of Revenue. Thackeray's mother was a member of an old civilian family of Bengal. The maternal grandfather and an uncle were writers. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. As early as his seventh year, Thackeray ornamented his correspondence and his books, and covered his papers with fanciful drawings. He liked to draw things he brought about, more than things he saw. In his classes, in school, he spent a great part of his time drawing burlesque scenes from Shakespeare, and throughout his early years he continued to enjoy the art of caricature. Between 13 and 15 years of age, he earned a reputation for little poems and parodies. By the age of 16, he said that certain germs of stories were budding in his mind, and that he always felt at home when writing. A schoolfellow described him as having an intense admiration for the beautiful. He was known too as wonderfully social and good-humoured. 2. Education Between 6 and 11, he attended private schools in England. Between 11 and 17, he was enrolled in the overcrowded Charterhouse School. 3. School study and Progress In his early school years, Thackeray often suffered in health and spirits, but he progressed rapidly in spite of his weakness. At 6, he learned geography and had begun Latin and ciphering, which he liked. At the age of 11, he stood 6 in the school, although out of 26, there were only 4 younger than himself. His teacher narrated him constantly, calling him an idle, profligate, shuffling boy. His schoolfellows at the Charterhouse described him as very lazy in schoolwork, and one reports that he never rose high in school or distinguished himself at play, though he had afterward a scholar-like knowledge of Latin. He had an absolute faculty of imitation, a wonderful memory, the power of acquiring. He got to love his Horace, but never was a highly classical scholar. Euclid and algebra he always disliked. 4. Friends and Associates, no record. 
5. Reading Thackeray himself reports that he read only two novels during the term when he was 16, but about this time he read a curious book on the Inquisition, which he described as delectable. See also 2.6. 6. 6. Production and Achievement Thackeray produced many caricatures during his early years. His drawing of the Charterhouse period showed considerable skill. He had a fondness for writing humorous verse, full of almost impossible rhymes. One of his early parodies, Cabbages, is described as generally witty. Thackeray appeared in print for the first time between the ages of 13 and 15, when an Irish melody appeared in a county paper. A little later he illustrated a borrowed copy of The Birds of Aristophanes, with three humorous watercolour drawings. 7. Evidences of Precocity C. 2, 3, 5, and 6. AIIQ 135. Relative commercial data 0.75. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 18, Thackeray entered Trinity College, Cambridge, where he was busy with much reading, first writing, caricaturing, and merry living. He was also a regular contributor to a college weekly, The Snob. At 19 or 20, he left college, spent several months on the continent, returned to London, studied law for some months, went to Paris, read, criticised, drew, and frequented the theatres. At 22, he returned to London, where he began to contribute to The Standard, a literary and artistic periodical. Later in the same year, he became its Paris correspondent. From 23 to 26, he studied art in Paris, but without neglecting his literary activities. Before he was 24, he had written for Fraser's magazine, and at 25, he and his stepfather lost their fortunes in a journal they tried to establish. Thackeray was married the same year. AIIIQ 140, relative kosher data 0.75. Leonardo da Vinci, 1452 to 1519. A famous Italian painter, architect, sculptor, scientist, engineer, mechanician, and musician. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing Leonardo's paternal ancestors for five generations were notaries, with the possible exception of his grandfather, who may have been a vineyardist. His father, Sir Piero da Vinci, was an active, intelligent, and enterprising man who, from the position of poor village notary, rose to be a wealthy and much respected personage. Leonardo's mother, Caterina, was probably a simple peasant girl of the neighbourhood, although one authority claims she was of good family. The liaison of the parents was of short duration. The boy was brought up in his father's household and probably legitimised. 2. Development to age 17 Development to age 20 is included here, as there are no dates given between the ages of 14 and 20. 1. Interests. Leonardo would, no doubt, have distinguished himself in the literary world of his youth, had he not been as unsteady as he was enthusiastic in his various pursuits. The multiplicity of his activities can best explain the smallness of his artistic output. He was interested in astronomy and tried to ascertain the motion of heavenly bodies. He intently studied natural history and botany. He loved music, the lyre being his favourite instrument. 2. Education. At 14, Leonardo was received into Verrocchio's studio, where he had an opportunity to become familiar with all branches of art, theoretical and practical, and to meet eminent contemporaries. But the chief advantage that he received was in the beneficial stimulus to his genius conveyed through association with an older artist. 3. School standing and progress. As little lad, Leonardo mastered mathematical theory so quickly that soon he was able to propose questions which his master himself wasn't able to resolve. Later, under the tutorship of Verrocchio, he made such rapid progress that his master soon found that he could teach him little further. 4. Friends and Associates Leonardo was very handsome, for in him strength and symmetry of form were beautifully combined. His face was strongly expressive of his art and mind, and of the frankness and energy of his character. He was a delight of society wherever he went, and an extraordinary favourite with the fair sex. He led a gay life, maintained a numerous retinue of servants and a sumptuous equipage, and supporting his menage by the products of his own industry. 5. Reading. No specific record. 6. Production and Achievement. Leonardo studied music as a science and soon arrived at such perfection in playing the lute as to compose extemporaneous accompaniments to his own poetical effusions. In the art of forming models and designing, as well as in painting, he attained great excellence. While still a pupil of Verrocchio, he executed with such extraordinary skill with the part assigned him 
in a picture of St. John baptizing Christ that greatly excelled the parts of the picture executed by his master. 7. Evidences of Precocity Leonard recalled as a very early memory that, when he was still in the cradle, a vulture came down to him, opened his mouth with his tail, and struck him a few times with his tail against his lips. AIIQ 135, Relative Coast of Data Point 20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. The earliest example of Leonardo's dead work is a pen drawing of a Tuscan valley belonging to the year 1473, when the artist was 21. To his hand are also ascribed the delicate, intricate details of several of the pictures of the same period from his master's studio. At 20, Leonardo had been enrolled as a master in the Guild of St. Luke. At 24, he left Verrocchio's studio, although he had long before ceased to be an apprentice, and set up as a painter on his own account. There is no record from this time until he was 26, when a commission for the monks of St. Donato brought forth the unfinished adoration of the Magi. This picture gives clear evidence of the intense study and incessant labour which preceded its production, and technically it showed that the young artist had made a great advance from the somewhat narrow formulas of Verrocchio studio pieces. AIIIQ 150, relative coach data, point two zero. Wilhelm Richard Wagner, 1813 to 1883, a German operatic composer and poet. AIIQ 135, AIIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing. Wagner's grandfather was a humble custom house official. His father, a man of superior intelligence, was a court clerk, who, because of his ability and his knowledge of French, was entrusted with the direction of the police department of Leipzig during the French occupation. He was a lover of poetry and passionately devoted to the drama. The mother was bright and amiable and combined practical domestic efficiency with keen intellectual animation. Her family were mill owners. 2. Development to 817. 1. Interests. At 6, Richard was impressed by a biography of Mozart, which was read aloud, and the reports of the Greek War of Independence stirred his imagination. A little later, through attendance with his actor stepfather, he became acquainted with the theatre and the drama, and, being present at the age of eight, at performances of the Frieschutz and the Jungfrukranz, he received an impression that developed and changed his taste in music. Although when he was nine, his mother had as yet seen nothing in him to indicate any musical talent, the boy's dramatic interest was already strong. He enjoyed dressing puppets and once started to compose a chivalric drama, but this was destroyed by the sensitive lad because his sister laughed at it. In music and drama alike, the mysterious and the uncanny appealed most, an attraction perhaps not contradicted by the fact that he was generally terror-stricken when he had to sleep apart from the family in a room that seemed peopled with ghosts. In reality, the portraits had hung on its walls. Encouraged by a first success, Wagner at eleven determined to be a poet, and from this time duller studies ceased to interest him. But in spite of his resolute ambition, Further success was, for a time, denied him. From his twelfth year, his love for music grew stronger and stronger, but it was not until about his nineteenth year that it finally displaced literature from the first rank in his affections. At fourteen, after visiting Leipzig, Wagner became possessed of the wish to be a university student, not from any great desire to study, but rather thus to be emancipated from school and family. His mind rapidly grew mature and independent. In the same year as his Leipzig visit, he was confirmed in the church, but already he felt that his reverence for religious observances was decreasing. It is recorded that a year later, at fifteen, he discussed profound subjects with his playwright uncle. At sixteen, his musical education proceeded. He copied the scores of his beloved masters. He took lessons in harmony as long as he could support the pedantic method employed. He composed a few works, which were, however, Cartily condemned by everyone, and he practised the violin for three months, although with little success. A performance by Schroeder Devrient in Fidelio made him keen to compose a work worthy of her, but when he found he could not, he flung himself into all kinds of youthful excesses. From his earliest years, Wagner was a merry companion, fond of rambles and adventures, and always ready for jokes and pranks. His first case of boyish love was remembered from his fourteenth year, 
From his sixth to his ninth year, he led an unsettled life with consequent irregular schooling. 2. Education Richard's first school was in the country, near Dresden. At eight on the death of his stepfather, he went to live with his step-grandmother at Eiselbend, and here he attended a local private institution. But after his grandmother's death, which shortly occurred, the boy resided with the soap boiler and his family, with whom he became popular for the stories he told, and then with his playwright uncle in Leipzig. At nine, Richard returned to his mother in Dresden and began his five years' attendance at the Kurischwald. At twelve, he took music lessons of a very mediocre description. Shortly before he was fifteen, Wagner was entered in the St. Nicholas School, Leipzig, in a class he had already finished in Dresden, with the result that he neglected his regular schoolwork. At sixteen, he secretly took lessons in harmony from an excellent musician, but found the technique too dry for his taste. 3. School Standing and Progress Wagner writes of his school days, I can hardly judge whether I had what would be called a good head for study. I think that in general what I really liked, I was soon able to grasp, without much effort, whereas I hardly exerted myself at all in the study of subjects that were uncongenial. He made little effort in mathematics and paid attention to the classics only for the dramatic incidents they furnished. Greek mythology and later Greek history were interesting to him. When the boy was twelve, his successes in philological work and recitations attracted the attention of a young teacher who made him recite Hector's farewell from the Iliad and Hamlet's celebrated monologue. In his piano lessons, Richard attempted to play the overture to the Freischutz at first by year. His teacher said nothing would come of him, and he never did learn to play the piano well, although he continued to play overtures for his own amusement without carrying to perfect his technique. 4. Friends and Associates Wagner's teachers and fellow students are mentioned casually. Members of the family appear to have had considerable influence on his early development. See 2, 1, 2 and 6. 5. Reading At 14, Wagner fell heir to his father's library. Apparently he was a wide reader in poetry and the drama, and his command of English was sufficient to enable him to study Shakespeare in the original. 6. Production and Achievement at eight, Wagner played on the piano, a poem written when he was eleven in well-constructed and well-rhymed verses in commemoration of a schoolfellow who had died, was accepted and published. Wagner began a heroic poem in hexameter verse, but could not get through the first canto. At thirteen, he translated, as a self-imposed task, the first twelve books of the Odyssey, and also made a metrical translation of Romeo's monologue. At fourteen, living alone in a little garret, he devoted himself for three months to verse writing and to crystallising a stupendous tragedy which was forming in his mind. This was a grandiloquent and bombastic, little bold und Adelaide, completed at fifteen, a hodgepodge of elements from various plays of Shakespeare and from Goethe's Gotts, upon whose appearance even the playwright uncle joined the rest of the family in criticisms of lost time and preferred talents. However, Wagner had determined to set his work to music, although his training had been limited to listening. In spite of family disapproval, he secured a copy of Logier's Method of Thorough Bass in order to acquire the necessary technique, and he also gained congenial instruction from Hoffmann's Fantastiesque Look. At sixteen, he composed a sonata, a quartet, and an aria. One composition, played by the band in Kinchy's Swiss Chalet, was said by an old music critic not to contain a single good note. Wagner's musical idols at this time were Beethoven and Mozart. 7. Evidences of Precocity Wagner's stepfather appears to have recognised some superiority in the boy, for he hoped to make something of him, but see 2, 1, 2, 3, and 6. AIIQ 135, relative coach of data 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. When Wagner was 17, he fell into such disgrace at school that he found it advisable to leave. Six months in another gymnasium was not productive of any good result. An overture of this period, a poor thing, received a poorer performance, and this turned the composer's mind to the necessity of real study. At 18, he enrolled as a music student at the University of Leipzig, but here, as in the preparatory school, gambling obsessed his mind until he determined to give up the habit entirely. 
Now having little taste for philosophy or aesthetics, he concentrated on counterpoint and wrote three overtures, one of which was played at the Guanadors to encouraging applause. A visit to Vienna and Prague followed, and Wagner, aged 19, wrote a symphony which was performed successfully at Leipzig. At this time, Wagner was definitely a romanticist. He took the French and Italian schools as his models, discarding Beethoven. A romantic opera was favourably received, and at 22, Wagner was appointed musical director of the Magdeburg Theatre. In the same year, and in his own theatre, at hastily rehearsed opera, Das Leibesverbot proved a failure. At 23, the young composer transferred to a similar theatrical composition at Konigsberg and married a woman who, although an actress, was prosaic and never understood him. The next year, Wagner moved to Riga and there conceived the outline of his first grand tragic opera, Rinzi. By the summer of 1838, he had finished the poem, and the following spring, when the Riga engagement terminated, he, aged 26, had already composed the first two acts. AII IQ 150, relative coastal data 0.53. Karl Maria von Weber, 1786-1826, a celebrated German composer, famous as a creator of romantic opera. AIIQ 135, AIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing Various members of Weber's family, and especially his father, were possessed by a musical demon. This father was first a soldier, then a civil servant, and finally director of the Weber Company of Players, his own family, which toured Germany with more or less success and a very great hardship. Both parents belonged to the lesser nobility. 2. Development towards 17. 1. Interests. Weber's one absorbing interest was in music, and gradually he neglected all the other arts for this one. At 15 he first began to question and to examine theories, and from this time onward he walked alone intellectually. 2. Education. Weber suffered from a disease of the hip bone which resulted in lameness, with the result that he could not walk until he was four years old. Before he used his legs, he was taught to sing and to play on the clavier, and before the age of six, he knew how to write. His father's mania was to make of his son a musical genius, and if possible, a second Mozart. But the frail child shrank almost in disgust from the frequent experiments tried upon him. Orchestra and stage were familiar to the boy before he had learned to read. Before he was nine, he was instructed in oil, miniature, and pastel painting and engraving. In all the arts, he exhibited ability, but genius in none. He was expected by his father to begin with complete productions, yet in no case was he taught the elements of the subject. Gradually, music supplanted the other arts and became the boy's one subject to study, as it was his chief interest. At nine, Weber was instructed in piano playing and in thorough bass by the Meningen Orchestra director whose interest had been attracted by the boy's performance. And now for the first time, he received serious instruction in which fundamentals were emphasised. At ten, Weber was placed in the Archiepiscopal Institute for Young Cloisters, where he was instructed by the aged Michael Hayden, who was so drawn to the boy that he gave him musical instruction without remuneration. From this teaching, however, the boy got little profit, for Hayden's strict dry method cramped his powers. At twelve, young Weber was taken to Munich by his father to learn there the operatic and dramatic arts. He studied singing with Felizzi, who was considered the greatest singing teacher of all time, and music with Calcio, afterward the Munich court organist. Still hoping to produce a genius, and intending to print his son's future masterpieces himself, the older Weber associated himself with the little graver and required Karl Maria to learn the printing art. But the son returned to music the same year. At sixteen, he received instruction in Vienna from a skillful master who insisted on his acquiring the fundamental technique and on his learning to know the master works of the past. 3. School standing on progress. In Munich at twelve, Weber's rich imagination and budding talent daily astonished his teacher. He soon excited the envy of his oldest fellow pupils, not only as a piano executant, but as a singer. 4. Friends and Associates. Weber's weapon of vivacity made him, from his infancy, a great favourite with all his associates. The most distinguished musicians liked him and aided his progress. Various Kappelmeisters were his affectionate patrons, 
and the poet Voss became his friend when the young musician was not more than sixteen. Five reading, no record. Six production and achievement. When he was eleven, Weber published his first compositions, six short fugues, approved by his teacher Michael Hayden and mentioned favorably by Rochlitz, the great musical critic of the day. At twelve, he had written an opera, The Power of Love and Wine, but neither for this nor for a number of other pieces with which his father wished to astonish the world could a publisher be found. A fire which destroyed all of his early compositions was accepted by the young composer as an omen that he was to give up music. But the favourable criticism by Rooklitz of his next composition and the unfavourable criticism of his new art lithography led him to reverse his decision. The Carlsbad theatre manager became interested in young Weber and entrusted to him the opera book he had written, which the musician, aged 13, set to music the following year. This work, whose second act had been composed in ten days, was produced successfully in a number of cities. It was played fourteen nights in Vienna, translated into Bohemian for Prague, and presented also in Petersburg. At fifteen, Weber composed a little two-act comic opera, which was praised by crusty old Michael Hayden. A number of compositions were returned by the publishers to whom they were offered, but six little duets, which had since been declared by music critics to be the equal of any of his latter piano compositions, were published. At sixteen, Karl Maria wrote his first real lead, and this was followed by many charming songs whose words were supplied by Voss. Before he was seventeen, Weber had written his second opera. As an executive artist, the youthful Weber made brilliant progress. At thirteen, he played in concerts in many cities with signal success. And at fifteen, was well received in the cities of North Germany, which he visited with his father. Seven, evidences of precocity. The older Weber wished to make a prodigy of his son at any cost. The extent to which he succeeded has already been told. See two. 2, 3, and 6. AI IQ 135, relative quotient of data point six zero. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Weber was a popular singer of gay songs in Vienna. Nearly a year later, at 17 and 3 fourths, he was appointed conductor of the Breslau Orchestra, where, in spite of the distrust and opposition of many of the musicians of the town, the debts which he rapidly incurred, and the cost of supporting his father, he gradually climbed the artistic ladder by his brilliant improvisions and some trifles in composition. Shortly after this, Weber accidentally drank some acid and was for months seriously ill. On his recovery, he resigned his conductorship and became, first, musical director to Duke Eugen of Württemberg, a latter secretary to his brother, Duke Ludwig. While holding this latter post, Weber offended the king and so spent a short time in prison. It was in prison at twenty that he composed the song Ein Stetter Kampf ist Anser Leben. After his release, he found friendly associates in Denneker, the sculptor, Matheson, the poet, Sepower, the violinist and composer, and Danzi, the conductor. But again he got into debt. The situation was rendered worse by the embezzlement of ducal funds by his own father, and at length the king banished both father and son. Stricken with remorse, the young musician decided to devote his life to art. He studied with young Meyerbeer and began again to compose. A successful tour followed, in the course of which composition continued. His work showed increasing independence of thought and individuality. At twenty-five, Weber was honoured by the court of Weimar, but was snubbed by Goethe, who, however, gave him a better reception seven months later. During the same year, many works of merit, including the great Pianforte Concerto, in E-flat, were published. AII IQ 145, relative coast of data 0.53. John Wesley, 1703 to 1791, an English clergyman, son of Samuel Wesley, famous as the founder of Methodism. AII IQ 135, AII IQ 140. 1. Family standing. Wesley's father, the earnest and laborious rector of Epworth, was a graduate of Oxford and a busy writer. A number of his ancestors, men noted for learning and conspicuous for pity, were religious ministers, who had been rejected in consequence of the Act of Uniformity. The mother was a remarkable woman of stern pity and rare judgment, with a mind both clear and strong, whose father was an Oxford man, also an injected minister. 
2. Development Weight 17. 1. Interests. Wesley early showed a train of deliberation and pertinacity in his character. He would never do anything until he had considered it well. At school he preserved his health by running around the charter house garden three times every morning. The master encouraged his propensity for telling stories to the other children, since this attracted them from the playground. 2. Education The Wesley children were carefully and somewhat severely trained by their mother. Formal education began at the age of five. The training been given at regular times for six hours each day. The boys learned their letters on the first day, then proceeded to spelling and so to reading, first a line, then a verse, and no lesson was left off until it was perfect. The whole day's task was repeated once or twice during the day, and thus the children made remarkable progress. From the age of 11 to 17, Wesley attended the Charterhouse School and laid there a solid foundation of scholarship. 3. School standing on progress. Under their mother's tuition, Wesley, aged 5 to 11, and his brothers and sisters made rapid progress. At Charterhouse, John's quietness, regularity, and industry made him a favourite with his teachers. At 16, he was reported by his older brother Samuel, a brave boy, learning Hebrew as fast as he can. 4. Friends and Associates In early childhood, because of the undesirable neighbourhood in which they lived, the Wesleys were restricted to association with members of their own family. No specific account is given of schoolboy friendships. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and achievement. No record. 7. Evidences of precocity. Wesley and his brother learned the alphabet in one day at the age of five, while two of the sisters required a day and a half. At eight years of age, grave and sedate, of strong individuality and high spirit, always wanting to know the reason for everything, he was so far beyond his years that his father admitted him to the commune. AI IQ 135, relative quotient of data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Wesley passed from Charterhouse to Christ Church, Oxford, where he became distinguished for his scholarship. It was written by a contemporary that he was the very sensible and acute collagen, baffling every man by the subtleties of logic and laughing at them for being so easily routed, a young fellow of the finest classical taste and most manly and liberal sentiments gay and sprightly with a turn for wit and humour. He was ordained deacon at 22. From 23 to 26, he was a fellow at Lincoln College, and during the year at Oxford, worked according to a regular program. His studies embracing classics, logic and ethics, Hebrew and Arabic, metaphysics and natural philosophy, oratory, poetry, divinity and French. In a letter written about this time, Wesley said, Leisure and I take leave of one another. I propose to be busy as long as I live, and my health so long indulged me. From 24 to 26 he returned home and acted as curate to his father, who was in failing health. At 25 he was ordained priest, and at 26 he returned to Lincoln College to resume his studies and to give lectures on divinity. AII IQ 140, relative coast of data 0.60. End of section 23. Section 23 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2, The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses, by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording, or LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 18, Cases Rated AI IQ 140 to 150, Part 1. Louis Agassiz, 1807 to 1873. A celebrated Swiss American naturalist. AIIQ 140, AIIQ 160. 1. Family Standing. Agassiz's father was a Swiss pastor and the descendant of five generations of Swiss pastors. He was also a teacher of considerable reputation. The mother was a daughter of a physician whose father was also a physician. She was always her son's most intimate friend. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests Before he was ten, Agassiz had apparently no precocious predilection for study. He was, however, given to making collections of fishes, birds, field mice, hares, rabbits and guinea pigs, whose families he reared with the greatest care. At fifteen he became interested in the structure and habits of animals, birds, fishes and insects, and at sixteen, discovering that authorities differed in their classifications, 
he formed the wish to know the truth of the matter for himself. Guided by his knowledge of the haunts and habits of fishes, he and his younger brother became adroit fishermen, independent of hook, line, or net. The only punishment he remembered receiving in childhood was inflicted for going fishing in an unsafe boat. Agassiz was fond of indoor occupations, and when still very small could cut and put together a well-fitting pair of shoes for his sister's dolls. He was no bad tailor, and he could make a miniature barrel that was perfectly watertight. In spite of this fondness for quiet occupations, he was by nature active and even daring, and after he began at ten to attend school, he spent his summer vacations in out-of-door activities, fishing and rambling about the country. He was an expert swimmer, but he cared neither for shooting nor for horsemanship. At fourteen, Exis wrote to his parents, I resolved as far as I am allowed to do so to become a man of letters. Mr. Rickley tells me that I have a taste for geography. He will give me a lesson in Greek, gratis, in which we would translate Strabo, provided I can find one. I should like to stay at Bien till the month of July, and afterwards serve my apprenticeship in commerce at Nocatel for a year and a half. Then I should like to pass four years at a university in Germany, and finally finish my studies at Paris, where I would stay about five years. Then at the age of twenty-five, I could begin to write. 2. Education Until Agassiz was ten, his parents were his only teachers, but they did not stimulate his mind beyond the ordinary attainments of his age. In his eleventh year, he was sent to attend the daily nine-hour school course of the College for Boys at Bien. Entering at fifteen, he attended for two years the college at Lausanne, and there, as a result of his superior ability and apparent special aptitude, he was permitted to choose medicine as his profession. 3. School Standing and Progress When Agassiz entered the Bien Boys College at ten, he found himself on a level with his class, though he was a very clever student, he had little inclination for mathematics or for the physical and chemical sciences. He always showed great capacity for languages, becoming quite proficient in Latin and Greek. He spoke German like a native, and at Bien he learned Italian. Geography was a favourite study. At twelve his ambition was to command the whole field of scientific nomenclature. When Agassiz was fifteen, the family planned to send him to enter the business house of his uncle, but his schoolmaster persuaded the parents to let the boy continue his studies and to give encouragement to his remarkable intelligence and zeal. At fifteen and sixteen, Agassiz was a brilliant student in a school where there was keen competition. 4. Friends and Associates Agassiz's closest associate was his brother Auguste, C21. The two had all things in common. A first love affair at eleven, with a cousin, affected Louis deeply and in a peculiar way, for as a result of having his lady's name tattooed on his arm with sulfuric acid, he was visited by a severe attack of fever. Several years later, Chavans, director at the Cantonal Museum, and Agassiz's uncle, Dr. Matthias Mayer, a physician of note in Lausanne, became interested in the youth, and it was through association with them that he came to choose the profession of medicine. 5. Reading It is recorded that at 14, Agassiz reported to his parents his need for books on ancient and modern geography and Greek, an Italian dictionary and a Latin grammar. 6. Production and Achievement at 10 or 11, Agassiz began a series of exercise books containing notes on physiological, pathological, and anatomical subjects, and some general natural history. He continued this series for 8 or 9 years. 7. Evidences of Precocity C. 2, 1, and 3 AIIQ 140, Relative Coast of Data 0.75 3. Development from 17 to 26 Agassiz's intellectual superiority was recognised by his professors, at twenty, his first essay in natural history appeared. At twenty-two, he took the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and published an Ichiology that was commended by Cuvier and that, with his other researchers, won the young scientist's recognition as an authority in his field. His further studies were encouraged by such men as Cuvier and Humboldt. At twenty-three, he became M.D. and began the practice of medicine because it seemed more practical than pure science. After a year of research in Paris, Agassiz was appointed professor at Nocatel. He declined a call to Heidelberg the same year. AIIIQ 160, relative cost of data 0.75. Pierre Augustin Caron de Bumarcaeus.
1732-1799, a French polemic and dramatic writer. AIIQ 140, AIIQ 145. 1. Family standing. Pierre Caron was descended from Huguenot ancestors, but his father had turned Catholic. Both the grandfather and the father were watchmakers. The latter, a versatile man of great mechanical talents, had given himself a scientific education far beyond that usually possessed by one of his craft. He had, moreover, considerable literary ability, but in spite of his gifts he was never able to achieve worldly success. Caron's mother, though an excellent person, seems to have been of ordinary intellect. Both parents belonged to the middle or lower middle class. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Pierre Caron was a lively, roguish youngster, always getting into mischief. He followed his father's trade of watchmaker, but a letter still extant shows the difficulty the father experienced in keeping his son in order. Bune Marcaeus did not show any decided literary bent until at a very mature age. 2. Education At the age of ten, young Caron was sent by his father to a professional school at Alfort, where he learned the rudiments of Latin but he was recalled three years later in order to become a watchmaker. 3. School standing and progress. At the Alford School, Karen certainly acquired more knowledge than there was any idea of imparting to him, but his tutors never suspected his brilliant, though latent capacity. 4. Friends and associates. Pierre Karen had the merriest possible childhood. He played with his sisters and commanded a band of little good-for-nothings roving about either to plunder the larder of Margot, the cook, or returning at night to disturb the slumbers of the neighbours. The boy's wild associates during the period of his apprenticeship and his uncontrolled behaviour gave his father serious concern. 5. Reading. No specific record. 6. Production and achievement. A witty and vivacious letter in verse is preserved from Pierre's 14th year. Commenting on it at the age of 66, his author says, According to the custom at public schools, I had been more occupied with Latin verses than with the rules of French versification. A man is always to recommence his education on getting free from the pendants. 7. Evidences of precocity. No further record. AIIQ 140. Relative quotient of data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the age of 13, young Garon began to work with his father as watchmaker's apprentice, but he was associated with a band of youths whose tendencies were towards gaiety, even to the point of dissipation, and his irregular habits were such that his father eventually expelled him from home. However, at 18, he was received again after signing a rigid contract, and feeling that his honour was at stake, he served his father dutifully and soberly for the next six years. At the age of 20, the young man discovered a new escapement for watches, which, however, was appropriated by the famous watchmaker Lepanti, to whom the young inventor took it, the older man announcing it as his own. Cohen referred the matter to the Academy of Sciences, and the dispute was finally decided in his favour. At twenty-three, the young inventor presented to Madame de Pompadour a watch set in a ring and employing his new device. During the same year, he became acquainted through his business as watchmaker with Madame Franquet and through the instrumentality of her husband, was appointed to a minor court office. In the following year, Madame Franquent died, and young Karen, now assuming the additional name of Pierre Marchais, married the young widow. To his extreme grief, this lady, of whom he was very fond, died after about a year of married life. At twenty-six, Pierre Marchais invented an improvement for the harp, which brought him the favourable notice of the king and his daughters. AII IQ 145, relative coastal data 0 0.60. Richard Bentley, 1662 to 1742, an English classical scholar and critic. AII IQ 140, AII IQ 150. 1. Family standing. The Bentley family had been well to do yeomen, and Richard's father owned a small estate. The mother was a woman of excellent understanding who taught her son the elements of classical learning. She was a daughter of a stonemason and builder who had served as a major in the Civil War. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. No record has been found other than that in 1, 3 and 6. 2. Education. Before he entered the village school, 
Bentley was taught Latin grammar by his mother. From the age of 10 to 14, he attended the grammar school at Wakefield. At 14, he was sent by his grandfather, his father having died a short term before, to the university, where he received the BA degree three and a half years later. 3. School study and Progress In his early years at school, Bentley was frequently punished for seeming idleness, for they could not discover that he was pondering in his mind and fixing what he had learned more firmly in his memory than if he had been bawling it out amongst the rest of his school fellows. Yet he went through the school with singular reputation for his proficiency, as well as for his regularity. When he entered the university, Bentley was four or five years younger than was usual at matriculation. There were no prizes offered during his college years, little value being attached to scholarship honours at that period. However, the young student held the third place in achievement and at 16 received the honorary position of scholar. 4. Friends and Associates Bentley's university class included the poet, physician and philanthropist Garth and Dennis, the literary critic William Watton, a juvenile prodigy who had 13 new 12 languages and received his B.A., was a contemporary at Cambridge with whom Bentley retained friendship in after life. 5. Reading. Bentley evidently read extensively. 6. Production and Achievement. He wrote verses during his college years that have the jerky vigour of youth, whose head is full of classical illusions and who is bent on making points. 7. Evidences of Precocity. C. 2.3. AIIQ 140, relative quotient of data 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 20, Bentley was appointed to the headmastership of a grammar school at Spalding, Lincolnshire. At 21, he became tutor to the son of the Dean of St. Paul's, Stilling Fleet, and during the same year, he obtained the master's degree. He continued his tutorship until his 28th year, devoting much of his life to careful study and the writing of critical notes. Before he was 24, he had compiled a sort of hexapla, a dictionary of Hebrew, with the corresponding forms in five other languages. AIIQ 150, relative kosher data 0 0.60. Mary Francois Xavier Bichat, 1771-1802, a celebrated French physiologist and anatomist, the founder of scientific histology and pathological anatomy. AIIQ 140, AIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing Bychat's father was a physician. Of his mother's family, there is no record. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. No record of any aside from his studies. 2. Education. Bychat was sent at a very early age to the College of Nantua to study the humanities. At 16, he entered the seminary of St. Yereni at Lyons to complete his studies by a course in philosophy. 3. School standing and progress. He was distinguished at school for his work, his respect for his masters, and his attachment to his fellow students. Every year at Nantua, he carried off the prizes, and at Lyons, he studied public examination of physics and mathematics with the greatest distinction. 4. Friends and associates, no specific record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity. By chat was from the first one of those rare persons who show even in youth the qualities for which they will later become distinguished. AIIQ 140, relative coach of data, 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. With the outbreak of the revolution, all educational work was paralysed, and By chat returned to Lyons to study anatomy with his father. A taste for mathematics, however, drew him back to Lyons, where he followed that study as well as anatomy. At the age of 21, attracted by the fame of the anatomist, Dessault, Bychart went to Paris. By sheer merit, he came to the notice and favour of the master, Dessault, who took him into his own home. The latter predicted for the boy a great future. When Bychart was 23, Dessault died and the pupil undertook the publication of the master's journal of surgery. In doing so, he revised the work completely and created, in fact, a code of surgical doctrine. At the same time, he was busily engaged in teaching. At 25, Bychart began a course of anatomical demonstrations, which were so successful that he followed them by a similar series in operative surgery, and a year later by a course in physiology. AIIIQ 150, relative coast of data, 0.53. Hermann Boerhave, 1668-1738. 
a famous Dutch physician, professor of botany, medicine and chemistry at Leiden. AIIQ 140, AIIQ 150. 1. Family standing. Boerhaave's father was a scholarly minister of the church, a kindly, amiable and diligent man. The mother was a tradesman's daughter who was inquisitive to the study of physic. Her death occurred when her able son was no more than five years of age. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Although, or perhaps because his central interest was in study and research, Boerhaave was early sent by his father into the fields to recreate his mind and strengthen his constitution. As a result of this early habit, rural occupations remained throughout his life, his pleasure and recreation. Interest in medical science was aroused by his own painful experience with an ulcer that resulted from an accident when he was eleven, and for five years baffled the skill of the physicians. 2. Education Designed by his father for the ministry, Boerhaave was trained at home in grammatical learning and in the first elements of the languages. At fourteen he was brought by his parents to Leiden, where necessary medical treatment was more readily available than at home in the province, and there he attended the public school. After the death of his father, when Boerhaave was sixteen, serious financial obstacles were offered to the boy's further education, but he determined to continue his studies as long as his patrimony should hold out. At the university, he was most fortunately recommended by a learned professor to a Leiden gentleman who constituted himself the young man's generous and constant patron. 3. School standing and progress. In his earliest learning, Boerhaave made such a proficiency that he was, at the age of 11 years, not only master of the rules of grammar, but capable of translating with tolerable accuracy and not wholly ignorant of critical niceties. At the Leiden school, he was placed at 14 in the fourth class after being examined by the master. Here, his application and abilities were equally conspicuous. In six months, by gaining the first prize in the fourth class, he was raised to the fifth, and in six months more, upon the same proof of the superiority of his genius, he was rewarded with another prize and translated to the sixth, from whence it is usual in six months more to be removed to the university. In the higher institution, the same genius and industry met with the same encouragement and applause. 4. Friends and Associates Boerhaave's scholarly father, his learned teacher, Winskotan, and a number of distinguished university professors interested themselves in furthering the young man's education. 5. Reading, no specific record, C2, 2, two and 3. 6. Production and Achievement, C2, 3. 7. Evidences of Precocity, no further record, AIIQ 140, relative cost of data point six zero. Three Development from 17 to 26. Until he obtained a degree in philosophy at the age of 21, Boerhaave continued his study of theology, mathematics, and languages. In 1920, he won a gold medal awarded by the university for a Latin oration. His thesis for the degree and a disputation held shortly after were examples of his vigorous scholarship. After winning his first degree, he undertook to teach mathematics to enable himself to continue his theological studies. The Burgomaster of Leiden recommended him for the examination of certain manuscripts. He also advised him to study medicine in addition to theology. Borhev followed the advice, and at 24, after several years' study under various distinguished teachers, he took the degree of Doctor of Physic at the University of Heidewick. Disqualified from the ministry because of his reputed atheism, he entered upon the practice of medicine, at the same time continuing his scientific research. At 32, he was appointed, almost against his will, for he had refused other than perhaps more lucrative appointments, to a professorship in the University of Leiden. AIIIQ 150, relative coast of data 0.75. Robert Boyle, 1626-1691. A celebrated British chemist and natural philosopher. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family standing. Boyle's father was a great Earl of Cork, the descendant of an ancient family, a native of England. He was educated at Cambridge and later became the Lord High Treasurer of Ireland and founder of the House of Cork in Ordinary. The mother, a lady of great beauty and strength of character, was a daughter of the principal secretary of state for Ireland a writer and politician. She died when her son Robert was only a few years old. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Boyle was studious from his earliest childhood, 
and there was scarcely anything more he greedily desired than to know the truth, so was there scarce anything he more perfectly detested than not to speak it. So attractive did his instructor make his study that he preferred it to play, and it often to be forced to take enough recreation to preserve health. At an age unstated, Boyle was accustomed to concentrate his attention by focusing it upon such problems as the extraction of square and cube roots. He was early fond of versification, C26. In Geneva, aged 12 to 15, he learned fencing, which he enjoyed, and dancing, which he abhorred. His favourite recreations were tennis, playing, and the reading of romances. C25. 2. Education. Boyle was early committed to the care of a country nurse and a healthy outdoor life. It is said that his stuttering was acquired by imitating some other children, and that, once fixed, the habit resisted every attempt at cure. As soon as he was old enough, Robert was taught to speak both French and Latin and to write a fair hand. At eight he was sent to Aton, then in charge of an admirable teacher, a friend of his father. But here he appears to have made no great progress. At twelve he returned to Ireland, where he was instructed by a tutor who brought back his interest in Latin literature, and under whom he greatly increased his facility in that language. Instruction in music was begun, but not carried far, for lack of ability in that line of, in the pupil. From twelve to fifteen, Boyle lived in Geneva, where he continued his studies, including mathematics, geography, and fortifications, logic and rhetoric, under an unusually skillful private tutor. 3. School standing on progress. As a child, Boyle added to a reasonable forwardness in study, a more than usual inclination to it. At Eton, when he was no more than eight years old, aptness and willingness to learn were noticed in him. His teacher often excused him from the regular classes and instructed him privately, employing all the devices of skillful instruction to increase the pupil's interest in study. In his last years at Eton, aged 11 and 12, and under the instruction of a pedant, the boy's earlier interest was lost. However, as he came more and more to hate the study of bare words, an enthusiasm for history and the recounting of gallant acts developed. In Geneva, aged 12 to 15, Boyle became so skilful in the use of the French tongue that he was ever after able, when occasion arose, to pass as a Frenchman. From 12 to 18, Boyle acquired, during a sojourn in Italy, considerable facility in speaking and reading Italian. 4. Friends and Associates No specific record found of others than teaching. See 2, 2 and 3. 5. Reading Before he was 10, Boyle had found in reading Quintus Curtius, a treasure house which yielded him more, as he said, than Alexander's conquest had yielded to that great general. The greed for knowledge was aroused. After an attack of Og, from which recovery was slow, Boyle was given the adventures of Amadis of Gaul and others which accustomed his mind to the habit of roving led regarded by him as a serious handicap. Between the ages of twelve and fifteen, he read an excellent French book describing the world and its inhabitants, and numerous French romances, thereby increasing his facility in the use of the French language. While in Italy, he devoted himself largely to reading modern Italian history, and to the new paradoxes of the stargazer Galileo. 6. Production and Achievement at twelve, Boyle had a considerable facility in writing Latin prose and verse. English verse writing he also cultivated at this time, but he later abandoned it while continuing to cultivate the muse in Latin and French. He learned to speak French perfectly, and Italian with comparative ease. 7. Evidences of Precocity C2, 2 and 3 AIIQ 140, Relative Quotient of Data, point by 3 3. Development from 17 to 26 after his return from the continent at 18 and during most of the period to 1653, his 28th year, Boyle resided in Ireland, where he was engaged in literary and scientific pursuits. He wrote a number of essays on various subjects, carried on some experiments in chemistry, and from 1647, age 21, was an active member of the Invisible College, which was later to become the Royal Society. His quiet study was interrupted by two tours to the continent and a number of brief visits to England. Before he was 26, Boyle had achieved a considerable reputation as a philosopher and scholar. AIIIQ 140, Relative Coastal Data, point six zero. Edward G. Bulwer and Lytton, Lord Lytton, 1803-1873, to 
an English novelist, poet, dramatist, politician, and orator. AIIQ 140, AIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing Bulwer's paternal grandfather was the most learned personage among the gentry of his neighbourhood. His father was an athletic, strong-willed, ambitious soldier who became a general, and who was credited by his son with distinguished gifts. The mother's family was ancient and honourable. The maternal grandfather was a gentleman and an able but eccentric scholar. The mother herself possessed some literary accomplishments. A wide reader, she was also a writer of verse. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Bulwer's early tastes, which were largely literary, were in abeyance at his first two schools. At the third, they reappeared. Although he now read with pleasure and studied with ease, he was at no time less fond of sports than of study. At his third school, young Edward, aged nine to fifteen, was conspicuous for his athletic prowess, and although he fought only once, he was considered the best pugilist of the school. A letter written at fourteen and a half shows a boy's affection for his mother and his brother. At sixteen he had a love affair, a silent one, with a young peasant girl. At sixteen or seventeen his tutor infected him with a passion for public affairs, so that he called quite an oratical mania, although his aspirations were still in the main poetical rather than political. 2. Education Bulwer stated that he must have learned to read very early, as he could not recall a time at which reading was not familiar to him. In contrast to this report is the statement that, when he was six, his grandfather, Lighton, predicted that he would never learn his ABCs. The grandfather is said to have added to this the further prediction that the boy would live to break his mother's heart. When he was about seven, young Bulwer, with dire labour, learned to write. But even then he did not find writing necessary to composition. At his first school, which he entered his tenth year, he stayed two weeks, was hazed unmercifully, and was miserably homesick. At the second, which he attended with his brother, he wasted two years learning marbles and trying to learn Latin. At eleven and twelve, he was out of school for his health. In his thirteenth year, he was sent to a celebrated preparatory school where he remained three years. When he left this institution, being older in mind and appearance than his years, he considered himself too much of a man to go to school any longer. But after an unsuccessful search for a tutor, he was placed in school again. Then following a quarrel with the usher, a box in the ear for the master, and two days of solitary confinement, his mother took him away from the school. He spent the next two years at a small private school. 3. School Standing and Progress it was at his third school that Bulwer, aged 12 to 15, obtained a reputation for cleverness. When he was 15, his schoolmaster, impressed with the boy's talents, wrote to the mother, Every day convinces me more and more that any private school, whether mine or any other, will be perfect ruin to him. He has a mind of very extraordinary compass. He has an emulation rarely found and an anxiety and attention to care about his business very uncommon. He has a physique, force and spirit, which defy all competition here, and all these things so desirable and so fitting him for a public school are ruined to him here. No boy can control him. Whoever lives to see him, a man, will find his mind employed. Not in the minor elegancies of life, but in the higher branches of occupation and ambition. He can and he will, if led on by a public school, highly distinguish himself there, and in after life he is capable of extraordinary exertion and self-denial also for any object in which he is interested. But without it, his high spirits, his eagerness to pleasure, and keen enjoyment of it may prove the ruin of his character. At his next school, Bower, aged 15, was probably the best classical scholar, certainly the best Greek scholar, but the worst calligrapher and the most blundering arithmetician. Although he had not studied arithmetic beyond a weekly lesson, which he had always contrived to shirk, he now soon conquered the mysteries of figures. At this last school, he made rapid progress in the classics and in the love of letters. 4. Friends and Associates At school with his brother, Bulwer, aged 9 to 11, did not make a single friendship. Later, he formed friendships with both schoolfellows and tutors. Among the latter, the able teacher, Mr. Wellington, took a real interest in him and appreciated his unusual gifts. C. 2. 6. 5. Reading Bulwer's mother recited Homer, Goldsmith and Gray to her son when he was seven, and he marvelled and mimicked. When he was eight, he had access for a time to the library of his deceased grandfather, Lytton. 
Here he read all of the books in English, whether he could understand them or not. Been especially interested in a work on calculation, accompanied and illustrated by a little wooden machine with round balls. Amadeus of Gaul, in Southerly's translation, made it a deep impression, as did also Spencer's Fairy Queen, although he could not appreciate the poetry of it, and much of its wording bewildered him. At school, Bulwer's early taste for English literature began to reappear. Now for the first time, he read Scott and Byron, admiring the former, but not the latter. Before he was fourteen, he had read all the most popular English authors, had a good knowledge of English history and the progress of English literature. He knew by heart the greater part of the poems of Byron, Moore, Southey, Scott and Campbell, those of the two latter being his favourites. After he left school, aged fifteen, he devoured the contents of three circulating libraries, while still searching for a tutor. At sixteen and seventeen, he read every book he could lay his hands upon. 6. Production and Achievement Bulwer's first poetic attempt at seven was in praise of King Henry V and Aconcourt. The same year he composed some verses addressed to a young lady with whom he was in love. Encouraged by the praise of his lady's mother, he began to improvise ballads for the entertainment of the maids. A letter written at fifteen and a half reports an ode written on a poker, in imitation of Milton's La Allegro. Between fourteen and sixteen, Bulwer wrote a considerable volume of verse, which his tutor persuaded the boy's mother to publish. The tutor wrote to Mr. Bulwer that all who had seen the verses agreed that they were extraordinary productions for so young a mind, and that they were worthy of publication. They displayed talents, rarely observable in an equal degree at such an age, and breathed the language of poetry, with an unusual degree of discretion in the application of it. Scott acknowledged the pleasure he had received from the poems. Dr. Samuel Parr, a friend of Bulwer's grandfather, whom Macaulay called the greatest scholar of his age, wrote to Bulwer after reading his poems attentively. When I think of your youth, my delight is mingled with astonishment at your intellectual powers. There are many vestiges of your reading in classical authors, but you have taken a wider range that is generally taken by young men, and there is a secret charm pervading all your writings which I trace not only to your discernment but also to your sensibility. Verses which Bulwer wrote at sixteen upon the death of his first love show no remarkable feeling, but they do give evidence of considerable skill with rhyme and meter. 7. Evidences of Precocity Bulwer early attracted the attention of so eminent a person as Lady Caroline Lamb, with some verses on an incident in which she figured. Even in his infancy, Bulwer was thought a prodigy of by the maids, and in his hearing they prophesied his brilliant future. Bulwer himself states that he could never remember a time when he did not have a calm and intimate persuasion that some day he would be somebody or do something. When he was eight years old, after reading some metaphysics, he inquired of his mother, Pray, Mama, are you not sometimes overcome by the sense of your identity? It was this remark that determined his mother to place him in school. See also 2, 3, 5, and 6. AIIQ 140, Will of Kosher Data 0.75. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Bulwer's mother decided that her son should go to Cambridge, and she accordingly arranged for him to have preparatory coaching in mathematics, a subject, however, which the young poet disliked intensely. In consequence of the distasteful requirement, the boy suffered from a severe attack of melancholy. At Cambridge, after a first period of dejection, he plunged into gay life. He had many mild love affairs, but intellectually he was not inactive. At twenty, he published Dillmouse and other poems, and entered into debates on political subjects. At twenty-two, he won a gold medal for a poem on sculpture. Still, Bulwer was not distinguished academically, for since his chief interest lay in political economy and history, he admitted the mathematical studies required for an honours degree. After leaving Cambridge, Bulwer spent some time in Paris, where he wrote some poems, again experienced melancholy, and again indulged in love affairs. On his return to London at 23, he published his first romance, Falkland, and in the following year, O'Neill, a long poem. Shortly afterward, he married against his mother's wishes, and in consequence was disinherited. He then turned to writing for the periodical press. When he was 25, Pelham, commenced at 22, was published. It attained enormous popularity and was shortly translated into four European languages. 
Bowers' literary reputation was established. AIIQ 145, relative cost of data 0.75. Pedro Calderon's De la Barca, 1600-1681, a celebrated Spanish dramatist and poet. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing. Calderon's father, who belonged to a good family, was secretary to the treasury board under two successive kings. The mother was descended from a noble Flemish family, long settled in Castile. Both parents were very Christian, discreet persons. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. No specific record found except as contained in 2, 3 and 6. 2. Education. At the age of 9, young Calderon began to be instructed by the Jesuits. Later he went to Salamanca, where he studied until he was 19. 3. School standing and progress. At Salamanca, Calderon studied with distinction the scholastic theology and philosophy then in fashion and the civil and canon law. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement. In his 14th year, the youth wrote a drama, The Chariot of Heaven, not preserved. From that time on, he must have continued to produce dramas. 7. Evidences of Precocity Calderon's sister stated that she had heard her parents say many times that the future poet had cried aloud three times before he was born. AIIQ 140, relative coast of data, 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. When, at 19, Calderon graduated from the University of Salamanca, he is already known as a writer for the theatre. His reputation appears to have preceded him to Madrid, so that he was noticed on his arrival there by those who could promote his success. At 20, he was praised by Lope de Viga for a sonnet submitted in a contest opened by the city of Madrid. At 22, he won a third prize in a still more important contest. Again, he was complimented by Lope, who inserted in a volume containing an account of the contest and the festival it celebrated, a verse of Calderon addressed to the older poet. The next 10 years were spent largely in war service in the Milanese and in Flanders. At 35, on the death of Lope, Calderon was left indisputably preeminent among the poets of Spain. AII IQ 140. Relative quotient of data 0.43. Augustin Pyramus de Kendall. 1778 to 1841. A celebrated Swiss botanist, professor at the Academy of Montpellier and at Geneva, and the principal founder of the natural system of botany. AII IQ 140. AII IQ 150. 1. Family standing. Candol was descended on his father's side from an ancient provincial family of which one member, on embracing the reformed religion at the close of the 16th century, had been obliged to take refuge in Geneva. This man and his descendants, including the botanist's father, attained eminence in the service of the Swiss cantons. Augustine's father rose at a very early age to the rank of fourth syndic, the highest office of the republic. His mother was of good family, her grand-uncle, having been the celebrated Genevese Lafort, who stood high in the service of Peter the Great. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. In his early youth, Candor was more interested in literature, and particularly in poetry and the drama, than in the scientific studies which afterward claimed his attention. 2. Education. From the first he showed great aptitude for study and distinguished himself by his rapid attainments in classical and general literature. When at 16 he began his scientific studies at the College of Geneva, the teaching of Vaucher inspired him to make botanical science the chief pursuit of his life. 3. School standing on progress. From his infancy and until he was 15 or 16, Gondel had very delicate health. Restricted to a sedentary life, as a consequence of this, his interest in study developed rapidly, although serious illness more than once interfered with regular school progress. When in 1792 the French army threatened Geneva, Candol was sent to a village near Lake Nocadal, where the charms of nature first touched and captivated him, and where he developed a lively interest in botany. 4. Friends and associates, no specific record. 5. Reading, no specific record, but C2, 1. 6. Production achievement. Candol was distinguished in his boyhood chiefly for his facility in writing elegant verse. The masters and scholars at his school stood always between the chances of an epistle or an epigram, according to the humour of the moment. When at the age of 14 his interest in botany was first aroused, see 2-4, being without books, 
he classified his collection of plants according to a system which he evolved for himself. 7. Evidences of Precocity At the age of six or seven, Candolle exercised himself in the composition of comedies, and when at this period the celebrated Florian was introduced to him as a writer of charming theatrical pieces, the lad gravely responded, Ah, you write comedies. Well, so do I. AI IQ 140, relative coast of data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. In 1796, young Cadol, aged 18, accompanied three friends on a visit to Paris, where he met some of the foremost scientists of the day. Among these, de Saussure increased his interest in botany, especially plant physiology. In 19 and 20, Augustine occupied himself with researches, including those on the generation of leguminous grains, the vegetation of the mistletoe, and the movement of sap in plants. As a result of this work, he was admitted to the Physical and Natural History Society of Geneva. At about this period, he met the French mineralogist Dolomieu, who, struck by the young naturalist's ardour for study, offered him his patronage. Returning to Paris, Candolle turned to the study of medicine, but a little later, not being able to bear the idea of taking on himself the responsibility of human suffering, he plunged again into botany. With his 21st year came his first published work, Histoire des plants grasses, and its appearance was followed by a trip to Holland, where Candolle studied politics, commerce, and education. At 22, he conceived the idea of investigating the sleep of plants. This study occupied him for two years, and as a result, he was inscribed as a candidate for the French Academy. At 24, the publication of his Astralgia attracted the attention of Cuvier, with the result that Candolle was chosen as a substitute of the great botanist at the Collège de France. In the following year, Lamarck confided to the young botanist the revision of his Fleur Francaise, which, in the hands of Candolle, became a new work. AII IQ 150, relative coach data 0.60. Thomas Carlyle, 1795 to 1881, a celebrated Scottish essayist and historian. AI IQ 140, AI IQ 155. 1. Family Standing. Although Carlyle's paternal forebearers include some persons privileged to bear a coat of arms, his paternal grandfather was a simple carpenter, honest but not industrious. This craftsman's five sons were the five fighting maçons, one of whom, Thomas Carlyle's father, was stern and rugged, a man who could not tolerate anything fictitious, although he was fond of reading. He had little patience with theology, yet, had he enjoyed a better education, he would probably have become a minister. It is characteristic of Carlyle's mother, a simple, loving soul, pious and anxious, that while her son was at college, she learned writing so as to be able to correspond with him. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Carlyle's early interests, as far as recorded, were intellectual. The literatures of all cultured lands are said to have attracted him irresistibly, and at college, mathematics was a favourite pursuit. The youth tried to prepare himself for the ministry, but... At first, he could not honestly feel any enthusiasm for it, and later, aged 14 to 18, was assailed by grave doubts about it. 2. Education At five, Carlyle was sent to the village school, but before this, and too early for distinct remembrance, his mother had taught him to read, and a little later his father had given him a clear idea of simple arithmetic. In the most important phase of his home instruction, moral training, Carlyle had learned to emphasise work as the one important duty of man. At seven, the boy began the study of Latin with the village schoolmaster. But as the latter was almost completely ignorant of the language he was teaching, young Carlyle passed from him to the instruction of the pastor's son. When Thomas was nine and a half, it was decided to send him to the grammar school and thence, if he prospered, to the university to prepare for the ministry. It is evidence of his school's success that at thirteen and a half he was sent on to attend the University of Edinburgh. 3. School study and Progress At the age of seven, Carlyle was examined by the minister, who reported him complete in English, and added that he must go to Latin or waste his time. Accordingly, Thomas entered upon the study of Latin, but the instruction of his ignorant schoolmaster completely bewildered him until he was pulled afloat by the minister's son thereafter making rapid progress. At the grammar school, Carlyle, aged nine and a half to thirteen and a half, learned to read French and Latin readily, but he acquired only the barest rudiments of Greek and Latin grammar, 
mathematics, and the outlines of geography. As the reports from his teachers were all favourable, the elder Carlyle decided to send his boy on to the university. Carlyle says he learned but little at Edinburgh, aged 14 to 18. Indeed, in the classics and in philosophy, he made practically no headway, although in mathematics he made a rapid advance. The eminent professor Leslie, discovering his pupil's talent, exerted himself to help him, and it was perhaps because Leslie was the ablest of his teachers that geometry shone before him as the noblest of all sciences. In spite of the efforts of certain of his instructors, it seemed to Carlyle that the university presented a picture of the blind leading the blind. Carlyle's shyness usually prevented him from distinguishing himself. Once he tried for a prize, but although he was already noted for powers of effective speech and notably superior to all his competitors, the noise of the classroom prevented his success. 4. Friends and Associates As a child, Thomas Carlyle had a preference for grown-ups. He was a still infant, mixing little with child companions. At the age of nine and a half, while attending school in another town, he was teased and abused until, forgetting his mother's injunction not to fight, he left a sufficiently deep mark upon his assailant to ensure his own future freedom from molestation. He had won himself a place, and one or two boys became his comrades. At the University of Carlisle's friends were a select few from his own rank of life, serious thoughtful lads in whose circle he held the first place. He did not join the speculative society, of which it was said that every clever student in those days was a member. 5. Reading Little Thomas read Roderick Random when he was nine and a half. The next specific record of his reading states that he read more books in the university library than were even known to the keeper. On his own strength, he learned to read fluently in almost all cultivated languages. 6. Production and Achievement, C23. 7. Evidences of Precocity. It was reported that Carlyle had not spoken a word until, at the age of 11 months, hearing a child cry, he amazed the household by asking, What ails we, Jock? Carlyle's earliest recollections antedated his third birthday. See also 2 3. AIIQ 140. Relative coast of data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 and 26. At 18, Carlyle left the university without a degree. Enrolled as a student of divinity in absentia, he was soon afterward appointed mathematical master at Annan Academy. Although a capable teacher, he disliked his task and kept aloof from people finding relief in reading poetry and studying mathematics. At this time, he was considering a career of letters, and he mentioned the hope of ultimate literary fame. After two years at Annan, Carlyle moved to a school at Kirkcaldy, and here he came in contact with Edward Irving. Irving allowed Carlyle the use of his library, and the young man read history, Gibbon at the rate of one volume a day, and the French classics voraciously. Two years later, Madame de Stella's book on Germany sent Carlyle, aged 22, to the literature of that country, with a resulting enlargement of his horizon. At 22, Carlyle gave up school teaching and moved to Edinburgh, where he supported himself by giving lessons and translating pamphlets from the French. He suffered bad health at this time. During his 24th to 25th years, he studied law, but with little taste or zeal. It was at this period that he was commissioned to write 16 articles for the Edinburgh Encyclopedia. At 24, Carlyle seems to have turned entirely from the law. He was working hard at German literature and translating the German classics. The work extending his knowledge and provided a passport to the publishers. During the summer, Irving and Carlyle were much together, and... Later, the young man spent several months at Irving's home in order to devote himself to literary work. Here at 25, he met Miss Welsh, who afterward became his wife. He immediately began a correspondence with her, and the interest aroused dispersed his ill health. Sometime before his 26th birthday, Carlyle went through a spiritual experience that convinced him of the invisibility of his soul. He writes, It is from this hour I am inclined to date my spiritual new birth. AIIIQ 155, Will of Coast of Data 0.75. Alexandre Dumas, Pere, aged 1802 to 1870, a noted French dramatic author and novelist. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing. 
Tomas's paternal grandfather, the Marquis de la Pelletere, came from an ancient Norman family and held various positions at court. He left Versailles to live in San Domingo, and there his son was born of a native woman, Mary Dumas. Because of his Negro blood, this son was not accepted in Paris society, and so he enlisted in the Queen's Dragoons, under the name of Alexander Dumas. In two years, he rose from private to general. In character, he was ardent and generous, quick to resent and to forgive, a patriot devoted to the revolution but detesting its cruelties, a man of single purpose and brave deeds. He married the daughter of a hotel proprietor, and the distinguished child of this marriage was Alexander Dumas Pere, the famous novelist and dramatist. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Young Dumas's early interests were chiefly athletic. He was skillful in throwing stones, shooting arrows, and riding horseback. At ten, he was beginning the use of arms with enthusiasm, and was becoming a very good sportsman. When Madame Dumas received a license from the government to sell tobacco, local opinion stigmatized her as a Bonapartist, and her twelve-year-old son received many a black eye in his vigorous attempts to rebuke this calumny. Of his spiritual development, it is recorded that his first communion, at the age of thirteen, filled him with deep emotion, and that daily walks to the cemetery, solemn moments at his father's grave, and the sight of fresh graves, added year by year, made a lasting impression. 2. Education Upon the death of the father, Dumas's mother went with her two children to live with her parents. In his grandparents' home, when he was four, young Dumas learned to read, through a curiosity to discover the history, customs and instincts of the animals whose pictures he saw in Buffon's natural history. The same year he was taught to write by his sister. When the boy was ten, it was decided to send him, although much against his own desire, to the seminary at Soissons to become a priest. He had yielded to his mother's wishes, but the jibes of a young lady cousin on the eve of his departure were more than he could bear, and he ran away for a few days. Pardoned by his mother for his failure in obedience, he was allowed to remain at home, and was placed under the kind Abbe Guzoire for instruction. Thus at twelve, he was enjoying a light course of instruction, a few lessons a week in Virgil and Tacitus from the priest, in addition to those in writing and arithmetic from the village schoolmaster. At fifteen, he was apprenticed to the local notary. 3. School Standing and Progress from seven to ten, Dumas took lessons on the violin, but at the end of that time, the professor declared that teaching him music was a hopeless task. Much more attractive to the boy was his lessons in the use of arms, begun when he was ten. In translating Virgil and Tacitus, he used a crib, but he voluntarily committed to memory three or four hundred lines of the Aeneid. He had not taste for arithmetic, but he developed a very neat and rapid handwriting. Convinced of his own ignorance by contact with the intelligent Adolphe de Louvain, Dumas at sixteen began lessons in Italian and German. The latter language never became more than a readable one to him, but Italian grew to be almost a second mother tongue. 4. Friends and Associates When he was about ten, Dumas was not generally liked by the other children, for he was vain, insolent, full of self-confidence and self-admiration. He cried very easily, and for this the boys teased him. At thirteen or fourteen, he was much influenced by a fashionable young man, Auguste Lafarge, from Paris, who visited the town and spent his money in a lordly manner. Lafarge circulated some verses of his own composition, which were much talked of locally, and which first suggested to Dumas the idea of fame. At fifteen, the youth had his first love affair. The following year, his friendship began with Adolphe de Louvain, son of a Swedish nobleman, and a young man of literary ambitions. 5. Reading at the age of four, Dumas could be kept quiet for a whole evening by an illustrated edition of Buffon's Natural History. His passion for reading led him at an early age to the newspapers, Robinson Crusoe, the Bible, Duden, and the Idomeneus, and several books of mythology. At twelve, Virgil fascinated him by the lulling cadence of his verse, his subtle readings of the human heart, and his intuitions of eternal truth. 6. Production and Achievement no record before 17. 7. Evidences of Precocity 
Dumas's first recollections were of a visit to Paris when he was just three, upon which occasion he was taken to see the widow of Louis Philippe de Orleans and was present to Brun and Morat. He remembered the gold piece given him on the first visit and the game he played with Brun's sword and Morat's cocked hat. Taken to call upon Pauline Bonaparte a few months later, it was a contrast between the swarthy skin of his father and the fair skin of the Corsican that impressed him. Just after the death of his father and before he was four, the inconsolable child was told that God had taken his father to heaven. Soon afterward he was found climbing up the stairs, carrying a gun. He explained that he was going to heaven to kill God, who had killed his father. And five or six young Dumas read so well that he was filled with complacency and used to join in the conversations of his elders, dragging in the information and ideas he had acquired from his reading. One morning the guests at breakfast asked the news of the day, but no one had seen the morning paper except Alexandra, aged seven, who thereupon reported, Oh, there is nothing of any importance in it, only a meeting of the legislature. AIIQ 140, relative quotient of data point six zero. 3. Development from 17 to 26. The first dramatic work that made any impression on Dumas was Hamlet, which he saw performed by Ducis in Sirsons. This so filled him with vague longings that he devoted three days to learning the part of Hamlet, neglected, meanwhile, his legal duties. Adolphe de Louvain, who had come under the influence of the drama in Paris, returned to seek Dumas's paternorship. Together they constructed a patriotic Vanderville, Le Maire de Strasbourg, and other dramas, dreaming of an open path to fame, but none of these works was accepted. After a few months as a clerk to a notary at Crepe, Dumas, at twenty-one, encouraged by a prophetic interview with the actor Toma, went to Paris with but fifty francs in his pocket to seek his fortune. His excellent penmanship secured him a government post as clerk. His immediate superior was a sympathetic literary gentleman who advised Dumas what to read, suggesting particularly Shakespeare, Goethe, Byron, Fenimore, Cooper, and for Dumas, most fruitful of all, Scott and Schiller. The friendship of the de Louvains gave the youth a certain amount of social intercourse. At twenty-two, the year that Alexander Dumas Fils was born, the young father became something of a dandy. It was during this year that in his first duel he vanquished his opponent with a sword. La Chasse et la Mort, written with two partners, was his first play to be produced. With his share of the profits, Dumas published a thousand copies of three novelettes, but he sold only four. When he was twenty-three, many of his verses appeared in print, but Dumas cared nothing for them except as a natural outlet for his emotions. The drama was his serious purpose. Another like play, La Noce et l'Intermet, was performed the next year. The author was inspired to renewed efforts by the visit to Paris of an English company with a Shakespearean repertoire. The result was Christine, which was accepted, but his production was postponed, and later the play was rewritten. Meanwhile, Dumas wrote, Henry III, S. Secour, produced when he was 26. Its success was immediate, and the name of Alexandre Dumas was on everyone's lips. AIIIQ 150, relative coach to data point six zero. William Hamilton, 1788 to 1856, a Scottish philosopher. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 160. 1. Family Sterning. The Hamiltons were an ancient family, the first of the line having been slain at Flodden. Subsequent members included military men, a minister, and a professor of divinity. William Hamilton's grandfather and father had successfully held the chair of anatomy and botany at the University of Glasgow. His mother was also a member of an ancient family. Although without any considerable early education, she was a fine character, well-read, and of a cultivated mind. Anxiously solicitous for the welfare of her children, she desired to give them every advantage that lay in her power. William's attachment for her was deep and lasting. 2. Development to 17. 1. Interests. As a child, Hamilton enjoyed and excelled in feats of physical strength. He had read deeply, been attracted to the romantic and weird. Tenderhearted, he acted as a protector of the weak. 2. Education. William's father died when his eldest son was scarcely two, and the burden of the boy's education accordingly fell on his mother. After his earliest childhood, William attended the Glasgow Public School, and in addition received the instruction of a private tutor. 
At night he entered the grammar school and progressed so rapidly that at twelve he was attending junior Latin and Greek classes at the university. In the following year, he and his younger brother were sent to school in England, where they remained for two years. On their return, William, aged fifteen, re-entered the university and attended the senior classes in classics and in logic and moral philosophy. A year later, medicine, chemistry and mathematics were included in his course of study. 3. School Studying and Progress Although a private tutor remarked that William, aged 16, was inclined to be idle, he distinguished himself at the university by carrying off the highest honour which was awarded by vote of the class. 4. Friends and Associates A constant associate of his youth was his younger brother Thomas, who after retirement from a career in the army became a writer. 5. Reading As a child, William delighted in Pilgrim's Progress and the Apocalypse. At later date, he still preferred highly coloured romance and enjoyed the Arabian Nights, Mrs. Radcliffe's novels, and Frankenstein. At the age of 15, in a letter to his mother, he mentioned certain books on his desk, and at 16, he started to collect a library. His choice of reading including philosophy, classics, the Encyclopedia Britannica, and works on medicine, chemistry, botany, history, and heraldry. 6. Production and Achievement. No specific record. 7. Evidences of Precocity. It is reported that William's mother early discerned in him indications of those qualities of mind which became afterward so remarkable, but his biographer states that there was apparently no remarkable intellectual precocity about him. AIIQ 140. Relative quotient of data 0.75. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Hamilton continued his study at the University of Glasgow until the age of 19, in conformity with his mother's wish that he receive the best possible training. He entered Balliol College, Oxford, where he remained for four years. His many friends, among them men who later became distinguished, were impressed by his courtesy, kindness and force of intellect. He enjoyed the university life, pursued his studies with zeal and gained a great reputation as a scholar. Aristotle's works he studied with exceptional thoroughness. At 23, he took his examination in arts and letters and passed with the greatest distinction. Lockhart, a university contemporary, says, Taken altogether, his examination for scholarship in science has never been surpassed. Ten years later, the master of Balliol wrote, Hamilton combined a clear and vigorous intellect with ardent and indefatigable zeal. In his public examination, he obtained the highest distinction the examiners could bestow. His Oxford career finished, Hamilton decided on the law as a profession although he had undergone preparation both at Glasgow and at Oxford for medicine. For the next three years, aged 23 to 26, he studied law at London with occasional visits to Oxford. AIIIQ 160, relative coast of data, 0.82. Thomas Hobbes, 1588 to 1679, a celebrated English philosopher. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 135. 1. Family standing. Hobbes' father, a vicar, is described as a good fellow and a choleric man, of no pretense to learning and setting no store by it. He fled from his parish because of a fight with another person. The mother was descended from a family of yeomen. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. When a boy, Thomas was placed enough, but he had a contemplative melancholiness. However, he would get him into a corner and learn his lesson by heart. In short order, during his college period, aged 14 to 20, he did not much care for logic, yet he learned it and thought himself a good disputant. He delighted in frequenting bookbinders or stationer shops to pore over maps. He tracked the sun and traced the voyages of Drake and Cavendish and the circumnavigators. Regarding other than intellectual interests, it is reported that he rose very early in the morning to bait and snare Jack Dawes. 2. Education From the age of 14 until he was 8, Hobbes attended school at a Westport church. Next, he went to school in Malmesbury to the minister, and then to a private school kept by a good Greek scholar. At fourteen and three-fourths, he was entered at Magdalen Hall, Oxford. 3. School study and progress. At six, Hobbes was learning Latin and Greek. By the age of eight, he could read well and number four figures. When he was between eight and fourteen, his teacher, Mr. Latimer, a young man of nineteen or twenty, delighted in his company and used to instruct him and two or three ingenious youths more in the evening till nine o'clock. On entering Oxford, Thomas followed the lectures in logic but threw aside the Oxford doctrine 
to prove things in a way of his own. He found the physics of his day unreasonable and incomprehensible. 4. Friends and Associates No information was found except with regard to his teacher, Mr. Latimer, C23. 5. Reading, C23. 6. Production and Achievement Before the age of 14 and 3 fourths, Hobbes had translated the media of Euripides into Latin iambics. See also 2 3. 7. Evidences of precocity. See 2 3 and 6. AIIQ 140. Relative coast of data. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Hopes took his BA degree just before he was 20. He was then recommended by the principal of Magdalen Hall as a tutor to young Cavendish, whom he accompanied for several years, travelling with him through France, Germany, and Italy. After returning to England, probably before the age of 25, he again devoted his attention to the study of the classics. AIIIQ 135, relevant quotient of data, 0.43. End of section 24. Section 24 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 2. The Early Mental Traits of 300 Geniuses by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 18, Part 2. Alexander von Humboldt, 1769 to 1859. A German naturalist and traveller. AIIQ 140. AIIIQ 170. 1. Family standing. Humboldt's ancestors belonged to the upper middle class, and several of them had held responsible civil or military positions. The father, an able soldier and statesman, advisor to the Prince of Prussia, had been mentioned as a possible minister of the future king, but his death occurred before the prince's accession to the throne. The mother belonged to an ancient and noble family of Huguenot stock. She was highly educated and remarkably gifted. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Humboldt early developed a taste for natural history. Flowers and plants, butterflies and beetles, shells and stones were his favourite playthings. The collecting, arranging and labelling of these treasures was carried on with so much zeal that he required the name in jest of Little Apothecary. The years of solitude on the family estate of Tigal did not make the boy happy, but they did contribute to the development of a strong love for nature and the study of nature. Humboldt reports that until he reached the age of sixteen, he showed little inclination for scientific pursuits. He was restless, desired to travel, and wanted to become a sailor. His family desired that he study finance and prepare for government service. At sixteen, he was described by Henrietta Herz, the most beautiful and gifted woman of Berlin, as vivacious and intelligent and of distinguished manners, possessed of extensive information, and in every way estimable. He had at this age begun to exhibit some gallantry and to develop talents in drawing and dancing. 2. Education According to family tradition, Humboldt learned to read and write at four years of age from his tutor, Koblenk, later first preacher of the Lusenkirche Berlin. From the age of four to six, Humboldt was instructed by his first tutor, and from six to eight by Klusiner, afterward private secretary of the Princess Ferdinand. From his ninth to his nineteenth year, with his older brother, he received instruction from a number of distinguished professors and lecturers. The tutor cometh, later privy counsellor and enlightened philanthropist, supervised a general course of study, which included Latin, mathematics, philosophy, political science, philanthropy, modern languages, art, drawing, and the study of maps and books of travel. Among the special instructors secured by their tutor were Professor Fisher, a distinguished teacher of mathematics and the author of standard textbooks. Loffler, later professor at the University of Frankfurt on the Order, also an author, and the distinguished physician and writer, him, who instructed the boys in botany when Alexander was 11 years old. The boys attended lectures by distinguished professors and scholars in Berlin and were instructed in Hebrew by their brilliant Jewish friends. 3. School Study and Progress Humboldt did not attend any regular school until he entered the university at 18. 4. Friends and Associates In his childhood, Alexander's inseparable companion was his elder brother, Wilhelm. 
Both youths had the opportunity of meeting members of the court and persons of note who visited in their father's home. Alexander's tutors and his professors were men of wide intellectual interests and unusual distinction. When Alexander was sixteen, the brothers were admitted into the circle of intellectual Jews, among them the Hers, Viet, Beer, and Mendelssohn families, brilliant members of Berlin's intellectual society. 5. Reading The study of maps and the perusal of books of travel exercised over young Alexander a secret fascination which was at times almost irresistible. The narrative of Balboa's expedition and pictures of palms and cedars in the illustrated Bible filled him with a desire to travel. 6. Production and achievement. No specific record. 6. Evidences of precocity. As a child, Humboldt was not considered extraordinary in intelligence. For owing to the weakness of his physical constitution, he could master his daily tasks only by dint of extraordinary effort. He and his brother Wilhelm, two years his senior, were instructed together, and the younger, frailer boy did not appear the equal of his older, more robust brother. Besides Alexander's compelling interests, were in a field little appreciated by the associates of his childhood. AIIQ 140, relative quotient of data, 0.75. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Humboldt's mother early decided that her son should enter the service of the state. For this reason, political economy and mathematics became normally the principal subjects of his course. The thirst for scientific knowledge took him, after short stays at the universities of Frankfurt and Berlin, to Gottingen, then at the height of its scientific glory. Young Humboldt judged a university entirely by the facilities offered in the sciences. At 18, Alexander commenced to study botany at Berlin, and the next year translated a Latin botanical work into French, supplying valuable footnotes. When he left for Gottingen, he carried with him an eulogistic letter of introduction from Professor Fischer, the eminent mathematician. In addition to his economics and botany, Humboldt studied archaeology and philology, and published a pamphlet on the looms of the Romans. At 20, he toured the Rhine country with a Dutch botanist, and a year later published observations on some basalts of the Rhine. He was self-taught in geology and mineralogy. About this time Humboldt met Forster, a man many years his senior, the son-in-law of the Gothingen Professor of Classics and Archaeology, a man of culture, well-travelled, and possessed of immense intellectual versatility. With this man, who was at once a friend and a leader, Humboldt carried out a tour of the Rhineland and of England. At twenty-two and a half, after eight months of preparation at Friedberg, Humboldt was appointed accessor of mines for Westphalia. He showed wonderful power in his rapid comprehension of his profession. During his service, he published numerous papers on botany, physics and chemistry. He held in fairly rapid succession appointments of increasing importance in Franconia and at Berlin. He was remarkably effective as a mine official. In one instance, he increased the output of the mines fourteenfold in a few months. Moreover, he did not neglect the welfare of the miners. Of every aspect of his profession, historical, scientific, economic or social, he showed an amazing command. At 23, he was awarded an honorary doctor's degree by the University of Breslau for his distinguished services to science. In the course of his professional tours of inspection at home and abroad, Humboldt made observations of scientific interest. He experimented in chemistry and physiology and worked artlessly at the Flora Freibergensis. For this latter work, published when its author was 24, Humboldt received a gold medal from the Elector of Saxony. At 25, the young scientist was admitted to the intimacy of the famous Weimar Coterie and invited to contribute to Schiller's Horen. During his four-year period of service in the Department of Mines, from the age of 22 to 26, Humboldt fulfilled his duties with conspicuous ability. He was entrusted with important diplomatic missions, which he fulfilled brilliantly, and at 26 he had risen to the highest point of his department. AII IQ 170, relative quotient of data, 0.75. Johann Kepler, 1571-1630, a celebrated German astronomer, one of the chief founders of modern astronomy. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 160. 1. Family Standing The Kepler family, although originally noble and respected, had greatly deteriorated before the astronomer's birth. Johann's grandfather, an ardent Protestant, 
was a burgomaster and director of guarantees, and his grandmother came from a family of wealth and influence. But his father, a man of unstable and uncontrolled character, intermittently engaged as soldier, innkeeper, and at one time justice of the peace, led a roving and unsettled life. The mother, daughter of a burgomaster, was a proud, cold, unsympathetic, undomestic woman, who lived on the most precarious terms with the members of her family and her acquaintances. She is said to have petted her two worthless sons and to have discriminated against Johan. She had learned the art of healing by herbs and potions, and because of her practices she was later accused of witchcraft. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Young Kepler loved gaming, but because he was afraid of losing, he gambled only with himself. He was mystically religious and superstitious, and when he felt convicted of sin, he punished himself for his misdeeds. In his disputations with his schoolfellows, he showed a bent towards imaginative and paradoxical topics. At fourteen, he was already deeply interested in theological questions. 2. Education Kepler's education was much interfered with, especially in the earlier years, by his duties as a potboy in his father's tavern, by his strenuous labours on the farm, and by his delicate health. Before he was four, he almost died of smallpox. Recurring headaches and frequent weakening fevers lowered his vitality, and although from the age of seven to eleven his schoolwork was frequently interrupted, he was able to pass the Stuttgart Regional Examination in his twelfth year. Then for over a year he remained at home engaged in manual service. At twelve he entered the Protestant monastic school at Adelberg, and remained there under the instruction of excellent teachers until he was fifteen. The course of study included Latin, Greek, rhetoric, dialectic, music, which he had begun to study at eight, and the New Testament in a Latin version. Leaving Adelberg, Kepler was promoted to Molbronn, a school preparatory to the University of Tübingen, and at that time directed by Schopp, a distinguished historical student and a man of determined character and high moral ideals. Here Kepler continued his earlier studies, reading Cicero, Virgil, and Demosthenes, and adding the study of geometry and arithmetic. When nearly seventeen, the youth was examined at Tübingen, received the bachelor's degree, and returned to Malbronn for his last year. 3. School Standing and Progress In the elementary schools, the teachers praised Kepler for his fortunate gifts, although he was very ill-mannered. At Adelberg, he attained to remarkable proficiency in the use of Latin. He wrote poems in the form of riddles and acrostics, and later composed Pindaric codes on such subjects as the origin of rivers and Atlas's view of the clouds. In disputations, he discussed such subjects as the literary studies of Germany as an evidence of her decadence. Kepler passed the final examination with distinction, although at the time he was terribly visited with eruptions on his hands and legs. At Molborn, the theology teacher hated him because the boy wanted to convert him, the teacher openly, and the other pupils envied and disliked the gifted youth for his natural ability and brilliant achievements. 4. Friends and Associates at Adelberg, Johann incurred the enmity of a number of his comrades by reporting their misdemeanors, although this was in accordance with school regulations. As a result, the boys made life miserable for him. At Molbronn, also, his fellow students envied and hated him because he surpassed them, and since the younger boys were not allowed to associate with the older ones, Kepler was prevented from seeking his mental equals in classes above his own. 5. Reading before he was fourteen, Kepler applied to Dubingen for a copy of Luther's Disputations of Predestination, apparently for his own study. 6. Production and Achievement, C23. 7. Evidences of Precocity, no further record. AIIQ 140, Relative Data 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Kepler entered the University of Tübingen at 18 when he was freed from material cares by the award of a special stipend. A number of his instructors were men of real distinction, among them Mostlin, professor of mathematics, with whom he formed a lasting and inspiring friendship and who taught him the Copernican system. So far Kepler had shown no special liking for astronomy, but chose rather the theological course and attended lectures in the arts and sciences preparatory to the master's degree. His grades in these subjects, in the three years' reports extent, are all capital A's and underscore A's, 
and this excellent record created jealousy between him and his fellow students. In 19, Kepler took the master's examination and won second place, whereupon he turned to the study of theology. Kepler's interpretation on Protestantism was far too liberal and rational to satisfy the theological faculty. However, Professor Heffenrefer, himself a clever man, recognized the young man's ability, especially in mathematics. At 22, Kepler reluctantly accepted the astronomical lectureship at Graz and set to work earnestly to master his subject. One of his duties was to prepare an annual almanac, which should contain predictions of the weather and of remarkable events. As a consequence, he acquired a considerable popular reputation as a weather prophet and astrologer. At 24, he published a book which showed much astronomical knowledge and very great ingenuity. The next year, he married, but without improving his financial circumstances. Soon after, because of the religious wars, he withdrew into Hungary, and there wrote several astronomical tracts addressed to his friends. AIIIQ 160, relative coast data, 0.75. John Law of Lauriston, 1671-1729, a celebrated Scottish financier and projector of commercial schemes. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing On his father's side, Law was descended from a family which held a position of considerable social rank and influence in Edinburgh. His great-great-grandfather was Archbishop of Glasgow. His father, William Law, a goldsmith carrying on business in the capital, profession more clearly allied to that of banking, as now understood, was so successful that he was able to purchase a great estate. The mother, Jane Campbell, probably related to the ducal house of Argyll, appears to have been a very superior woman, and especially keen in financial management. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. As an age, 13+, plus, when the majority of children have merely mastered the preliminary stages of a branch of knowledge presenting so many difficulties, Law was able to find the most genuine occupation in solving the most complicated problems in geometry and in comprehending the subtleties of algebraic formulae. At a time also when political economy as a science was undeveloped, Law devoted a considerable portion of his time to inquiring into the basis of national and private credit, and generally, into the intricacies of economic phenomena that presented themselves to his observation. At a period between the ages of 13 and 21, he addicted himself to the practice of all games of chance, skill and dexterity, and was noted as a capital player at tennis. 2. Education In order to put him beyond the possible prejudicial influences of the city, his father sent him, at an early age, to Eagle Show, where he was placed under the care of the Reverend James Hamilton. There he received his early education in a school established by the first Presbyterian minister ordained after the liberty. After the death of his father, when John was thirteen, his mother successfully managed the education of her children. 3. School standing and progress, no record. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, C22. 7. Evidences of precocity, C22. AIIQ 140, relative coefficient of data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. With an independent competence, Law, at the age of 21, felt free to show himself in society. He went to London, visited pleasure resorts, lived a dissipated life, and contracted heavy debts which his mother was obliged to pay off. At the age of 23, he quarrelled with a rival over a lady and killed his opponent in a duel. He was condemned to death, pardoned, and again condemned and finally escaped to the continent shortly before the date of his execution. At the French court, he, aged 24, met the unhappy wife of the Earl of Banbury, who liked him so well as to pack up her owls and run away with him to Italy. They were faithful to one another and happy together. Lord did not secure employment at the French court, as he had hoped. Instead, he resumed his old career of gambling, and at the same time studied banking, credit, and financial problems of all kinds. AIIIQ 140, relative quotient of data 0.43. Mitchell Aquim de Montaigne, 1533-1592, a celebrated French essayist. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family standing. Montaigne's grandfather, a well-to-do fish and wine merchant, gave his sons the education of young gentlemen. 
Pierre, the father of Michael, mastered Spanish and German, and at seventeen won a name for some Latin verses he had published. After his marriage he became a wine seller, but his interest in letters remained, and his chateau was always open to men of learning. It was characteristic of his democratic spirit that he chose poor peasants for his son's good parents. The mother was a Protestant of Jewish blood. Her forefathers came from Spain. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Montaigne says of himself that he was lazy and languorous, although in good health. The danger was not that I should do wrong, but that I should do nothing, he wrote. He robbed himself of all other pleasure in order to read, and he developed a natural capacity for acting and playing with much effect the principal characters in college theatricals, Latin plays. 2. Education The older Montaigne made his son the subject of an original educational experiment carried out in gentle and delicate fashion, free from all rigorous discipline. As a part of his unique method, he had the boy wakened every morning by the sound of music. Before he could speak, Michael was placed under a gentleman well-versed in Latin, and this was the only language used by his parents and the domestics in his presence until he was six. He was taught Greek, although not very successfully, by means of a game. From the age of six to thirteen, he attended the College of Guyenne, at that time the most flourishing in all France, and here he came under the tuition of some of the best scholars of the day. His tutor's judicious blindness permitted him to feed surreptitiously on the books he loved, C26, while he was gaining only a smattering of other subjects. At thirteen he began to study of law. 3. School standing in progress. When at six he entered school, Michael's teachers found him so quick and ready with his childish Latin that they were afraid to accost him. They connived at encouraging his debauched reading and kept only a lax hold upon him in the regular studies. 4. Friends and Associates, no record. 5. Reading. Montaigne's first taste for books came to him at the age of seven or eight, from the pleasure of the fables of Ovid's metamorphosis. Then he passed to the Aeneid of Virgil, then to Terence, Plutus, and the Italian comedies, held on always by the sweetness of the subjects. 6. Production and Achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of Precocity, no further record. AIIQ 140, relative quotient of data, 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the age of 21, Montaigne became a judge at Bordeaux, but he spent much time in Paris in unrestrained self-indulgence. At 24, he made the acquaintance of La Boede, which developed into a most famous friendship. Montaigne was present at the siege of Thionville, and may have served under Marshal Strozzi. AIIQ 140, relative data 0.43. Tom Moore 1779-1852, an Irish poet. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing John Moore, Tom's father, was a grocer who gradually developed into a wine merchant and declined into a barrack master. Of his paternal grandparents, the poet knew nothing. His maternal grandfather, a provision merchant and also a weaver, was always much respected by his fellow townsmen. Tom's mother seems to have been well educated and somewhat above her husband in station. She was a very intelligent woman and a devoted parent, so anxious that her son should attain a high rank in school that she examined him daily in all his studies. Both parents were Catholics. They were fond of social pleasures. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Music was the only art, more said, for which he was born with a real love and its influence is discernible throughout the poet's early years. When about fifteen, he began to learn to play the piano by himself. He liked to make up tunes. He had a taste for singing too, and this talent was frequently called into play to enliven tea parties and suppliers. His poetry seems to have sprung from the deep feelings occasioned by music. In vacations, Tom was fond of arranging theatricals, the role of Harlequin being a favourite with him. He was also very active and took pride in performing successfully such feats as a hit for most leap. By the age of 14, he had become a determined rhymer and enjoyed writing effusions to a Miss Byrne, an old maid, who answered him in verse. He was always interested in politics. 
is recorded that he found confessions irksome and that when he entered college he gained his mother's consent to cease from the distasteful religious exercise two education at a very early age he was sent to a nearby school where as the youngest boy in the school he was a favorite with the master an odd wild fellow he next attended the grammar school of samuel white who had the best academy in dublin and stood at the head of his profession Outside of school, he had lessons in Italian and French. At a very early age, 15 according to Mr. White, Moore entered Trinity College, Dublin, in order to prepare, according to his mother's plan, for the profession of the law. 3. School Standing and Progress By all accounts, Tom was a very quick child. His schoolmaster, Mr. White, used to single him out on days of public examination as one of his most successful and popular exhibitors. In Latin, he soon outstripped the other pupils, and was thus free to advance under the latin usher as fast as his natural talent and application would carry him in reading and recitation he maintained his supremacy in the school to the last he passed his college entrance examinations with distinguished honour to himself as well as to his able and worthy preceptor in the examinations of the first year at college he gained a premium and a certificate in the second year failing to surpass his competitors in the regular course he confined himself to such parts of the course as fell within his own tastes and pursuits. 4. Friends and Associates At Mr. White's school, he formed a long-continued intimacy with young Burston. Only son of a very distinguished barrister, he was very particular about this child's associates. Moore's teachers always took a strong fancy to him. They were invited to the house by his mother and were showered with attentions, so that their influence extended much beyond the classroom. The Latin teacher, Old Donovan, finding Tom's eager for politics, infused an ardent passion for Ireland's liberties. 5. Reading During the holidays preceding his entrance into college, while on a visit with his young friend Burston, Moore read Mrs. Redcliffe's romances while listening to Hayden's music played by his friend's sister. Cicero, Virgil and Demosthenes were among the classical works read at school or college. 6. Production and Achievement because of his natural quickness and talent for recitation, Moore was early made a sort of show child, and before the age of four he could recite some verses on the politics of the day. His first attempts at regular versicles were made when he was ten or eleven on the subject of a popular toy called Quiz. The editor of a monthly publication, who occasionally embellished his magazine with portraits of public characters, expressed a strong wish to have a drawing of young Thomas, then thirteen, engraved for the purpose because he had acquired some little celebrity by his recitations in school and elsewhere. When the boy was fourteen, verses from his pen first appeared in print, and he found himself one of the esteemed contributors to the anthological Hibernica. Thinking it the grandest thing in the world to be at the head of some literary institution, he organised two school friends into a debating and literary society, with himself as president. Each member was required to produce an original enigma, or rebus, in verse for the others to explain. In one of the public examinations at college, Thomas substituted for the required theme in Latin prose some of his own English verses, which were so well thought of that their author received an award from the board. A copy of the Travels of Anarcharists, in a very handsome binding. During his second year at college, Moore wrote a short mask with songs, which was performed. 7. Evidences of Precocity, C26. 3. Development from 17 to 26. In college, Moore competed for a Latin premium, and although he surpassed his nearest competitor by a narrow margin, he refused to complete the examination by writing a theme in Latin hexameter. He had never written a single hexameter and did not wish now to begin bungling them, although it meant the loss of the prize. It was enough for me to have done well what I had attempted and I determined not to attempt anything more. Moore distinguished himself by standing high on the list of those judged worthy of scholarships, a barren honour, as Catholics were excluded from receiving awards of this kind. In the same year, he won a medal of the Historical Society of the University by a burlesque sort of poem, called An Ode Upon Nothing. At twenty-one, his transition of the Odes of Anacreon was published, dedicated to the Prince of Wales, to whom he was presented as a consequence, and by whom he was complimented on his abilities. 
After graduating from the university, Moore entered a middle temple in London, but his legal studies soon lapsed. The interest of his friend, Lord Moira, secured for him a place as registrar of a naval prize court at Bermuda, but the fees were small, and Moore, leaving a deputy, soon departed. He then visited America, where, as a well-known writer, he was met with a flattering reception. AII IQ 140, relative quotient of data 0.75. William Pitt, 1st Earl of Chatham, 1708-1778, a famous English Whig statesman and orator. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing The Pitts, for a century or more, had been mayors, parsons, doctors, or government officials who gradually added to their estates. William's grandfather, a successful trader, married Jane Innes, a great-granddaughter of James V of Scotland. He was a mighty imperious man, unsparingly laborious in pursuit of his aims, full of explosive energy, a shrewd judge of men. His dictatorial character oppressed his son Robert, William's father, who had no success either in business or as a politician. William's mother, Harriet Villiers, was beautiful, intelligent, distinguished and virtuous. She was the daughter of Brigadier Villiers and his wife, Viscountess Granderson a spirited woman, notable in London, and created Viscountess in her own right. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Gout prevented young Pitt from participating in athletic exercises. No record of his interests is preserved other than that in 2. 3. 2. Education. When 10 or 11, William entered Eton, which was at that time intended exclusively by sons of peers and men of family. The education was severely classical in school hours, while spelling, mathematics and geography were taught by inferior masters in half-holidays. In addition to the prescribed groundwork, the boys had individual training under tutors, but remained at Eton until he was 17. 3. School standing and progress. At Eton he started in the lowest form but one, and the normal way went forward almost every half year to the sixth form. His tutor wrote to the father that he never was concerned with a young gentleman of so good abilities at the same time of so good a disposition, and added, There is no question, but he will answer all your hopes. His knowledge of ancient languages and of ancient history remained a permanent possession. The boys looked up to him and to Littleton, his schoolfellow, as prodigies of genius, and the headmaster, too, is said to have recognised Pitt's superior capabilities. 4. Friends and Associates At Eton, William's special friends were Henry Fielding, one and a half years his senior, George Letterton, Hanbury and Pratt, who later held the office of Attorney General in Pitt's first ministry. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and Achievement A letter written just before his 15th birthday gives evidence of solid character and academic ambition. 7. Evidences of precocity, no further record. AIIQ 140, relative coast of data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. For a year, Pitt attended Trinity College, Oxford. Here he studied a good deal with tutors and bought many books. A Latin poem on the death of George I shows that he possessed a knowledge of classical language and rhythm, but no trace of genius. From Oxford, Pitt went to Utrecht, where he probably acquired his knowledge of international law and diplomacy. At 22, the youth, who had always been accustomed to lavish expenditure, found himself in straitened circumstances. He accepted a commission as cornet in Cobham's horse, taking his duties very seriously and reading every military book on which he could lay his hands. At 24, he wrote his Letter on Superstition, published in the London Journal, with the object of reducing to absurdity the whole fabric of religious doctrine and worship. The hypothesis he employed for this purpose was cleverly formulated, before his 26, he spent a year touring France and Switzerland from time to time, writing letters to his sister in French. AII IQ 140, relative kosher data 0 0.60. Joseph Priestley, 1733-1804, an English clergyman and natural philosopher, especially celebrated as the discoverer of oxygen. AII IQ 140, AII IQ 150. 1. Family Standing 
The Priestleys were simple, sober, honest, God-fearing folk, staunch Calvinists and deeply religious. Joseph's immediate ancestors were farmers and clothiers, people of substance in the yeoman class. His father, John Priestley, a weaver and cloth dresser, had a strong sense of religion and uniformly good spirits. His mother, the only child of Joseph Swift, a farmer, was a woman of exemplary pity. She died when her son Joseph was six years old. When he was nine, young Priestley was adopted by his aunt, who was, according to her nephew, as perfect a human character as I have yet been acquainted with. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Joseph's fondness for books had led his aunt to hope he might become a minister, and he readily entered into her views. 2. Education At six the boy was sent to school in the neighbourhood, and later he attended several other schools selected by his aunt. At a large free school conducted by a clergyman, he began at twelve or thirteen to make progress in Latin and the elements of Greek. On holidays he learned Hebrew with a dissenting minister. Later he attended a school opened by his tutor. 3. School standing and progress Priestley, at the age of 16, had acquired a pretty good knowledge of the learned languages. At this age, beginning to be of a weakly consumptive habit, he left school, and as Mr. Kirkby, the minister, had given up his teaching, the youth continued his studies alone until at 19 he entered the academy at Devontry. With a view to trade, he had, at 16 to 19, learned French, German, and Italian without a master, and he wrote letters in French and German for an uncle who was a merchant. 4. Friends and Associates. No record. 5. Reading. From 11 to about 13, he had read most of Mr. Bunyan's works and other authors on religion, besides the common Latin authors. 6. Production and Achievement. No record. 7. Evidences of Precocity. Priestley's brother, Timothy, speaking of the period before Joseph was six, seemed to have been particularly impressed by the lad's ability to repeat the assembly's catechism without missing a word and by his habit of kneeling down to pray. This was not at bedtime, which was never neglected, but in the course of the day. AIIQ 140, relative coastal data, 0 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. A year or two before entering the academy at Daventry, Priestley took lessons in mathematics. While instructing a Baptist minister in Hebrew, he was at the same time learning from him Chaldee and Syriac, and had begun to read Arabic. He read widely and attained such a proficiency in many subjects that when admitted to the academy he was excused from all the studies of the first year and a great part of those of the second. At this time he was in the habit of writing down upon his return from church as much of the sermon as he could remember. His naturally vigorous mind was much stimulated by his three years' stay at the academy, where such subjects as liberty, theological orthodoxy and heresy were continually discussed between teachers and students. With one of his classmates, he used to rise early and to read every day ten folio pages of some Greek author, beside a Greek play each week. From 22 to 25, he was minister at Needham Market in Suffolk, where his lack of orthodoxy made him unpopular. He sought to improve his straitened circumstances by teaching and lecturing, but was at first unsuccessful, again because of the taint of heresy. At 25, he entered on his work as head of his school at Nantwich, and, being an excellent teacher, was now very successful. In his leisure time, he recomposed the treatise on the Apostle Paul and compiled an English grammar for use in his school. AIIIQ 150, relief coast of data 0.75. Peter Paul Rubens, 1577-1640. A celebrated Flemish painter. AIIQ 140. AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing. Rubens' grandfather was an apothecary. His father, a graduate of a number of universities, acted as alderman of Antwerp until he was involved in political storms. Rubens' mother, the daughter of a village tapestry maker, possessed a character of devotion, courageous energy, simplicity, perfect tact, and stoicism under suffering, and it's said that her son derived these characteristics from her. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. None are recorded specifically other than the academic and artistic and a strong predilection for all things pertaining to religion and worship. 2. Education. Rubens received his earliest instruction from his energetic mother, who superintended her children's lessons while she cared for several boarders. 
The family were living in Cologne at this time. Whether they had fled from political persecution, the youth received his first regular schooling in Antwerp. After his father's death made possible the family's return to their own country. But at thirteen he was forced to leave school on account of his poverty. Because he expressed an enthusiasm for painting, his mother sent him to the studio of a relative, a landscape painter of mediocre rank. There, however, he remained only a short time. He entered then the studio of Adam van Noort, with whom he worked for four years. Little is known of his progress at this time. 3. School standing in progress. Gifted with exceptional intelligence, Rubens early united a love of work with an eager desire for knowledge. He outstripped, and by a long distance, all his schoolfellows. He knew whole portions of the best prose and poetry by heart, and he learned to speak and read both classical and modern languages. 4. Friends and Associates Mauritius, three years his senior, with whom Rubens attended school from the age of 10 to 13, became his lifelong friend. The young artist is described as having an amiable and perfect character. 5. Reading Rubens never ceased to read, in the original, the best poets and prose writers, especially the classical. He also gained instruction from devotional books. 6. Production and Achievement From earliest childhood, he took pleasure in copying pictures from Stimmer's Bible, and at 13 he entered upon his apprenticeship in art. 7. Evidences of Precocity. See 2, 2 and 3. AI IQ 140. Relative Coast of Data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 and 26. From Van Noort's studio, Rubens went at 17 to serve his master's friend, the eminent painter Van Veen. The influence exercised by Van Veen is more apparent in the conduct of Rubens' life than in his artistic development. Although Rubens worked with his master for four years, no trace remains of his production during this time. At 21, Rubens, now a master of the Guild of St. Luke, settled in Antwerp and began to work at his own destiny. Two years later, he visited Italy in order to study the great paintings, and while he was there, the Duke of Mantua, struck by the talent of the young artist, took him into his service for nearly eight years. At 24, Rubens completed three notable pictures to adorn the chapel of St. Helena in Santa Cruz. St. Helena and the True Cross, the Crownings of the Thorns, and the Elevation of the Cross. While not to be compared to his latter work, these productions exhibit genuine originality and power. AIIIQ 140, Relative Coast Data 0.43. Frederick Schiller, 1759 to 1805. A famous German poet, dramatist, and historian. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 155. 1. Family Standing. The Schillers were peasants and tradesmen in the Necker Valley. Frederick's grandfather was a master baker and a village mayor. The poet's father was an army surgeon with the rank of major. In later life, he became the superintendent of the Ducal Gardens near Ludwigsburg, where, in addition to his official activities, he prepared and published a work of some value on agriculture. The mother, a pious, devoted woman, belonged to a family of bakers and city officials. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. The wishes of his parents, and his own desire to resemble a certain teacher, led young Schiller, at a very early age, to choose a career in the church. As a little boy, he liked to go to school or church, and even at the age of five, he dramatized the church functions, arraying himself in robes suitable to the occasion, and preaching to the family audience. But best of all, he liked to escape to the hills with his sister. Attendance at the theatre was expected of army officials, and so Schiller's father was often present, frequently accompanied by his son, who was thus rewarded for good behaviour. Frederick's first attendance was at the age of seven, and he was so thrilled that, at home, he made a little theatre with paper doll actors. This form of amusement occupied much of the boy's time from the age of seven to thirteen. At school, Schiller was a leader in the games, for although timid and awkward among grown-ups, he was a bold and fearless participant in boys' activities. 2. Education Schiller's mother told Bible stories to her children, his father historical tales. The village school gave Frederick formal training until he passed, at the age of five, to the charge of the pastor with whom he began to study Latin, and at age six, Greek. 
From the age of seven to thirteen, Schiller attended a city Latin school in preparation for a church seminary. At ten and eleven, he was taught Latin, Hebrew, and Greek by an excellent teacher. From his fourteenth to his twenty-first year, the youth was forced to attend the Ducal Academy, although he could not then prepare for his chosen profession, the ministry. At the age of fourteen, he decided, as a second choice, to enter the law, but when a department of medicine was established in the academy, Schiller, in his seventeenth year, found in it an escape from the, by this time, heartily detested legal studies. 3. School standing and progress. In all his childhood, try as he would, Schiller could never do enough to satisfy his father. Yet the desire to do, ultimately, was always an incentive. Hating the dry catechism, the boy memorized it for the sake of his father and of his own ambition, and recited it without an error. For his pains he received a prize. The boy's teachers were pleased with his industry and called him one of the best pupils. Schiller passed at nine and a half his first public examination and received an encouraging comment from the teacher. And Tanny passed his second examination successfully. In this year and the next, he wrote good Latin verse. And at twelve and a half, he received a double A, the highest mark, in every examination. It was this success that brought young Frederick to the Duke's attention as a possible candidate for his academy. During his first year at the Ducal Academy, Schiller's rapid physical growth and frequent interposition affected his school record. He was reported poor in conduct. In Latin and Greek he did fairly, for mathematics he had little talent. In his law studies he got the name of a dullard. In Greek, however, he took a prize, at fourteen, and the Duke remarked that this boy will be something. At the age of fifteen, Schiller was at the foot of his class, and there he remained for a year until entering upon a, the more frequent congenial study of medicine, he again made a satisfactory record. His true interest, even at this time, was in literature. 4. Friends and Associates Two associates of Schiller's infancy, and one from his eighth year, remained his friends for life. One of these was afterward a member of the State Medical Council. Schiller had always a few friends to whom he was devoted, and with such as these he shared in his teens, a productive enthusiasm for literature. 5. Reading Schiller's mother read the works of the religious poets to her children. Reading became the boy's delight, and at thirteen he would often lose himself in Klopstock, Virgil, or the Psalms, forgetting his prescribed tasks. At fourteen, or possibly earlier, he read secretly Werther and the dreams of Gertzenberg, Lessing, and Goethe. At fifteen, he devoted himself to poetry, attended lectures on Homer, and read unstintedly, alone, or with his inmates. 6. Production and Achievement At ten, Schiller wrote an original Latin prose greeting to his father, and at fourteen produced with great facility distichs, letters, etc., of which two examples are preserved. Perhaps his first original production in German was a description of a psychic experience at his confirmation, aged twelve and a half, in the same year he wrote two tragedies. When he was thirteen, he produced a poem and an epic in the Klopstock manner. At fourteen, he founded with his friends a Dukterband for the cultivation of the muse. Essays of this year, one in Latin distichs and one in prose, show technical skill and ability in characterization. At fifteen, Schiller wrote The Student of Nassau. At sixteen, he and his colleagues began to send their productions to the periodicals. Frederick was always dreaming of becoming a poet. 7. Evidences of Precocity Tales are told of bright sayings of Schiller before he was four years old. AIIQ 140, Relief Coastal Data, 0 0.60 3. Development from 17 and 26 Schiller continued to study medicine at the Ducal Academy, but his heart turned to literature. At the age of 19, he was already at work on The Robbers. He delivered school addresses on formal occasions, wrote two poems, and occupied himself with translations and extensive reading. At 21, he was graduated as a physician, but with permission to practice in the army only. The same year, he received an appointment to a regiment at Stuttgart. But he found the work there uncongenial and the living conditions humiliating. The next year, The Robbers was printed at his own expense. It was played with immense success, and rapidly won fame for its author. At twenty-two and a half, Schiller published a volume of poems and became editor of a magazine while continuing his dramatic work. During a term of imprisonment, his punishment for visiting Mannheim without leave 
to see a performance of the robbers, Schiller was commanded by the Duke to cease his literary activities altogether. This was too severe a penalty. The young poet fled from so intolerable a situation and devoted himself entirely to literary work, producing a number of dramas, including Louise Mullerin and Don Carlos. At twenty-four, he was appointed theatre director at Mannheim, and although afflicted with dips, he wrote and produced several dramas. Elected to a learned society, he delivered at admirable first address on what a good theatre can affect. AII IQ 155, relative kosher of data 0.75. William Henry Seward, 1801 to 1872, an American statesman. AII IQ 140, AII IQ 140. 1. Family standing. Seward's maternal grandfather appears to have been a distinctly public spirited citizen. His father was successively physician, farmer, and merchant and it discharged with integrity the duties of several officers of public trust, including that of member of the New York legislature. The mother whose father was also a citizen of good standing in the community was remembered as a person of excellent sense, gentleness, truthiness, and candor. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. From a very early age, Seward evinced a decided love of books and a taste for study, but with little aptitude for work upon the farm or in the country store. In fact, he frequently ran away from home to go to school. As evidence of his intellectual absorption, he is told that at twelve, as he was reading while returning from the pasture with the cows, he fell into a creek and was only rescued from drowning by the timely aid of an elder brother. The presentation of Cato in a school exhibition made a lasting impression and led young Seward to become a hater of military and imperial usurpation. At college, Seward disliked mathematics but was devoted to the study of moral philosophy, rhetoric, and the ancient classics. He cherished an ambition to become the valedictorian of his class. 2. Education Boy was sent at the age of nine to the Farmers Hall Academy in Goshen, New York, which he attended for one year. He began the study of Latin at that time, starting at 10 years of age. He engaged in college preparatory work in a new academy at Florida, New York. Daily studies began at 5 a.m. and closed at 9 p.m., and recreation periods were all utilized in public chores. At 15, the youth matriculated as a sophomore at Union College, Schenectady, which was then, owing to the good influence of its president, at the height of its prosperity. Discipline was based on sound principles, but instruction still consisted in the memorizing and reciting of set tasks. 3. School standing and progress. At Farmer's Hall, because he refused to help shut out the master when the latter required school attendance on Christian Day, Seward earned the contempt of his schoolfellows. During the Florida years, William was reported by a master as too stupid to learn because he failed in Latin translations, but later, when his ambition had been aroused by his father's statement that he might one day become a great lawyer, he rarely required a double lesson within the time allowed for a single one. Although in one subject, composition, an exercise he had rarely practised, he wrote confusedly because he had no general supply of facts or knowledge. He was, according to the examiner, more than qualified to enter the junior class. However, his youth made him ineligible, as sixteen was a minimum for a junior, and he was but fifteen. 4. Friends and Associates Seward states with reference to his college days, the companionship of intelligent and emulous classmates harmonised with my disposition. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and Achievement In his childhood and probably before he was nine, William's radical gifts were exploited by his admiring father, who placed him on the counter of a country store to recite a political address before an audience of neighbours. It was perhaps about this time that William announced his intention of becoming a Justice of the Peace. A characteristic phase remains from a school composition of Seward's early teens. On virtue, virtue is the best of all vices. At college, Seward, aged 16, and his roommate rose at three o'clock in the morning, cooked their own meals, washed their own dishes, and spent their time in severe study to win five better Kappa honours, which they succeeded in attaining in the junior year. 7. Evidences of precocity, C2, 1, 3, and 6. AI IQ 140, relative kosher data, 0. 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. 
Diffidence or some other cause kept William from participating in the debates he heard at school, but he profited by them nevertheless, and at seventeen delivered his first political speech. After a year of earning to pay off his debts, Seward returned at the age of eighteen for his senior year at college. He held the office of class manager during the year, and graduating with the highest honours, he was chosen to deliver a commencement oration. For the age of nineteen, Seward studied and practised law. Almost as soon as he was admitted to the bar, age 21, he made a reasonable living. He married at 23. At 24, he had already aroused some local attention by his speeches on state and national issues. AIIQ 140, relative crystal data, 0. 0.60. David Frederick Strauss, 1808 to 1874, a celebrated German theologian and philosopher. AIIQ 140, AIIQ 160. 1. Family Standing The franco swabian Strauss family in Lerkwitzburg near Stuttgart were merchants. David Frederick's father, whose habits and interests were scholarly rather than mercantile, was a senator as well as a merchant and a man of distinct ability in education. The mother, whose father was a pastor and the son of a pastor, was practical, rational and stable. Under distinctly trying circumstances, she never lost her courage, balance and sound common sense. 2. Development 2017 1. Interests The Strauss children flew their kites in the meadow, gathered flowers in the woods with their mother, helped her in the garden, assisted her father in the care of his bees or played in the garret. David's constitutional frailty inclined him to intellectual rather than physical recreations. In his teens, a talent for poetry appeared and was cultivated. 2. Education Strauss attended the Latin school through his 14th year. Then choosing theology as a career, he entered the Lower Evangelical Seminary at Blorberen, where the principal studies were classical literature and ancient history. Here he came under the tuition of professors Kern and Bauer, eminent scholars. 3. School Standing Achievement At the age of 11, and while he was attending the Latin school, his name appeared as fourth on a list of five superior scholars in the institution, and when he entered the Evangelical Seminary, his standing was even higher for he was introduced by his rector as the best student in his class. 4. Friends and Associates Strauss's chief friend at Blorberen was the eminent philosopher Vischer, who held this place throughout their lives and became his colleague's biographer. For a time, Strauss held in peculiarly lover-like affection a youth of somewhat feminine qualities, and was inspired by him to some of his earliest efforts at poetry. 5. Reading, no record. Six production achievement, no specific record, but C two four. Seven evidences of precocity. At an early period, David Frederick's intellectual quickness and poetic imagination were apparent. At school, although too delicate for the usual games, his originality in play was noted. A I I Q one hundred and forty relative coast of data point six zero. Three development from seventeen to twenty six. From the age of seventeen to twenty two, Strauss attended the Evangelical College of Tübingen. Entering as fifth of his class, repelled alike by the dry character of the instruction and the noisy vulgarity of student life, Strauss attached himself to a group of friends with poetic gifts and tastes. By his nineteenth year, the shy boy had developed into a self-assured, hard, critical individual whom mothers feared. At this time, the religious philosophy of his old teacher, Bauer, now Professor at Tübingen, brought Strauss under the influence of Schillermacher. Through reading and discussion with his friends, the youth was attracted to the philosophy of Hegel. Towards the end of his twenty-third year, Strauss left Tübingen to become a pastor in a village near his own home. He was popular in the village, but he remained there less than a year, returning there to a professorship at Mollenbronn. While here, before he was twenty-four, Strauss received a doctor's degree for a thesis which is described as philosophical rather than religious. The same year, attracted by the teachings of Hegel, he made his way to Berlin. Unfortunately, the philosopher's death intervened, but Strauss attached himself to the Hegelian school and also attended Schleiermacher's lectures on the life of Jesus. Before he was 25, the young student had returned to Tübingen as undermaster, delivering a course on logic, metaphysics and philosophy, of which it was said Hegel could not indeed have desired a better interpreter than he here found. In 1835, at the age of 27, Strauss published this famous Life of Jesus Critically Considered. AIIIQ 160, Relative Coast of Data, 0.75.
Ain Robert Jacques Turgot, 1727-1781, a noted French statesman, political economist and financier, AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 160. 1. Family standing. Turgot's family was one of the most ancient of Normandy. His paternal grandfather had been intendant of the generality of Metz and Tours. His father was successfully master of the requests, provost of the Belles Lettres, councillor of state, and president of the Grand Council, and was also the originator of one of the finest plans ever made for the defence of Paris. The only information as to the mother is that she did not understand her son, and continually rebuked him for his awkwardness. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Turgot early developed a pronounced fondness for books and serious studies. Because of his physical and social ineptitude, he soon became abnormally sensitive and avoided people as much as possible. He evidently had much sympathy for poor students with whom he came in contact in college, for he gave them much of his pocket money. 2. Education. Young Turgot had a tutor who, it appears, was not efficient, for although the pupil's wide reading filled his mind with ideas, when the time came for sending him to college, his knowledge was found to be far from exact. However, he made decided advance under the able instruction of the Collège Louis Le Grand, where all his hours were filled. Literature and poetry were very appealing to him. Grammar and languages he learned readily, and as in accordance with his father's request, he devoted much time to them. He learned many, including Greek, German, Italian, English, Spanish, and Hebrew. At the Collège du Plessis, he had distinguished masters, among them the Abe Sigourney, the first professor in France to substitute the theories of Newton for those of Descartes. At the age of sixteen, Turgot, intended by his father for the church, went to the seminary of Saint Sulpice, where the lecturers of the Faculty of Theology engaged his attention. 3. School standing and progress. No further record. 4. Friends and associates. No record of other than relatives and tutors. 5. Reading. At 16, Turgot spent much of his time reading books on finance, commerce, philosophy and theology. 6. Production and achievement. He had acquired a knowledge of languages before his 16th year. 7. Evidences of precocity. C2, 1, 2 and 6. AIIQ 140, relative quotient of data, 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 19, Toko was admitted, because of his youth by special dispensation, to the examination for the degree of Bachelor of Theology. He defended his thesis so brilliantly that both the Pope's nuncio and the Archbishop of Tours showered him with compliments. The latter informed the King that he had never heard a thesis sustained with equal distinction. At 22, the gifted student was admitted to the Sorbonne to study for his ecclesiastical license. His first writing, of which there is any trace, is a public letter to Buffon, in which he gives the principal objections which led her overthrew the astronomical system of the celebrated naturalist. At 22, Turgot wrote his first paper on economics, in which he aimed to refute Law's system. Six months after his admission to the Sorbonne, he was elected prior, or chairman, of the assemblies. At 23, he set himself to refute the metaphysical doctrines of Berkeley and Maupertuin. During his stay at Sorbonne, Turgot made many translations into French, of masterpieces in other languages, including renderings of the works of Homer, Seneca, Caesar, Ovid, Tacitus, Horace, Tibullus, Virgil, Tasso, Klopstock, Gessner, Hume, Addison, Johnson, Pope, and Dr. Josiah Tugger. The languages from which he translated included Latin, Greek, Hebrew, German, Italian, and English. His verse at this period was produced with a remarkable facility and was characterised by a considerable epigrammatic point. Claiming the whole world of thought as his domain, he had achieved, before he was 23, wild knowledge of literature, political economy, chemistry, and the physical sciences. In his 23rd year, and against the advice of his friends, Turgot left the church for the law, becoming deputy councillor in the Parliament of Paris. AII IQ 160 Relative Cultural Data 0.75 Lope Felix de Vega Caprio, 1562-1635, a celebrated Spanish dramatist and poet. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing Lope's father, a poet of singularly Christian spirit, was devoted to works of practical charity. 
but is probably either a basket maker or an embroiderer. There is no record concerning the mother. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. In his childhood, Lope probably assisted his father in caring for the poor and the sick in a Madrid hospital. At five, the boy read Spanish and Latin and was devoted to verse-making, for which he had already shown much talent. In his eleventh year, he possessed such accomplishments as dancing, singing, fencing, etc. At fourteen, being ambitious to see the world, he set out with a friend, but he was caught in an escape and was returned home by the police. 2. Education At five, Lope had already begun to study Spanish and Latin, and ten he knew grammar and some rhetoric was familiar with Latin and Italian, and was acquainted with French. He had probably entered college at this time, and after two years, age twelve, he had mastered grammar and rhetoric. Between the ages of fifteen and seventeen, he entered the University of Alcala, from which he graduated after four years of study. 3. School standing and progress. Although there is no definite statement to that effect, we may infer that Loop's general educational progress was unusually rapid. 4. Friends and Associates Herman Nolens accompanied Lope on his journey at the age of 14. 5. Reading, no definite record. 6. Production and Achievement At 5, Lope dictated poems while he was yet unable to write. At about 10, he translated a Latin poem into Castilian verse and composed rhymes both Latin and Castilian. At 14, he wrote his first play, The True Lover, which was marked by his characteristic sweetness of versification. At fifteen, he wrote a number of eclogues in honour of the Bishop of Avila, whose service he had entered and produced, as well as the comedy La Pastoral de Jacinto, his first three-act play. Before his eighteenth year, he had written many more dramatic pieces. 7. Evidence of precocity. C. 2, 2 and 6. AI IQ 140, relative coast of data 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 20 or 21, Lope became the secretary of the Duke of Alba, repaying the favour of his appointment by writing a pastoral romance, La Acadia. For two years, probably between the ages of 21 and 23, he served the Marquis de las Navas. At 22, already ranked as an eminent poet in Madrid, he contributed to the Jardin Espiritual of Fr. Pedro de Badilla and to the Cancionero of Lopez Maldonado. It is probable that he wrote La Dorettia between the ages of 23 and 26. Cervantes, in a romance published in 1585, when Lope was 23, mentions his young contemporary as among the most distinguished Spanish wits of the time. Already the youth was accorded both for his poetry and his charity the unusual well-deserved fame which the man was to receive in full measure during his later life. AII IQ 145, relative crucial data 0.43. James Watt, 1736 to 1819, a Scottish mechanician, inventor, and civil engineer. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family standing. Watt's father, descended from solid stock, made his way as a shipwright, ship chandler, builder, and merchant. He was a promoter of town improvements, an intelligent, upright, and benevolent man. Among the mother's forebears were great soldiers and warriors. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. In early boyhood, James was fond of angling and was also devoted to all kinds of experimentation. In that boyhood, probably between the ages of 14 and 17, he was indefatigable in his habits of research and observation. Every excursion he took extended his knowledge, not contented with adding to his botanical and mineral treasures. He entered the cottages of the poor to study their characters and listened for hours to their local traditions, popular ballads, and wild superstitions. Astronomy was a fascinating study to him, and he took a deep interest in anatomy. Many years later, he told his son that he would have been a surgeon had he been able to bear the sight of suffering. 2. Education While he was still a little child, what was taught to read by his mother? His father taught him writing and arithmetic. Ill health kept James from regular school attendance, but under the learned master of grammar school of, of Greenock, he attained a more than respectable proficiency in Latin and some knowledge of the elements of Greek. 3. School standing and progress. What school comrades, certain burly youngsters, considered him mentally dull in the earlier period of his school days, for his ill health 
and a partiality for quiet pursuits result in drawing upon him the disdainful regard of his associates at thirteen or fourteen however he made rapid progress in a mathematical class four friends and associates a cousin who became mrs marion campbell was watt's companion in early youth and his friend through life on his frequent visits to glasgow when he was fourteen and more he formed friendships with several intelligent and well-educated young men these acknowledged and appreciated mr watt's superior abilities yet they sometimes feared while they loved him as he had no patience for folly and could be sarcastic five reading before the age of fifteen james had read twice with great attention to graphesan's elements of natural philosophy the first book on that subject put into his hands it was probably during his middle teens that he read indiscriminately almost every book he could procure poetry romance and the publications of the day he also read and studied much in chemistry and anatomy six production and achievement at thirteen young watt while on a visit to glasgow invented story after story to keep his friends up till after midnight because his severe toothache could not let him sleep at an earlier hour in these tales the interest was so overpowering that all the family listened to him with breathless attention between his fifteenth and eighteenth year every new acquisition in science languages or general literature seemed made without an effort he went on with various chemical experiments repeating them again and again until satisfied with their accuracy for his own observations he had made for himself a small electrical machine and sometimes startled his young friends by giving them sudden shocks from it in his father's shop he learned to work with metal wood and other materials and with a small forge set up for his use he repaired and manufactured all sorts of instruments made a punch ladle out of a silver coin and gained familiarity with the use and construction of telescopes quadrants and other optical instruments among the small models of his invention were a crane and a barrel organ seven evidences of precocity what was six when he drew mathematical lines and circles on the, the marble hearth and then marked in letters and figures the result of some calculation he was carrying out a caller on putting various questions to the boy was questioned and gratified with the mixture of intelligence quickness and simplicity displayed by his answers and pronounced him no common child at an early age he was remarkable for manly spirit a retentive memory and strict adherence to truth his parents were proud of his talents and encouraged him to study at home. Given a set of small tools by his father, he delighted in taking his toys to pieces, reconstructing them and inventing new playthings. At fifteen he sat silent for an hour in his aunt's house, taking the lid off the kettle and putting it on again, holding now a cup and now a silver spoon over the steam, watching how it rose from the spout, and catching and connecting the drops of hot water it fell into. His aunt asked if he were not ashamed to spend his time in that way. See also 2, 1, 4, 5, and 6. AIIQ 140, relative coastal data 0. 0.53. 3. Development from 1726. Before he was 19, Watt had decided to become a mathematical instrument maker. After a year with relatives in Glasgow, where he gained favourable notice from several learned professors, he went to London, and there was apprenticed to one of the few mathematical instrument makers of the city. Dispensing with the regulation years of service, because he made such extraordinary progress, he returned to Glasgow and secured employment at the university. At 21, he had become the university mathematical instrument maker. In the years immediately following, the, he carried out some significant experiments, and at 25 or 26, constructed a kind of steam engine. AIIIQ 145 Relative coefficient of data point six zero. End of section twenty five. Section twenty six of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume Two, The Elemental Traits of Three Hundred Geniuses by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 18, Part 3 Ulrich Zwingli, 1484 to 1531, a famous Swiss reformer, with Calvin, the founder of the Reformed Church. AIIQ 140, AIIIQ 140. 1. Family Standing. 
Swingley's paternal ancestors were well-to-do peasants prominent in their community. His grandfather and his father, who also raised flocks and herds, served each in turn as chief magistrate of the village. Nothing is known as Wingley's mother, Margaret Milley, except that she was a sister of a Benedictine abbot. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Young Zwingli was a patriot. When a child of any one said a word against his fatherland, he bristled up instantly. Music was a passion with him, and at 16 he was already an accomplished player on various instruments. 2. Education. From his earliest years, he was instructed by his parents in religious matters, and received also about as good a secular education as the times afforded. His father committed him at three to an uncle, a priest and friend of the new learning, to see if there were the making of a scholar in him. While living with his uncle, he was sent first to the parish school, and later at ten to the school at St. Theodore's Church, kept by a gentle and wise master, Gregory Buensley. At fourteen, Ulrich entered at Bern, the school of Wolfin, a remarkable man of learning and a famous poet. After two years, he went to a Dominican monastery for further training in music, but he was soon removed by his father and sent to the university in Vienna, where he probably came under the prominent classical teacher, Conrad Kiltz. 3. School Standing in Progress Swingley learned so quickly that he found all the things he was taught too easy to give his clever intellect due exercise. At St. Theodore's, he was a brilliant pupil, carrying off all the honours in the disputations and outgrowing in four years his master, Ben Zuli's instruction. From Wolflin, he acquired elegance in diction, the knowledge and discernments of things, and the theory of poesy. At Vienna, he took up all that philosophy embraces and turned it to good account. 4. Friends and Associates Swingley incurred the hatred of the older boys by carrying off all the honours in school, but he won the friendship of his teacher, Gregory Bunsley, who became a fatherly mentor. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production and achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no further record. AIIQ 140, relative quotient of data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 18, Zwingli matriculated at the University of Basel, and while studying the ordinary curriculum in the arts, of course, which included theology, he became a teacher of the classics in the school attached to St. Martin's Church. At 20, he took his BA degree, and the following year, the MA. His thoughts on theology were affected by Thomas Weitenbach, who was lecturing at Basel, and whose somewhat heretical ideas Zwingli accepted and defended. After ordination, Swingley was called by the rector to Glarus and was put in charge of a parish of three villages. He read his first mass at the age of 22. Devoting himself to theological studies, he abandoned the heathen classics, collected a large library, and soon had the sacred scriptures at his command. His sunny disposition and agreeable conversation enhanced his growing reputation as a preacher. He learned to play upon all kinds of musical instruments that he might refresh his mind when wearied by severe study, and so return to his intellectual labours with renewed vigour. AIIIQ 140, Relative Coastal Data 0.43 Dominique Francois Arago, 1786 to 1853 A French physicist and astronomer, noted especially for his experiments and discoveries in magnetism and optics. AIIQ 145 AIIIQ 165 1. Family Standing The father of Arago, a man of some little property in arable land, fine yards and olive trees, was a licentiate in law who became treasurer of the mint. In regard to the mother, no information has been found. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests The physicist's native town of Estegol was a halting place for troops, and military men were constantly in and out of the Arago home. Thus early association combined with the excitement of the Spanish invasion to inspire young dominant Francois with such decided military tastes that his parents had to use great care to prevent him from running away with the soldiers. In fact, they caught him several times, as much as a league's distance from the village on his way with the troops. At seven years of age, the martial lad attacked single-handed some Spanish soldiers whom he had heard malignant the Tree of Liberty, succeeded in wounding the head of the party, and was only with difficulty rescued by his countrymen from the wrath of the enemy. A chance meeting with a young officer of artillery 
when Arago was something over fourteen years old, directed the boy's interest to mathematics, and from that time on he followed no other course. Studying by himself, he soon found obstacles that he was unable to surmount, until a friend at Estegel, who made the study of higher mathematics his recreation, learned of his predicament and offered to assist him. Arago found his greatest encouragement in the words of de Alembert to a young man who had communicated to him his difficulties. Go on, sir, go on, and a conviction will come to you. Following this instruction, Arago found that, as he went on, what before had been dark became clear and distinct. 2. Education Arago was sent to the primary school in Estegel, where he learned the rudiments of reading and writing. At the same time, he received at home some private instruction in vocal music. He says of his progress, I was not otherwise more or less advanced than other children of my age. From the age of 14 to 16, Arago attended the municipal college in Perpignan, whither the family had removed, and here he was at first occupied almost exclusively with literary studies. Then came his sudden interest in mathematics, to which he devoted himself almost exclusively for more than two years, from fourteen to seventeen, as he had heard that an officer should not be ignorant of music, fencing and dancing, Arago devoted the early hours of each day to perfecting himself in these accomplishments. 3. School Standing and Progress The boy's esteemed teacher of mathematics had had a little training. His pupils soon progressed as far as he, and from that time the youth decided to study by himself. With this in view, he is sent to Paris for the newest works. In a year and a half, having mastered all the subjects required for admission into the Polytechnic School, Arago presented himself for the local examination. But the examiner was prevented by illness from visiting the province, and Arago, who could not afford to make the trip to the city, lost his opportunity of taking the test during that year. He therefore devoted the following months to more advanced and intensive study. 4. Friends and Associates now to refer to accepting the amateur mathematician who assisted him. 5. Reading When Arago was 14, the French classical authors had become the objects of his favourite reading, but a little later, aged 14 to 16, his entire interest was centred in the works of Legendre, Lacroix and Garnier. These were followed, at age 16, by the works of Euler, Lagrange and finally Laplace. 6. Production and Achievement, C. 2.3 7. Evidences of Precocity, C. 2. 1, 2, 3, and 5. AI IQ 145, Relative Coast of Data 0. 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Arago was examined by Legendre himself for entrance to the Polytechnic School at Toulouse and passed brilliantly. His stay at the school lasted two years, during which he had distinguished himself in mathematical work. He met the geometer Poisson and passed with him every evening, entire hours in conversing on politics and mathematics. At the age of 19, Arago became secretary of the Paris Observatory and carried out, with the eminent Boit, an intensive and minute research on the refraction of gases. For the next two years, the young scientist participated in the work carried on at the observatory. At 20, Arago left with Boit on a surveying expedition to belong the meridian line from France as far as the island of Formentera. After about a year, when the older scientists had returned to Paris, Arago, working alone, was suspected as a French spy and imprisoned by the Spanish. He secured a release only after some months, and then proceeded to Paris. The next year, at the extremely early age of 23, he was elected to the Academy as a reward for his scientific labours. Soon after, as a result of the kindly office of Mong, the noted geometrician, he was chosen to take the chair of analytical geometry at his old school at Toulouse. AIIQ 165, relative quotient data 0.75. Francis Bacon, 1561-1626. A celebrated English philosopher, jurist and statesman, AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 155 1. Family Standing The Bacon family belonged to the upper middle class. Francis Bacon's father studied at Cambridge and became First Lord Keeper of the Great Seal and a statesman of no main ability. Bacon's mother, a member of the lesser nobility, was a woman of strong personality and unusual ability, one of the most learned women in England. 
2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Unauthenticated anecdotes are told of Bacon's early inquisitiveness and originality. More definite than these is the report that before he left Cambridge at 15, he broke away from the Aristotelian philosophy, and this event he is said to have regarded as the most important of his life. While in France in his middle teens, he studied the art of cipher and invented an ingenious method of cryptic writing. 2. Education During Bacon's early years, his mother devoted herself assiduously to the cultivation of his mind. At the age of twelve, being then a little under the customary age, the lad was dispatched to Trinity College, Cambridge, and at fifteen he was admitted, with his brother, two years his senior, to Gary's Inn. Shortly afterward, Bacon was sent with the English ambassador to France, and there he remained three years, settling down for study at Poistiers, after a brief tour of the country. 3. School standing on progress. Bacon's observation was active and his memory retentive. He passed through the usual course of study, but he came away with a supreme contempt for the prevailing methods of education. 4. Friends and Associates In France, Bacon associated with the young secretaries of legation. 5. Reading Francis Bacon owed a great debt to his mother for his love of books. No exact record of his reading is preserved. 6. Production Achievement At sixteen, he began his Notes on the State of Europe, a work that was accurate without being profound. 7. Evidences of Precocity From his earliest infancy, Bacon exhibited, along with bodily weakness, the drawings of extraordinary intellect. Introduced at an early age into the court of Queen Elizabeth, he showed in his discourse their remarkable gravity and, on occasion, as remarkable wit. AIIQ 145, relative quotient of data 0.53 3. Development from 17 to 26 Bacon's unusual intellectual ability was generally recognised before his return from France at the age of 18. Three years of law study prepared him for admission to the Hauteur Bar at 21, and these were followed by study at Gray's Inn, attendance at lectures at the Temple and appearances before the court. When he was a cultured and learned young man, Bacon's society is much sought after, but still he devoted considerable time to study. When he was 22, one of his first philosophical papers, The Greatest Birth of Time, appeared. At the age of 23, Bacon entered Parliament, plunging at once into the heart of political controversy. At 25, his period of probation having been shortened nearly two years, he became a full-fledged lawyer. He began at this time to prepare carefully written papers on public affairs, which were mostly circulated in manuscript. Of these, the first of importance was a letter to the Queen of the policy to be adopted toward Roman Catholics. It was calm, sagacious, and slightly Machiavellian. AII IQ 155, relative coastal data 0.53. John Sullivan Bailey, 1736-1793, a noted French astronomer and politician. AII IQ 145, AII IQ 160. 1. Family standing. Bailey's father held the position of guard of the pictures of the king at the Louvre, a position which seems to have been hereditary in the family. Of the mother's family, there is no record. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Bailey early manifested a lively interest in science and literature. 2. Education. Designed by his father for the hereditary office in the Louvre, young Bailey was early instructed at home under his father's direction. The program of his studies emphasised the artistic side at the expense of the strictly classical, and in consequence of the Bailey's Latin was already faulty. At the same time, and because the youth, while possessing a certain interest, lacked the necessary talent, the painting and drawing which were his father's chief concern never developed beyond mediocrity. Fortunately, a certain M. D. von Carville ordered to instruct the lad in calculus in return for drawing lessons from the elder Bailey, and John Sullivan advanced so rapidly that he soon required the ablest masters. 3. School standing on progress, C22. 4. Friends and Associates, no specific record. 5. Reading. Bailey developed love for reading at about the same time that his interest was awakened in science, but there's no specific record of the books read. 6. Production Achievement. 
and about the age of sixteen Bailey tried his adolescent muse by composing two tragedies. But when he submitted these to the judgment of a noted actor of the time, though the verses were accorded some praise, the author was advised to desert literature for science, advice which, in the main, was thereafter followed. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No further record. AIIQ 145. Relative Cultural Data. 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. No record is available of Bailey's career for many years after his transition from letters to science. In 1759, age 23, he calculated an orbit of for Halley's Comet, and later acquired considerable knowledge of astronomy, contributing to the Academy. At 27, a paper entitled Observations Luminaires, which collected numerous observations calculated under the direction of his distinguished teacher, Lacayel. On the death of this teacher, which occurred the same year, Bailey was elected to his place in the Academy. AIIIQ 160, relative kosher data 0.60. Gilbert Burnett, 1643 to 1715, a British prelate, historian, and theologian. AIIQ 145. AIIIQ 145. 1. Family standing. The Burnets were an old and honourable Scottish family. Gilbert's father was a lawyer, learned in his profession, solid rather than brilliant, sufficiently successful to accumulate a large estate, and yet a generous man a full half of whose practice went for charity or for friendship. The mother's brother, a staunch covenanter, was at the age of thirty already one of the best-known men in Scotland. The maternal relatives were characterised by their warlike high church Presbyterianism. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Bernard's early years were passed in the time of civil war. He could always recall the entrance of Cromwell's troops into Aberdeen when he was eight years old. While still very young, Bernard had a greater knowledge of affairs than is usual at that age, largely because of the atmosphere of theological debate in which he lived. Permitted to choose his own profession, the boy decided on the law to his father's regret, for the latter had hoped that his son would enter the ministry. After a year's legal study, or to the great joy of his parent, Gilbert altered his decision in favour of a career in the church. 2. Education The older Burnett devoted his energies, during a time of enforced retirement from professional life, to Gilbert's education, and subjected him to a Spartan system of training. Indeed, so harsh was this well-meant discipline that the boy came to fear, and even to hate his father. In consequence of his father's method of forcing, young Burnett entered the Marischal College of Aberdeen University at the age of nine and remained five years, became M.A. just before he was fourteen. His father supervised his studies and made him rise to begin work at four o'clock in the morning. The year after Gilbert left the university, he devoted himself to the study of law, but at the close of this period he entered upon a three-year divinity course, pursuing his new interest with characteristic ardour. 3. School Standing and Progress So successful were the results of his father's course of instruction, that before he was ten years old, Bernard was master of the Latin tongue and of the classic authors. At the university, Bernard, aged nine to fourteen, won no small applause, and he was not a little vain of his achievement. Four friends and associates. The boy's father appears to have been his closest companion during his youth. Five. Reading. During his theological course, Bernard, aged fifteen to eighteen, read over twenty volumes in folio of school divinity. One result of this, he says, was to heighten my vanity. He read also many volumes of history of all sorts, so that he furnished himself with much matter, which he laid out on all occasions. 6. Reduction achievement. No further record. 7. Evidence of precocity. No further record. AIIQ 145. Relative culture of data. 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 18, Bernard refused to accept a benefice because he considered himself too young for its responsibilities, and he again refused when a school benefice was offered him the following year. His unusual attainments and ability were already recognised by distinguished men, who sought and cultivated his acquaintance. At the age of 19, he approached the Archbishop with practical suggestions for healing the breach between the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians. 
Before he was twenty-five, he had carefully studied the history of the church from its earliest beginnings, had examined its institutions and its state in England and on the continent as well as in Scotland, had studied science and mathematics as well as theology, and had won the loyal support of a Scottish parish while acting for five years as its energetic preacher and minister. He was equally skilful and able, whether as teacher or as clergyman, and at twenty-four, twenty-five, he wrote an excellent treatise on education that attracted much attention. AIIIQ 145, Relative Question of Data, point six zero. Tommaso Capanilla, 1568-1639, an Italian philosopher and Dominican monk. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 155. 1. Family Standing The only reference to Campanella's father states that he was the leader of a small patriotic uprising against the Spanish oppressor of Italy. No other information in regard to the family has been found. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Campanella was destined for the law, but he decided, partially it is admitted, for love of learning, although his religious calling is clear, to enter a preaching order. 2. Education After receiving instruction in the study of logic, Campanella, at the age of 14 or 15, entered a preaching order, going as a novice to the cloister of St. George of Montgentia in Abruzzo to study philosophy and then to Cosenza to study theology. 3. School study and progress. See 2, 2, 5, 6 and 7. 4. Friends and associates. No specific record. 5. Reading. At 12 or 14, Carpinella had mastered nearly all the Latin authors presented to him. 6. Production and Achievement At 12 or 14, he could express himself skillfully in Latin prose or verse. At 14 or perhaps 15, he greeted the Lord of the City in Abruzzo with a Latin address in hexameters and a hymn in sapphic strophes, delivered before the assembled populace. Poems and inscriptions from his pen were engraved on the same occasion in the church and upon the triumphal ark. 7. Evidences of Precocity Copernel is reported to have been a precocious child, and is included by Ballot among his Enfants Celebres. Even when he was five years, he grasped whatever he heard from parents or teachers. His excellent memory that never forsook him was already apparent. He would go to school and listen to the instruction from outside the door, and when the teacher scolded the boys for their poor performance, he would peep in and ask, Shall I tell it to you? Then he would recite the lesson without omitting a syllable. AIIQ 145, Relative Coaching Data, point four three. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Campanella continued the study of philosophy and theology until he was 23. He read and compared the works of the leading philosophers and checked the results by the evidence of nature. Telesius seemed most nearly to express his own views, and Campanella addressed the elegy to the memory of this writer. At twenty-two, he wrote in eleven months a treatise, Philosophy Demonstrated by the Senses, and annihilating criticism of the great work of Marta, which had been the fruit of eleven years' labour by its author. Other treaties were written before he was twenty-three. Campanella so distinguished himself by the skill and knowledge he displayed in public debate that he was denounced to the Inquisition. The following years, 23 to 30, Carbonella devoted to travel, to lectures on philosophy, to sketching the main outlines of his metaphysics, and to the preparation of a number of essays and poems. AIIIQ 155, Relative Coast of Data, point four three. Thomas Chalmers, 1780 to 1847, a celebrated Scottish divine and author. AIIIQ 145, AIIIQ 160. 1. Family Standing The Chalmers family was connected with the middle class, the clergy, and the landed gentry. Thomas Chalmers' father was a dyer, shipowner, and general merchant, a most respectable and substantial rural tradesman, member of the town council, and an elder in the church. The mother shared with her husband a sincere religious character of Calvinistic nature. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests Chalmers showed at his first school that he was a leader in sport and a strong, active, boisterous lad. From an early age he loved to preach, and he soon declared for the ministry, although he cared for neither theology nor religion. 
When he reached the age of 14, his interest became centred on a single branch of study, mathematics, and from this time onward, this science remained a favourite pursuit. Because of his transparent regard for truth, Thomas thought he could not accept Calvinism, and so he turned from theology to a scientific interpretation of the universe, which satisfied him for a time. 2. Education From the age of 3 to 11, Chalmers attended the Paris school, going thence to the University of St. Andrews, where he remained seven years, devoting the last three to a serious study of theology. 3. School study and progress In his first school, Chalmers was merry, generous-hearted and idle. During his first three years at the university, he was still rather idle, but what he did undertake, he carried on perseveringly and with enthusiasm. At 14, he began to be attached to study, and was known from that time as Mr. Chalmers, the mathematician. C. 2. 6. 4. Friends and Associates. No specific record. 5. Reading. The contradiction in Chalmers' interest is shown by the fact that he turned at 16 from an absorbing perusal of Godwin's Political Justice to Jonathan Edwards' Treatise on Free Will, devoting himself to the latter with such ardour that for a time he regarded nothing else, being transported by it to a kind of mystical ecstasy. 6. Production and Achievement. Chalmers' first public prayer as a student of divinity was so original and eloquent as to awaken the wonder of all. At sixteen and seventeen he showed a taste and capacity for composition of the most liquid and glowing kind. From a bald style he developed in two years a remarkable turgid manner that afterwards characterised him. The passage with which he thrilled the great convocation in 1843, on the eve of the disruption, was later found to be an exact transcript of one of his student discourses. 7. Evidences of Precocity At the age of three, Chalmers was found pacing up and down in his nursery, repeating to himself the cry of David, O my son Absalom, O Absalom, my son, my son. He began to attend score three. See also 2-6. AIIQ 145, relative quotient of data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. On the completion of his divinity course at the age of 18, and feeling that his knowledge of the world was limited, Charles undertook a tutorship in a large family of high position. But the lack of discipline he found here made his life so unhappy that shortly afterward he gave up the position and became licensed as a probationer by the Presbytery. By the age of 19 and a half, he had preached his first public sermon. His ministerial efforts were approved by his friends, but as he himself still felt a greater interest in mathematics than in theology, he devoted the next two years to the study of natural philosophy at Edinburgh. At that conclusion, after a short period of service as assistant minister, he accepted an assistant professorship of mathematics at St Andrews. As a teacher, he kindled the enthusiasm of his students for mathematical science. His demonstrations in geometry were complete and beautiful, and he had the happy faculty of associating this subject with other pursuits. At 23, he was ordained minister, but he had little interest in his holy office, and continued to give mathematical lectures at St Andrews. He carried on this work for the next eight years, until the age of 31 he experienced a conversion which caused him thereafter to devote himself exclusively to his ministerial duties. AIIIQ 160, relative coefficient data 0.75. William Ellery Channing, 1780-1842 an American clergyman, writer, and philanthropist, one of the chief founders of American Unitarianism. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing Both of Channing's parents belonged to the best American stock. The father, a Princeton graduate, was a lawyer of ability, a public-spirited citizen, and an active church member. The mother, daughter of a judge and member of Congress, was a woman of quick and versatile mind, simple, generous, and sincere. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Obvious characteristics gave Channing among his playmates the nicknames Little King Pebbin and Peacemaker. He was also called the Little Minister because of his fondness for preaching to the family or young friends assembled for the purpose. From his earliest youth, Channing enjoyed doctrinal discussion, though he hated logic chopping and the dry bones of dogma. He often indulged in lonely rambles, making them occasions for contemplation and uninterrupted thought. Channing himself dated the beginning of his religious life from his thirteenth year, 
from the political discussions of his father and grandfather, he early derived an interest in state and world affairs. At college, his interest in scholastic and intellectual pursuits was strong. World problems attracted him greatly, and he took an active part in student meetings and debating clubs. Channing enjoyed the art of doors. He was fond of animals and had an interest and skill in sports which he retained throughout his college career. 2. Education On account of his mother's poor health, William Ellery began to attend school at a very early age. He was less than five years old, and before he was twelve he attended four schools, of which only the third and fourth were well taught. At home his father and mother joined in training the minds, and disciplining the characters of their children. At the age of twelve, Channing was sent to study for a year under the direction of his uncle, in preparation for entrance to Harvard. At fourteen he passed the entrance examinations, and for the next four years attended the university, living at the homes of his uncle, Chief Justice Dunner. 3. School Standing and Progress In his third school, Channing made rapid progress. He became the teacher's favourite and was extolled as a model for the other children's imitation. At his fourth school he was called patient and diligent, but it was not remarkable for quickness of perception. Because he carefully considered a new subject, and did not answer until he fully understood its meaning, he was even thought dull. With Latin he made no progress at first, but having been initiated into its mysteries by a clerk in his father's office, he made very rapid progress and was soon distinguished for his classical attainments. In mathematical work, of which he was very fond, he was always quick and accurate. Considerateness, reflection and thoroughness characterised Channing at school, so that he was respected by his instructors and admired by his fellows. To his relatives he became the source of great expectations. At college, Channing's ambition was stirred by a keen competition, and his already high standard of scholarship was more than maintained. The university authorities and the students were unanimous in assigning William Ellery to the first rank among his classmates, though he was not superior to all of them in any single study. He was particularly distinguished in Latin history and literature. He was especially fond of philosophy and natural science, and in spite of an absence of any strong leaning in that direction, he excelled in mathematics as well. In written composition and in public exhibitions, he was always the foremost, and so it was no wonder that at the age of sixteen he was one of a small group elected to membership in the speaking club. Young as he was, he was soon chosen president of the club, and the same year he was selected to represent his class as valedictorian. 4. Friends and Associates Alston, the poet-painter, was Channing's boyhood playmate. Story, the distinguished jurist, Tuckerman and Phillips, noted ministers. Willard, professor of Latin at Harvard, and others, were in their college days, and after intimate friends of their admired classmate, Channing, the Harvard professors influenced their pupil, but for the most part, without intimate association. 5. Reading Channing was charmed by the works of Virgil and other classical writers from his first acquaintance with them at or before the age of ten. At college he read the usual Greek and Latin classics, philosophy, history, theology, etc. He so delighted in geometry that his fifth book of Euclid was for him agreeable vacation reading. 6. Production and Achievement, C. 2.3 7. Evidences of Precocity Apparently change not developed with special rapidity, but see also above. AIIQ 145, relative coast of data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Channing continued to be popular at Harvard, and became a leader in politics and debating. But his main interest was in philosophy, and this he gratified by turning to the study of divinity in his last years. His final commencement oration on the present age was notable for its brilliancy, vividness, and eloquence. On leaving Cambridge, aged 18, he went home to make plans. A palpable need for funds led him to accept, for the next two years, the offer of a tutorship from Randolph, U.S. Marshal of Virginia, who had been struck by the lad's intelligence and refinement. In his patron's home, Channing met John Marshall, from whom he learned much, and he associated in spirit with Russell, Godwin, and Mary Wollstonecraft. He was also deeply affected by the wickedness of slavery. At nineteen, as part of his religious preparation, Channing entered on a course of self-discipline. Poor and lonely, but seeking emancipation from himself, he went without sufficient food and clothing, cutting himself off, finally, from the social intercourse he really valued. 
Meanwhile, he stuck to divinity harder than ever, writing searching accounts of his spiritual experiences to his intimate friends. He returned home to Newport at twenty, and there continued to live the life of a recluse, devoting himself to study and self-discipline, while at the same time instructing his brother and a young Randolph. He met and greatly admired Dr. Hopkins. Two years later, Channing was appointed regent at Cambridge, his duties being to maintain order in one of the college buildings. At the university, he studied theology on a carefully thought-out plan, and he shortly began to preach. At 23, he became pastor of the Federal Street Church, while he served thereafter for nearly 40 years. Although he always shunned society, he began early to draw a large congregation by his eloquence, kindness, and generosity. In his 30th year, a large church had to be built to accommodate his following. AIIIQ 150 Relative Coach of Data, 0.75. Georges Jacques Danton, 1759-1794, a celebrated French revolutionist. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing. Danton's father was a procureur, or a small country solicitor. The maternal relatives, for the most part of lower rank than the paternal stock, were shopkeepers or carpenters, but one uncle was a priest. The mother's father was a builder. The mother herself, a woman of interesting personality, guided and governed her family by the strength and sweetness of her character. And after the death of the father, when George Jacks was two and a half, she superintended the training of her children. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Daniel was a spirited scapegrace. In his childhood, he attacked a bull out of resentment, it is said having been cut in the lip by another bull when, in his infancy, he was being suckled by a cow. He had also a serious encounter with some pigs. At school he was the leader of his fellows, inciting them to riot or rebellion, and then haranguing them to peace or for further lengths of insubordination. At the age of twelve he was called anti-superior or republican on account of his militancy against authority, and three years later he led a party of protest against the punishment of a fellow pupil and won his case. It is a notable fact that he never allowed any allusion to be made to this triumph. There is no special mention of Danton's athletic pleasures, except that he was fond of swimming. 2. Education Danton's maternal grandfather was his first teacher. From home instruction, the lad passed some time before he was eight to a damn school, where he learned easily, but found the discipline and constant curbing of his liberty extremely distasteful. His ninth year he was sent to a boys' school, where beside the elements of Latin he learned little except card playing, in which he frequently indulged. It is stated that young Danton usually divided the winnings with the loser, although the stakes were a kind of much coveted cake. As George's Jacks did not appear to grow more sedate with the years, his mother thought to tame him by sending him to a religious institution in Troyes, where he remained for a year. Following this, he was sent to a pension conducted by the Oratorians, where he entered in the third class and remained until his seventeenth year. The curriculum consisted mainly of Latin translation, repetitions of the Acts of the Apostles, and the Catechism. 3. School Standing and Progress Bored by the routine of school, Dana was always idle and often played trant. Nevertheless, his rapid comprehension, which enabled him to acquire instinctively and without reflection, kept him on an equality with the most assiduous. Because of the particular cast of his political and social opinions, his companions called him Catiline. At the ecclesiastical school, his generosity caused a mistake in criticism from the master, which Danton so took to heart that he refused to return for a second year. At his next school, he passed for a good student without any very great effort, and at a curriculum that seemed unimportant and trivial, the only subject that aroused his interest was the history of the Roman Republic. Although he won several prizes, to which, however, he attached little significance, his first year was not highly successful. But at fourteen he was distinguished for his compositions, written in a striking original fashion, and for his energetic discourse, and a little later he finished his work in a blaze of glory by carrying off at the final contest every prize in French discourse, Latin narration and poetry. His escapade at 16, C26, made him a hero among his fellows. 4. Friends and Associates. No specific record. 5. Reading. Danton's independent reading had given him 
at thirteen interests and inclinations diametrically opposed to the requirements of the school he was attending at fourteen his choice of books began to show the taste and judgment of a precious discernment he was turning more and more to the historians and philosophers six production and achievement when he was fourteen his themes which always contained something striking and original began to attract the interest of both pupils and teachers at sixteen danton ran away from school to get first-hand information for a theme by attending the royal coronation and his surprised and delighted master would have given him first place for his production had he not felt it necessary from the point of view of school discipline to punish the taunt seven evidence as a precocity danton's grandfather and later his schoolmates and teachers seemed to regard the lad as a prodigy AIIQ 145, relative cushion of data, 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Danton left school at 17 to study law, and nothing more is known of him until, at 21, he appeared as a solicitor's clerk, earning his board and lodging by the exercise of his pen. He worked hard at his legal studies and occupied his leisure with athletics. Although large and muscular, Danton did not seem to be constitutionally strong. During a long illness, he read, among other works, the Encyclopedia, the writings of the more recent philosophers, Montesquieu made a lasting impression, and volumes of Buffon, Corneille, and Dante. The youth became somewhat of a poet. He possessed a well-stocked library, and he could read Latin, Italian, and English. At the age of 26, Dander was called to the bar, where he rapidly acquired fame by his pleading. His address in the first notable case was highly praised by the publicist Lindgren. Second by the civility of the bar as a whole, he made the protest of an independent spirit in his addresses or pleas. It was in keeping with this aspect of his character that he preferred to plead for the poor against the rich, not seldom returning his fees. AIIIQ 145, relative kosher veda.75 Charles Dickens, 1812 to 1870, a celebrated English novelist and humorist. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 155 1. Family Standing Dickinson's father, a kind-hearted, generous, conscientiousness, but easy-going individual, was originally a clerk in the Navy Pay Office. He fell into financial difficulties, was required to serve a considerable term in the debtor's prison, and finally, after this sad experience, became a parliamentary reporter for one of the London papers. The mother, daughter of lieutenant in the Navy, attempted at one time, but without success, to set up a girls' boarding school. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests A sickly little boy, Dickens was never good at sports, and so he read while the other boys played. If he were sad or in trouble, he consoled himself by impersonating characters in the books he had read, C. 2.5, often imagining the scenes laid in his native Chatham. At an early age, he told stories offhand and sang comic songs, this latter gift earned for him at the age of nine the epithet of prodigy from a boat builder. In the warehouse where he was employed, aged ten to twelve, he was called the young gentleman, although he was as skilful at the manual work carried on there as were his associates. The other employees inveigled him into beguiling the time with older readings, and in return helped him with his work. During the period of his father's imprisonment, young Dickens breakfasted and supped at the prison with his family, collecting there the histories of the different prison debtors, and making out a character and a story for each. Misery did not spoil his native capacity for humorous enjoyment. At school between his thirteenth and fifteenth year, he was full of fun and spirits. His employer recalled that at fifteen and sixteen he took every opportunity for going to a theatre, and that he was not infrequently engaged to play minor parts. 2. Education Charles's mother began when he was four, to teach his son English and the rudiments of Latin, awakening his passion for reading and knowledge. After some months' attendance at a preparatory day school, Charles was entered at a Baptist boarding school. Here he enjoyed especially the dramas enacted by the boys on the playground. When Charles was in his tenth year, the family moved to the poorest part of London. Here he was not sent to school, but he learned to observe and evaluate the people he met, and to know poverty. After his father had been cast into prison for debt, Charles worked in a blacking warehouse, a crazy, tumbled-down old building overrun with rats. The older Dickens was released from prison by a legacy when his son was twelve, and now he was able to send the boy to Wellington House, a school of some celebrity, 
which Charles attended for two years. 3. School Stanley and Progress The master of his second school pronounced Dickens, aged 7 to 9, a boy of capacity, but at Wellington House Academy, between 12 and 14 years of age, although he may have done his task well enough, he showed no indication of future literary ability. 4. Friends and Associates In the Blacking Warehouse, Bob Fagan was one of Dickens' co-workers, and the picture of this character was so stamped upon the boy's mind that he could reproduce it in detail years later. When the Dickens family moved to the prison, Charles lodged with Mrs. Pipchin, and again a lasting imprint of personality was made. 5. Reading Before he was seven years old, Dickens was reading such books as Roderick Random, Peregrine Pickle, Humphrey Clicker, Tom Jones, The Vicar of Wakefield, Don Quixote, Gil Blas, and Robinson Crusoe. Between seven and nine, he read The Spectator, Tatler, Idler, Citizen of the World, and Mrs. Inchbold's Collection of Farces. At nine, he read Scottish Chiefs, Hobbian's Dance of Death, and Coleman's Bold Grins. Out of his scanty weekly earnings, Dickens, aged ten to twelve, paid his board and bought in addition a cheap periodical, The Portfolio. When he was 15 or 16, he educated himself through a city set tennis in the British Museum reading room. 6. Production and Achievement Before he was seven, Dickens wrote a tragedy, Mistar, founded on one of the tales of the Genie. At nine, he wrote, in secret, sketches of an old deaf woman and an old barber. When he was at school and between 12 and 14 years old, he wrote small tales, led in theatricals among the boys, headed the gang in impersonating beggars, and inventing a lingo by speaking which he and the others hoped to be considered foreigners. A note to a classmate written when he was 13 shows his interest in romance and also his humour. For his first employment in the warehouse, Dickens received six or seven shillings a week. At 15 he became a clerk in an attorney's office, beginning at 13 shillings, six pennies, and being gradually increased to 15 shillings. His employer recalled him as a bright, clever-looking youth. 7. Evidences of Precocity, C2, 135 and 6. AIIQ 145, relative quotient of data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 and 26. At 17, Dickens became a reporter in one of the London law offices and continued for two years in this capacity until at 19, he became a parliamentary reporter, soon noted for his excellent work. When he was 21, his first published work, a short literary sketch, appeared and this was soon followed by sketches by Boz. At the age of 24, Dickens ceased his parliamentary reporting, married, and commenced to publish Pickwick Papers by installments. The novel acquired a merely popularity and has never failed to have a wide circle of admirers. Oliver Twist was also started about this time, and Dickens tried his hand at writing for the stage as well. Part of the next year, his 26th, he spent journeying abroad with his wife, in the novels written at this time, and even in the early ones, Dickens showed a remarkable talent for portraying the oddities of life in masterly fashion. AIIQ 155, Relative Coach of Data 0.53 Benjamin Disraeli, 1804 or 1881, Prime Minister of England and author. AIIQ 145, AIIQ 150 There is a difference of one year between two alleged dates of Disraeli's birth, the correct date is probably 1804 and not 1805. 1. Family standing. Disraeli's paternal ancestors were Jews from Spain or Italy. The grandfather was a merchant who left a large fortune to his son, Disraeli's father, a literateur of great popularity in his day. The mother seems to have belonged to an English Jewish family of some standing. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Disraeli was remembered at school as a big, kind boy who told stories of robbers in caves and illustrated them with rough pencil sketches. He was a very rapid reader, was fond of romances, was very fond of playing at horses, always full of fun, and when he went home in the Blackheath coach, fired away at the passers-by with his pea-shooter. On a wet day, he would amuse his companions with a little extemporized drama. At school, he took the part of Gratiano in The Merchant of Venice, but failed, it is said, to win applause. In the holidays, he was fond of playing at Parliament, and always reserved for himself the part of leader and spokesman of the government. His schoolmates considered him Toryish in politics. It is reported that he had a taste, not uncommon among schoolboys, for little acts of bargaining and merchandise. 2. Education 
Disraeli was brought up in the Jewish faith, but at six or earlier he attended the school of a liberal independent Protestant minister, and at twelve was baptized into the Church of England. At about thirteen he was transferred to a school in Epping Forest, where he continued two, three or four years under the direction of Kogan, the master of the school, a Unitarian minister and a noted Greek scholar. At fifteen or sixteen Disraeli left school and continued his education at home until he was seventeen. 3. School study and progress. Disraeli says, I was quite fit to have gone to a university when I left Kogan. Not so that I was more advanced than the other boys of my age. Not so advanced, never could reach the first class. Though I was not eminent, even in the second class, I read a great deal. 4. Friends and associates. No specific record. 5. Reading. At Kogan's school, Disraeli read in Greek. Herodotus, Thucydides, some of the Iliad, the Odyssey, Sophocles, Euripides, Theocritus, and Xenophon. In Latin he read Cicero, Caesar, much of Livy, something of Tacitus, all of Virgil and Horace, some of the best things of Catullus, the first book of Lucretius, and all of Terence. Six Production and Achievement A diary kept when Disraeli was fifteen shows a precocity of mind, a readiness to appraise and criticise, and a confidence in passing judgments on varied literary matters. 7. Evidence of Precocity, C26. AIIQ 145, Relative Coast of Data, 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 17, Disraeli was attached to a firm of London solicitors as a kind of private secretary. At home, he studied deeply, reading classics, philosophy, and law. In his 20th year, he made a short tour of Europe with his father, and his letters to his sisters, written at this time, are as conspicuous for their descriptive power as for a somewhat florid style. Having decided about this time not to become a lawyer, he devoted the next year or two to writing. He published articles and pamphlets, and in 1826, when he was 21, Vivian Gray appeared and met with immediate popular approval. In the following year, its sequel was published, but with what success is not stated. Reversing his previous decision, Disraeli now resumed the study of law at Lincoln's Inn, but a little later had the misfortune to suffer a severe illness. He made a perfect physical recovery, but becoming very disappointed, he felt that a great reputation was alone capable of giving him pleasure, and he doubted that this was in his capacity to attain. In the meantime, he was not idle. At 23, he published The Voyage of Captain Popanilla. At 25, The Young Duke. AII IQ 150, Relief Coach of Data, 0 0.60. Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803-1882 an American lecturer, essayist and poet. AIIQ 145, AIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing Emerson was descended from a long line of ministers of energetic Puritan stock. His father, a theologian of liberal views, was a minister of a Harvard village church and later of the first church, Boston. He was the author of a number of sermons, discourses and hymns, and the editor of the monthly anthology, his name is associated with the foundering of well-known libraries and of historical, physiological, and philosophical societies. It is reported of the mother's father that he was a man of great firmness of character and sound practical wisdom. Her own mind and character were of a superior order. Her sensible and kindly speech was always as good as the best instruction. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Emerson's main recreation early and late was in omnivorous reading, C. 2.5. He was not demonstrative enough to be popular with other boys, nor did he often emerge in their plays. At 14, he learned to skate, rhymed, wrote, and read, besides his stable commodity, schoolkeeping. At 15, he gave private instruction, but found it very irksome. It was at this age, and during his sophomore year at Harvard, that he became the leading spirit in a little book club. 2. Education Emerson's education began at a dame school before he had reached the age of three, continued by a brief attendance at grammar school, and was followed then by four years at the Boston Latin School. While a pupil in the latter institution, aged 10 to 14, he also had private instruction for two hours a day in writing and ciphering. Before he was quite 14 and a half, he matriculated Harvard, where he graduated A.B. four years later. 3. School standing and progress A week before young Emerson's third birthday, his father recorded that he did not read very well, 
but the lad progressed in favour from that time, so that during his last year at the Latin school some of these themes were kept by a delighted master to show to the school committee. The lad was always a good scholar, because honestly studious but not eminent. Up to the age of fourteen the study of all subjects except mathematics, in which he was always dull, was no hardship to him. During the last term of his freshman year at college, and thereafter, during his sixteenth year, he was private tutor to Samuel Kirkland Lothrop, two years younger than himself. In his junior year, having qualified as a worthy and deserving student, he received two stipends, four friends and associates. Before he was ten, Emerson had made two friends for life, William H. Furness and Samuel Bradford. The two Emerson brothers, Ralph Waldo and William, who was two years his senior, were from their earliest years especially devoted and congenial companions. 5. Reading When nearly ten, Emerson wrote characteristically in a letter to his aunt, I have from about a quarter after seven till eight to play or read. I think I am rather inclined to the former. After supper we take our turns in reading Roland. At twelve he had begun Telemachus in French at school, and at home was reading Priestley's Lectures on History. At thirteen, Ralph Waldo read French books with his brother, and before his fifteen he had read omnivorously in all the available works of history, fiction, and poetry. Especially did he and his brother delight in fine rhetoric and eloquent passages. Emerson was fascinated by the two sceptics, Montaigne and Pascal. At college, history, memoirs, English views, and the poetry of the day, which he criticised in his notebooks, were most prominent in his reading. 6. Production and Achievement At the age of ten, Emerson wrote the history of Fortis, a chivalric poem in one volume, complete with notes, critical and explanatory, by R. W. Emerson, LLD. The notes were not added until three years later. William Furness contributed engraved illustrations. Emerson wrote occasional verses celebrating the powers of American frigates in the War of 1812, and in his last school year, aged 13 and 14, he more than once delivered original poems on exhibition days. When his family left Concord, he, aged about 11, recited an original ode by way of farewell. At college, aged 15, he received two marks on the back of his critical discussion of Guillaume le Concordant, which distinction only six of the class obtained. In the winters during his college course, Emerson tried school teaching, but he had no taste for it. See also 2-3. 7. Evidences of Precocity A letter written to his aunt, when he was not quite ten, is a model of precise cultivated expression. As a boy of eleven in Concord, Emerson entertained the frequenters of the grocery store with recitations of poetry, and before he was fourteen, he was noted among grown people who were apt to be fond of him. See also 2, 3, 5, and 6. AIIQ 145, relief coast of data, 0.75. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the commencement exercises at Harvard, Emerson had a part, and he was also class day poet, his production receiving the praise superior to expectation. Between the age of 18 and 20, he assisted his brother by teaching in a school for young ladies in Boston, and the next year, aged 21, while his brother was in Europe, he had sole charge of the school. At this same period, he was writing thoughts on morals, on laws of compensation, and on individual genius. When nearly 22, Emerson went to Cambridge to study divinity, but was shortly obliged to leave the university on account of sickness. A year of teaching in various schools followed. Approbated to preach at 23, he was obliged to go south for his health. Emerson had preached his first sermon at 22. At 24, he occasionally supplied pulpits in Massachusetts, and at 25, he entered Divinity Hall, Harvard, where he spent the year studying and reading while regaining his health. Late in the year, he received a call to become assistant pastor in the Second Church in Boston. He became engaged to be married the same year. AIIQ 145, relative coach of data 0.75. Francois de Salignac, de la Moth Fenelon. 1651-1715, a French prelate, orator and author. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family standing. The father of Fenelon belonged to an ancient and distinguished family, which had produced many statesmen and ambassadors, but in more recent times had become impoverished. Fenelon's mother was also of noble birth. 2. Development of age 17. 
1. Interests. None are recorded aside from his studies. 2. Education. Fenelon was educated at home under a tutor until he reached the age of 12. His father was tireless in his attention to the boy's training, whether physical, mental or moral. His mother also is said to have exercised a great influence over his childhood. The boy's first education was religious, probably enriched with classical literature and a knowledge of antiquity. At 12, and just as Fenelon entered the University of Cahors, at that time a celebrated school, his father died, by the direction of his education being assumed by his uncle, the Marquise de Fenelon. The boy's plan of study was unaltered. He received the degree in arts at Cahors at the age of 15, and thereafter attended school in Paris at the University of Plessis for two years. 3. School study and progress. Fenelon had a lively intelligence, which was stimulated at home by instructive conversations, his sensitive spirit meeting their only tenderness and understanding. His unusual talents were early recognised by his family, and his early training was well adapted to his particular needs. So thorough was his first instruction that when, at twelve, he entered the University of Cahors, he knew Greek perfectly and wrote both French and Latin with ease and elegance. 4. Friends and Associates None are recorded apart from his family. 5. Reading At twelve, Fenelon had read the works of the ancient poets, philosophers and orators, and already attempted some reproductions. 6. Reduction and Achievement C. 2.5 7. Evidence of precocity. No further record. AIIQ 145. Relief coefficient of data. 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Fenelon entered St. Sulpice at the age of 17 and remained there 10 years in perfect happiness. The church was his true vocation and he was devoted to his teacher, with whom he worked in perfect concord. After receiving orders, Fenelon at 24 desired to do religious mission work, first in Canada and later in the Levant but in both instances he was dissuaded by poor health and the wishes of his family. At 24 he was given charge of the parish at St. Sulpice, and three years later, at 27, he was appointed superior of a community for young women, a position for which he was peculiarly fitted by gentleness, grace, good sense, and elegant and ornate fluency of speech. AIIIQ 145, the left coast of data, 0.20. Johann Gottlieb Fitch, 1762-1814, a celebrated German metaphysician. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 155. 1. Family Standing Fitch's father was a linen ribbon weaver and merchant of simple but upright village stock. The mother, the daughter of a wealthy linen spinner, who felt that she had married beneath her rank, was a more forceful character than her husband and more intense the head of the household. She designed her elder son for the ministry. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. From an early age, Fitch was fond of solitary walks and quiet contemplation. Under his father's tuition, he became an eager scholar. At Shalfura, he was a zealous student. 2. Education. Fitch's first lessons were given by his father, who instructed him in reading, told him stories of his own early experiences, and taught him hymns and proverbs. The pastor also gave Fitch some instruction. The Freerer von Militz, apparently a person of some importance in that region, heard of the village boy with a remarkable memory, and determined, with the consent of the parents, which he obtained with difficulty, to take the boy away and bring him up as his own child. After a few months in the gloomy castle, at the age of eight or nine, Fitch was sent for his more adequate instruction to a village clergyman to whom he became deeply attached and who educated him somewhat unsystematically until his twelfth year. From his kind country mentor, the boy was now sent on by the Freer, first to the town school at Mason, and perhaps a year later, to the famous Schubforta, where he remained until he was eighteen. Soon after his arrival at the last named academy, he attempted to run away because of the bullying he had received, but later he found life more supportable. 3. School standing and progress. Under the care of the clergyman, and when the child was between 8 or 9 and 11, he made such rapid progress that his instructor soon found his own learning insufficient for the boy's further training. At Schopfurter, he was not incapable in his studies, and he soon overcame, by industry, the defects of his previous unsystematic education. 4. Friends and Associates. The pastor of his native village, the Freire von Militz, 
the clergyman who educated him, a student advisor at Schlapforter, later a distinguished divine, interested themselves in fish and edited his progress. 5. Reading At seven the little lad received, as a present from his father, the story of Siegfried, which so absorbed his interest that he neglected his duties. Reproved, he decided to remove temptation by throwing the book in a stream. Afterward, filled with remorse and regret at his apparent ingratitude, he wept, and his father punished him for destroying his gift. Nevertheless, the boy refused to accept a second copy of the book, which was offered him. 6. Production and Achievement A letter written at 13 reports his expectation of receiving a very good school report. 7. Evidences of Precocity Fitch early, before 7, mastered his Bible and Catechism, and he even read the morning and evening prayers to the family circle. The village pastor perceived that the boy had unusual powers, noting particularly a remarkable memory which enabled the eight or nine-year-old lad to repeat the whole of the sermon, arranged by heads and with the illustrative texts. AIQ 145, relative kosher data 0.53. 3. Development from 17 and 26. Fitch left his school at 18, having found the latter years there more agreeable than the earlier period. Fairly well read and with a good scholastic record, he entered the University of Jena as a theological student. For the next three years, in miserably poor circumstances, he continued his studies at Jena and Leipzig, turning gradually from the study of theology to that of philosophy. At 22, he became a tutor, but owing to his unrelieved poverty, suffered a precarious existence for the next four years. He still managed to carry on some study, however, and retained his ambition to become a village pastor, although unable to obtain financial help in order to complete his theological studies. When offered a tutorship at Zurich, he accepted, aged 26, and set out on the journey to Switzerland on foot, lacking sufficient means for any other form of travel. AIIQ 155, relative coach to data 0.75. Charles James Fox 1749 to 1806, a celebrated English statesman and orator. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing. Fox's grandfather rose from a humble origin to positions of trust and distinction under Charles II. Fox's father was a man of great parts, loose morals, more fond of money than of power, an able debater, a corrupt politician who held the offices of Secretary of State and Paymaster of the Forces, and won a title and a peerage. Hated by all England, he was adored in his own household. Fox's mother had been Lady Caroline Lennox, daughter of the Duke of Richmond, a charming and noble lady. She married the Earl of Fox against her father's will. 2. Development towards 17. 1. Interests. Fox was as eager in study as in social life. See 2. 2, 3, 4, and 5. 2. Education. After early home instruction, the boy was sent, at the age of seven, and at his own request, to a school at Wandsworth, then much in vogue among the aristocracy. At nine, he determined to go to Eton, and to Eton he accordingly went. Although the family were still concerned for his health at this time because he had been a frail boy. When Charles James was fourteen and a half, his father took him to Europe on a round of idleness and dissipation, taking not a little pains to contrive that the boy should leave France a finished wreck. After four months of life abroad, the boy persuaded his father to send him back to Eton. There he passed another year with more advantage to himself than to the school. At fifteen he was sent to Oxford, where he read a great deal, particularly mathematics, and where he remained, except for an interval during which he made a trip to Paris, until he was seventeen. 3. School standing and progress At Eton, Fox aged 9 to 15, appears to have been a diligent scholar. During his last year, his rhetorical training was especially emphasised, and, with his repertory of favourite passages from the dramatists and his passion for an argument, he was always on the fore, both in the speech room and in the debating society. His schoolboy oratory had been commemorated in verse by Lord Carlyle. After hearing his son speak at Eton, the older fox thought it worthwhile to bring Charles James, aged 15, to town to attend parliamentary debates. At Oxford, the youth, aged 15 and 17, studied hard in spite of his father's indulgence, and his application to work impressed even his tutor, to such a degree, in fact, that his college associates were held back in their studies during his absence to Paris to proceed with him on his return. 4. Friends and Associates 
A Deton Fox, although saddled with the encumbrance of a private tutor, was highly popular among his schoolfellows. There was that about him which every one made him the king of his company, without effort on his own part, or jealousy on the part of others. 5. Reading Fox mentions that his reading at Eton was principally continued to the Eton books of extracts. At Oxford, he read widely and enjoyed what he read. He learned to read the Greek and Latin poets with facility, and became familiar with French and Italian literature. During the long vacation when he was 16, Fox remained at Oxford, continuing his study. He said that there was no play extant, written and published before the Restoration, that he had not read attentively. 6. Reduction and Achievement Two very polished, elegiac exercises in Latin, written during his last years at Eton and before he was 16, are preserved. While French verses written at 15 attest his facility with that language. He was, in his middle teens, a youth of ability, endowed with generally recognised good sense and good nature. 7. Evidences of Precocity as a child, he was remarkable for the quickness of his parts, his engaging disposition, and early intelligence. When hardly two and a half, he was recognised as a clever little boy, and soon after as the superior of his older brother, he was at once the most forward and most engaging of small creatures. His father worshipped him from the first. The father wrote thus of his son, aged seven, I found Charles very well, very pert, very argumentative. He has all life, spirits, motion, and good humour. Stage mad, but it makes him read a good deal. The boy, although humoured in every whim, learned to control his passionate temper from hearing his father say that he was a sensible little boy and would cure himself. An unlucky slip made by his mother in answering our question on Roman history settled once and forever her claims as an instructress of her irrepressible son. The boy's sagacity, when he was no more than thirteen, was noticed by the Duke of Devonshire. AIIQ 145, relative quotient data 0.75. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Leaving Oxford at 17, Fox spent the next two years on the continent enjoying a life of dissipation. The only intellectual gain he seems to have made there was in acquiring knowledge and taste for the Italian language and literature. On his return, age 20, he found that, through his father's influence, he had been for half a year or so Member of Parliament for the Pocket Borough of Mindhurst. He accordingly commenced a regular attendance at the famous assembly of which, for the next 29 years, he was constantly to be a member. Gradually his speeches made an impression, and at 23 he was appointed to a junior cabinet position, but he was dismissed from it two years later for two liberal views. From this time, however, he seems to have blended sincere thought with forceful discussion, and may be said to have commenced his parliamentary career in earnest. His vice at this time was gambling, and so strong was the passion that fortune and influence alike were weakened. Gibbon states that on one occasion he lost eleven thousand pounds in twenty-two hours' pay. AIIIQ one hundred and forty-five relative quotient of data point seven five. End of section twenty-six. Section twenty-seven of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume Two. The Early Mental Traits of Three Hundred Geniuses by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 18 Cases Rated at AIIQ 140 to 150, Part 4. Benjamin Franklin, 1706 to 1790, an American diplomat, statesman, and scientist. AIIQ 145. AIIIQ 145 1. Family Standing The Franklins were originally Smiths in a Northampton village. Benjamin's father, an ingenious man of many talents, endowed with sound understanding and solid judgment, had been bred at Dyer, but became a tallow chandler and a soap boiler. He emigrated to America. Franklin's mother was a daughter of a godly learned Englishman who was something of a poet. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests. Franklin was fond of the water, at an early age became an excellent swimmer, and a skilful navigator of small boats. He was chosen captain of boating expeditions, and was often the leader in other enterprises. He was apt also to make ingenious inventions, such as pallets for rapid swimming, or a kite for accelerating progress through the water. At fifteen, his reading of theological works produced doubts in his mind as to religious doctrine. 
but he continued to read and study both religious and secular works, at night, early in the mornings, and on Sundays. He also gratified his love of debate by arguments with a bookish friend. 2. Education At the age of eight, Franklin was sent to the grammar school, for his father intended him for the church. By the end of the year, he was withdrawn because the expensive training was too great. At nine, he was sent to a school where writing and arithmetic were taught. From the age of ten to twelve, he was apprenticed to his father to learn soap and candle making, but he disliked the trade, and was only, with difficulty, dissuaded by his father from going to sea. The older Franklin took his son to see joiners, turners, and other tradesmen at their work, hoping to interest him in some trade. At the age of twelve, Franklin was apprenticed to a cutler, but a little later, recognising his bookish proclivities, his father determined to make him a printer. 3. School Standing in Progress Franklin's early readiness in learning to read, for he could not remember the time when he could not read, and the opinion of his friends that this boy would certainly make a good scholar, encouraged the father to continue his son's education. At school, Franklin, aged 8 to 9, rose from the middle of the class of that year to be its head. He then skipped one class and was promoted to the third. Franklin states that at his second school, he made progress in writing, but failed in arithmetic. Ashamed of his ignorance in the latter subject, he determined, at sixteen, to master it once for all. He proceeded to go through an arithmetic and two books of navigation, and this with ease, and learned also the geometry they contained. 4. Friends and Associates John Collins, a studious boy, was Franklin's associate in discussion and argument. 5. Reading an uncle proposed to give Franklin all his shorthand volumes of sermons if the boy would learn his character, and this he accordingly did. At an early age, Franklin was fond of books. He read Pilgrim's Progress, and bought, for his own use, Bunyan's works in little volumes, which, however, he later sold to buy Burton's historical collections. In his father's library, he read works on theology, Plutarch's Lives, Defoe's Essays on Projects, and Mather's Essays to Do Good. During his period of apprenticeship to his brother Franklin, aged 12 to 16, had access to better books than before, notably in the library of Mr. Matthew Adams, and he often sat up the greater part of the night reading. From his careful reading of refutations of the teaching of the deists, Franklin became convinced of the deist position. From a study of the third volume of The Spectator, he evolved a method of learning the art of prose writing. At 16 he read Locke on the Human Understanding, Pascal's Provincial Letters, The Art of Thinking, and most of the works of Cabanus in translation, which delighted him. He studied an English grammar, read Xenophon's memorable things of Socrates, and adopted the Socratic method in argument. He also read Shaftesbury and Collins. He saved enough by boarding himself to buy books, and he reserved the dinner hour for study. 6. Production and Achievement While apprenticed to his brother, Franklin attained great proficiency as a printer's assistant. At fifteen, he took a fancy to poetry, and encouraged by his brother, wrote little verses. The Lighthouse Tragedy and the Sailor's Song on the Taking of a Notorious Pirate were produced at this time. The former, printed and sold about town, had a great vogue, but in spite of this, the young poet was turned from verse writing by the ridicule of his father. Anonymous contributions to his brother's paper were, however, accepted and inserted. In disputation and argument, Franklin developed such skill that few could not stand against him. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No further record. AIIQ 145. Relative quotient data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. When Benjamin was 17, his brother was committed to prison for political writings, and the younger man assumed charge of the newspaper. Shortly afterward, a fortunate accident gave young Franklin a chance to escape from his indentures, and he went to New York and thence, later, to Philadelphia. He reached the latter town in poverty, but soon secured employment as a printer's assistant. His talents attracted the attention of the governor, and soon, through his patronage, Benjamin achieved comfort and affluence. The governor offered to set him up in an independent business, and Franklin spent the next 18 months in England in preparation for a career as a printer. In England, he secured employment in a printing house, and soon had a high reputation as a workman. Shortly afterward, he published a metaphysical pamphlet, and this was a means of introducing him to many interesting people. He was noted too for his skill in swimming, and won quite a vogue as a swimming teacher. At twenty, Franklin returned home to Philadelphia to his own business, and here he showed 
his inventive capacity by making on occasion both type and ink. Owing to his great skill, he was invited by his former master to return to the old business in order to assist in filling a government order for printing paper money. Franklin soon became associated with prominent local men, such as members of the assembly and judges, and he founded a debating society. By the time he was 24, his printing business had supplanted those of his competitors, and now by means of an article of his own, on the nature and necessity of paper currency, he received a large order to print the currency, which was voted shortly after. At 25, he established one of the first circulating libraries, and in the following year published the first volume of Paul Richard, which proved to be a great success. AIIIQ 145, relative quotient data point six zero. Galileo Galilei, 1564-1642, to 1642, a famous Italian physicist and astronomer. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 165. 1. Family Standing Galileo was descended from a noble Florentine family, long and honourably connected with the governing bodies of the Republic. His father, Vincenzino, a businessman of scanty income, was well endowed intellectually. His published works on music show evidence of great knowledge and laborious research, in a spirit of inquiry independent of authority and tradition. There is no record of Galileo's mother beyond her name. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Young Galileo's favourite pastime was the construction of ingenious toy machines, but he had taste and skill in artistic as well as practical pursuits. He was a creditable performer on several musical instruments, among which the lute was his favourite. He showed considerable skill in drawing and painting, and thought, at one time, of becoming a painter, and he was also very fond of poetry. While engaged in study in the Vellombrosa Monastery, the religious life of the church appeared so attractive to him that he became a novitiate of that order. 2. Education Until the age of twelve, Galileo received his education partially in the school of Jacobo Borghini and partially at home, where his father, who had an extensive knowledge of Greek and Latin literature, helped him in lessons in these languages. He was sent to the far-famed monastery of Vellombrosa for the regulatory education of a well-born youth. There he studied Greek and Latin readily, but showed little taste for logic. His father removed him at fifteen to make of him a cloth dealer, but soon selected a scientific career as more fitted to the son's superior abilities. Medicine was chosen as a remunerative branch, and at seventeen, Galileo was sent to the University of Pisa to take the medical course. 3. School standing in progress from his early boyhood, Galileo was remarkable for intellectual aptitude of various kinds. 4. Friends and Associates His reputation as a draughtsman and colorist brought several artists to him, seeking his criticism of their work. Sigourley once said that Galileo alone had been his teacher in perspective. 5. Reading Galileo was very fond of poetry. 6. Production and Achievement as a boy, he showed considerable mechanical inventiveness. His father taught him the theory and practice of music, and the boy became so skillful with the lute that he excelled his father in charm of style and delicacy of touch. 7. Evidences of Precocity. No further record. AIIQ 145, relative quotient of data, 0. 0.53. 3. Development from 17 and 26. Galileo's teacher of medicine at Pisa was a celebrated physician and botanist, Andrea Cesalpino. Galileo never had a relish for the subject of his study, and after nearly four years left the university without taking the doctor's degree. In the philosophical classes, he tried to understand and often dared to contradict an unheard of audacity in one so young. When 18, one day in the cathedral of Pisa, so the story goes, his attention became attracted to the swinging lamp, and he observed that the oscillations, gradually becoming less and less in amplitude, were all performed in the same time, as proved by his pulse. On this principle, he constructed an instrument called Palsilogia, which long remained in general use by physicians. Galileo first learnt mathematics at 19 on becoming acquainted with Ricci, an able mathematician and tutor to the Grand Ducal Pages. Soon he became interested in the study of Euclid, and he devoted himself, heart and soul, to mathematics to the exclusion of medicine. At 22, he constructed the hydrostatic balance. An essay on the centre of gravity in solid bodies brought him fame throughout Italy, but his applications for the chair of mathematics at Bologna and Padua 
and at Pisa were met with no success until he was twenty-five, when he became professor of mathematics at Pisa. About this time he discovered the cycloid. The results of his researches in motion were given in his treatise De Montu Grevium, written when its author was twenty-six. AIIIQ 165, relative cost of data 0 0.60. Edward Gibbon, 1737-1794, a famous English historian. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 155. 1. Family Standing. Gibbon's paternal grandfather was a man of high ability as a master of commerce and a financier, who made two fortunes and lost one. The father was a well-educated but a weak and impulsive individual who moved gracefully in the highest circles of society and lived always beyond his means. The mother, daughter of a merchant, was a mirable lady of elegant manners and many talents, whose energy was chiefly devoted to checking her husband's excesses. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Want of physical strength disqualified little Gibbon from athletic sports, and so at an early age he became a great reader. At thirteen, an interest in history was aroused and became all-absorbing. C. 2.5 At sixteen, Gibbon was converted to Catholicism by reading Bosset, and on his own initiative was received into the Catholic Church. His act amounted at that time to high treason, and the gates of Oxford were closed to him as a Catholic forever. From childhood he had been fond of religious disputation, and at Oxford idleness drove him back to it again. 2. Education because of his frail health, the training of Gibbon's mind had to be neglected for the culture of his body. Nevertheless, instruction was not entirely omitted. His first schooling was received from his aunt, an able woman of excellent gifts. From the age of seven to eight and a half, he was instructed by a tutor in arithmetic and the rudiments of English and Latin. At the age of nine, as his health was improved, he was sent for a time to a boy's school, and here the tumult at first almost overwhelmed the timid lad. At ten or eleven, on the death of his mother, he left this school and resided for a time with his admirable aunt. He then entered Westminster School, where he had remained for two years. From thirteen to fifteen, while undergoing treatment for a strange nervous difficulty, he had tutors with whom, when he was free from pain, he read such of the classical writers as attracted him. Recovering his health, he was sent at fifteen to boarding school, but his tutor gave him no instruction. The same year he matriculated Oxford, where he spent fourteen months idly and unprofitably. His seventeenth year passed in exile in Switzerland, while a Swiss Calvinist pastor fulfilled two duties laid upon him by Gibbon's relatives. He superintended the young man's studies and reconverted him to Protestantism. Study in Lausanne during the next four years laid a large part of the foundation of Gibbon's extensive learning. 3. School Standing and Progress at Westminster School, Gibbon had, at the age of 13, climbed to the third form. At Oxford, he was bored by the dull and inferior atmosphere, and so he spent most of his days there in travel about the country or in desultory study. 4. Friends and Associates Gibbon was shy, and the only associate or friends reported before he was 17 were his parents, his aunt and his tutors. At college, he stood coldly aloof from his fellow students and their gaiety, preferring the companionship of his tutor. 5. Reading at nine, Gibbon studied Praedrus and Nepos, and was acquainted with Popes Homer and the Arabian Nights. At the age of nine, ten, or eleven, he read Dryden's Virgil, Ovid's Metamorphosis, and many volumes of English poetry, romance, history, and travel. During the period of ill health, from his fourteenth to his sixteenth year, he was comforted by wide but desultory reading, especially in ancient, modern, and universal history. In his fifteenth year, he stumbled on Oriental history, and before he was sixteen, he had read everything he could find in English on the subject. 6. Production and Achievement At the age of fifteen, Gibbon made his first known attempt at writing history, an unfinished but ingenious essay titled The Age of Cecilius, in which he reported an investigation concerning the probable date of the life and reign of the conqueror of Asia. 7. Evidences of Precocity in childhood, Gibbon was praised for his readiness with which he could multiply and divide, by memory alone, two whole sums of several figures. His innate rising curiosity made him old beyond his years and removed, when he was ten or eleven, all distance between him and his aunt, so that they conversed on every topic, familiar or obtruse. Sometime between fourteen and sixteen, Gibbon attempted to weigh the various systems of calculating time, and his sleep is said to have been disturbed at this period by the difficulty of reconciling the 
Septuagint with the Hebrew computation. When Gibbon entered Oxford at fifteen, his stock of erudition might have puzzled a doctor, while of his ignorance a schoolboy would have been ashamed. The other gentlemen commoners who were disposed to laugh at Gibbon were told by his tutor that, were their heads all scooped, Gibbon had brains enough to fill them all. AIIQ 145, relative coefficient data 0 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Gibbon spent five years, aged 16 to 21, at Lausanne, Switzerland, where he became, in point of view, a continental European. While French became the natural language of his thought and expression, he studied systematically and thoroughly both the Latin and Greek classics. After a love affair at 20, he returned to England. At 22, he was commissioned captain in the militia and spent the next three years in military service. Years which, although extremely distasteful, were of great service to him later as an historian. At 24, he published his essay on the study of literature. At about this time, it is recorded that he read in Homer about a book a week, this being apparently the first reading of the Greek classic in the original. Gibbon was freed from further military service by the disbanding of the militia when he was 25, and soon after he took advantage of the opportunity to undertake another continental journey. AIIQ 155, relief coaching data 0.53. Sir William Herschel, 1738 to 1822, a celebrated English astronomer of German birth. AIIQ 145, AIIQ 140. One family standing. The Herschel family had been driven from Moravia because of their steadfast Protestantism. William's grandfather, the son of a brewer, was a landscape gardener of versatile gifts who had acquired some distinction in the service of the King of Saxony. The father was intended for the same occupation, but having no interest in it, and being possessed of a gift for music, he studied the art and became oboe player in the Hanoverian Guards. A man of high talent and wide culture, he was, because of his limited and specialised training, never in other than stratified circumstances. It was therefore his wish that his children should have the general education that he had lacked. The mother, a typical horsefrau, believed the sorrows of the family were the result of too much education, and she favoured and petted her less able children at the expense of the more gifted. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Before he was 14, and out of school hours, William Herschel attempted to learn what his master knew of Latin and arithmetic. His insatiable desire for knowledge, thus early awakened, resulted in a steadfast resolve to devote himself to study and so on. Although he loved music exceedingly, he determined to devote every spare moment to increasing his knowledge of science and literature, in which he expected to find his future happiness. Lively discussions on philosophical questions often kept the boy and his father from sleep all night, and young William would frequently continue in a discourse with his brother, with ardent interest on his part, until his less enthusiastic companion was fast asleep. 2. Education Herschel was taught to play a violin as soon as he was able to hold one. At the age of four, he was sent on a table to render a solo on a diminutive instrument especially made for him. At an early age, he was sent to school to learn the three R's, and a little later, French and English. In order that he might acquire a perfect knowledge of the theory, as well as the practice of music, he was early set to study mathematics in all its branches, algebra, conic sections, infinitesimal analysis, and the rest. In the army from his 15th to his 20th year, he had an opportunity for improving his knowledge of music, and also for increasing his acquaintance with French. Seeing his pupil's interest, the French teacher did not confine instruction to the grammar and vocals only, but encouraged the taste he found for the study of philosophy, especially logic, ethics and metaphysics, and these subjects became Herschel's favourite pursuits. 3. School Standing and Progress At school, Herschel's splendid talents early displayed themselves, and the teacher soon confessed that the pupil had got beyond his master. The boy readily learned every task assigned, and soon arrived at such a degree of perfection, especially in arithmetic, that the head of the school made use of him as an assistant in instruction to hear the younger boys say their lessons, and to examine their arithmetical calculations. Although William was four years younger than his brother Jacob, when the two brothers had lessons in French, the younger mastered the language in half the time required by the older. 4. Friends and Associates Teachers and members of the family are the only associates mentioned. 5. Reading. No specific record. 6. Production and achievement. At the age of 14, Herschel was an excellent performer on the oboe and violin, and at 14 and a half he became organist in the regiment band, a position which he held until he was 19. 
His talent in playing both instruments was marked. He won expressions of approval when playing before his general. At 16, he was frequently introduced as a solo performer and assistant in the court orchestra. Herschel had a gift of manual dexterity, and with his father, frequently contrived self-made mathematical instruments, such as a neatly tuned four-inch globe upon which he had engraved the equator and ecliptic. 7. Evidences of precocity. C2, 2, 3, and 6. AIIQ 145, relative quotient data, 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. When William was 17, his regiment received orders to proceed to England, and he, with his father and brother, who were members of the same military band, accompanied their division. On his return to the continent a year later, the Seven Years' War was raging, and soon young Herschel's health began to suffer from long and hard marches. In order to escape conscription, he was sent back, at 19, to England with his brother Jacob. Both boys obtained work in music and the next year William was appointed headmaster to the Durham Militia. Within two years he wrote six symphonies. At twenty-three and a half he became manager of concerts at Leeds, and before he was twenty-four he had acquired a recognised position as a teacher of music. Beside winning praise for his compositions, and deriving pleasure from his private study of Italian, Latin, and Greek. After a short visit at home he returned to England, aged twenty-five and a half, and a little later, at twenty-seven, was appointed church organist in Halifax. AIIIQ 140, relative coast data 0.53. George Frederick Handel, 1685 to 1759, a celebrated German composer. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 155. 1. Family Sterning. Handel's father sprang from that old bourgeoisie stock of the 17th century, which was such excellent soil for genius and for faith. Originally a barber, the older Handel later became a surgeon, and through the exercise of his profession, the trusted personal adviser of the Duke of Saxony. Two traits were particularly conspicuous of him, affability and a religious attachment to duty. The mother who belonged to a clerical family was pious and gentle and, like her husband, a wholesome upright character. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. George's earliest delight was a mimic orchestra of toy drums and trumpets, horns and flutes, and Jews' harps. The father, who had determined to educate his son for the law, bore passionately with this interest at first, but finding it was rapidly developing into a passion, he forbade his son to practice or listen to music. But George, aged five or six, contrived, and with the aid of a relative, to smuggle a clever chord to the garret, where he would secretly play after the family had gone to sleep. 2. Education Handel was first sent to school at the age of five or six. At seven, he received musical instruction from Sackow, the organist of the Leibfrankirche, but he continued his schoolwork as before. The boy is said to have passed the years from twelve to seventeen at the gymnasium, and to have received, during this period, counsel, if not precisely, instruction from the learned Sackow. 3. School standing in progress. George's organ teacher believed in hard work as he required his pupil, aged ten, to reduce a church cantata every week. It is not surprising that Handel later admitted that he worked like a devil in those days. Before he was seventeen, he was sufficiently advanced to act often as Zekel's assistant. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production achievement. A set of trios for two oboes and bass, discovered years after the time of their production, were recognised by Handel as his work composed at the age of ten years. Even Mozart wrote nothing at that age, writes a critic, that it can be compared with them for freshness of melody and maturity of musicianship, if they are the trios printed in the Handel Gesellschaft edition. Those years of hard work gave Handel all the learning his master could impart, as the latter himself confessed. When he was about eleven years of age, George was taken by his father to Berlin and introduced to the court of the elector. The bonds of etiquette dissolved in the boy's presence, and the courtiers vied with each other in singing the praises of the wonderful child whose performance upon harpsichord and organ put to shame the grey-haired professors of music. 7. Evidences of Precocity On his visit with his father to a relative employed in the household of Duke, Johann Adolf, the boy, aged eleven, by his amazing musical precocity, so won the hearts of the Duke's musicians, and of the Duke himself, that the whole court conspired to persuade the elder Handel, although without avail, to allow his son to devote himself to a musical career. 
a second triumph in berlin before young handel reached his thirteenth year inspired the elector to offer to complete the boy's education in italy and on his return to give him a suitable position at berlin but this offer was declined by the boy's father see also two one and six ai iq one hundred forty five relative cost of data point five three three development from seventeen to twenty six handel matriculated at the university of hale at the age of seventeen but soon after when he accepted an appointment as organist at the schlosskirch his duties threatened to interfere seriously with his legal studies within a year he went again to berlin and there he met and received encouragement from young johann Metzen, at that time an influential member of musical circles in the capital emira produced when handel was twenty lifted the young composer to the front ranks his first opera ran successfully for six weeks and was then replaced by a second nero between twenty one and twenty five handel spent some time in italy where he produced two operas two oratios and several choral and solo cantanas before his twenty six he was offered the post of kapellmeister to the elector of hanover which he accepted on the condition that he might first visit england a i i i q one hundred fifty five relative cost of data point six zero frederick william von humboldt seventeen sixty seven to eighteen thirty five a german philosopher and author a i i q one hundred forty five a i i i q one hundred sixty five one family standing see alexander von humboldt his brother page four hundred seventy two f f two development point seventeen one interests the humboldt family lived in the winter in the berlin townhouse in the midst of court life and in the summer surrounded by country atmosphere on the beautiful estate of tigel from his earliest years wilhelm could barely repress the desire to see and know as much as possible about everything that surrounded him and it was not content till every idea that presented itself before him was worked out in his own mind and thoroughly appropriated for the most part his interests were intellectual literary and artistic and it is apparently a curious contradiction to his other tastes that music was intolerable to him two education wilhelm and his brother alexander received instruction from very capable private tutors who later became distinguished in various fields camp the well-known writer of children's books taught the three-year-old william to read and write and within the following year instructed him in history and geography as well. From his fifth to his eleventh year, Wilhelm had two tutors, Koblenk, later a preacher of high standing in Berlin, and Klusner, afterward councillor to the little dukedom of Sonberg. During the next ten years, Kunth directed the Humboldt brothers' education. He was a young man gifted with a character of remarkable excellence, who had received a liberal education and acquired singularly courtly manners, and who later attained the dignity of actual privy councillor. Although Kunth did not himself give the boys formal instructions, his task with them on citizenship, philanthropy, etc., had a formative influence. When Wilhelm was twelve, his father died. The mother then took charge of her son's education, sparing no expense in securing the services of the best masters and relying upon trained judgment in the matter of their selection. The principal intellectual nourishment of these years, which was in Latin, Greek, and mathematics, was provided by Professor Fischer, a pedagogue whose mathematical school books continued in use long after his death. Lofer, a man of advanced thought, and later a famous professor and counsellor, expounded the principles of Greek and Latin. Letters by Professor Engel, author of Popular Philosophy, introduced the boys to the wide field of science. 3. School Sterny and Progress one day the noted physician Haim explained to the young Humboldts the twenty-four classes of the Linnaean system of botany, and Wilhelm, aged fourteen, readily comprehended retaining the names without difficulty. Professor Fisher derived unusual pleasure from the hours passed in giving instruction to the Humboldt boys, cheered by the bright hopes later so happily fulfilled. To Professor Engel is attributed the development in Wilhelm of that moderate, practical, rational, and humane philosophy which distinguished his later writings. Four friends and associates. The boy's father often entertained distinguished guests in his home. Not infrequently, the heir to the throne visited the Humboldt country seat, and Goethe was, on one occasion, when William was eleven years old, a welcome guest at Tickle. Wilhelm and his brother Alexander, two years his junior, spent their childhood and early youth in inseparable companionship, and although very different in temperament, 
they remained always best of friends. Wilhelm Foley's learning was anything but a pendant. He was ever ready to raise a laugh, and was made an idol of by all the house. 5. Reading, no record. 6. Production achievement, no record. 7. Evidences of precocity, no further record. AIIQ 145, relative kosher data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. In his 19th year, Wilhelm attended a series of lectures upon political economy given by Dom, an official in the State Department of Trade and Commerce, and followed a discussion on law and jurisprudence by Klein, Counselor of the Supreme Court of Judicature and a compiler of the new Code of Law in Prussia. In modern languages, he, with his brother, was instructed by Professor Lipowitz de Nans, tutor to the royal family and editor of a French paper in Berlin. Through friendly intercourse with Moses Mendelssohn, both youths gained valuable lessons in philanthropy and philosophy. David Friedander directed their minds to correct views on important points in practical philosophy, views that were ahead of the times. As youths of 16 and 18, the Humboldt brothers were received into a select group of intellectuals, disciples of Lessing and Kant, and Wilhelm's first paper, published when its author was 19, gives evidence of the influence of this association. Both brothers attended lectures on physics by the Jewish physician Marcus Hearns, whose home was a centre of culture. When Wilhelm was twenty, he and Alexander entered the University of Frankfurt on the Order, where, however, they attended few lectures, receiving most of their instruction under private tutors. At this time, Wilhelm was engaged in reviewing for Engel the entire philosophic and scientific literature of Germany. At the age of 21, Wilhelm removed to the University of Göttingen, where he devoted himself to the study of archaeology and Kantian philosophy. He became an honored member of the Romantic group, whom he met in the house of the celebrated philologist Hain. He made several journeys on the Rhine to Paris and to Switzerland. He read and studied and made new friendships, chief among them those with Schiller and Wolff. After brief but to him distasteful service in the court of Berlin, and following his marriage to Caroline von Dackerodden, a woman of high order of intellect and great charm, he retired from public life before he was 25 to devote himself entirely to study. One of his most interesting historical essays dates from the first year of this intensive literary activity. AIIQ 165, relative kosher data 0.75. Thomas Jefferson, 1743 to 1826, the third president of the United States. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing The American representatives of the Welsh family of Jefferson numbered several members of the Virginia House of Burgesses. Thomas Jefferson's father was a country surveyor, one of the three original justices of the peace, a colonel, and also a member of the House of Burgesses. He was a man of strong mind and sound judgment, eager for education. He was at one time appointed with the Professor of Mathematics of William and Mary College to continue the boundary line between Virginia and North Carolina, and to make the first map of the state of Virginia. The mother's family included warriors, churchmen, statesmen, and eminent scholars. The maternal grandfather was a colonial gentleman, a tobacco lord, wealthy, intelligent, generous, good-natured, well-respected. The mother herself, an admirable housekeeper, was an agreeable woman of clear and strong understanding, possessing the usual amount of education for a woman of her day and class. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Thomas was fond of hunting, riding, and other outdoor sports, followed on the old Virginia estates. But he was no less addicted to mental exercise. His thirst for knowledge was insatiable, and he seized eagerly all means of satisfying it. 2. Education. From the age of five until he was nine, Jefferson attended the English school, Music lessons begun early in this period were continued about 12 years. From his 10th to his 15th year, the boy attended the Latin school, learning there the rudiments of Latin, Greek and French, at the same time continuing his practice on the violin three hours a day. At the age of 14, and after the death of his father, Jefferson entered the Latin school of Mr. Morey. Here the classical languages were the only studies taught. 3. School standing in progress. Jefferson was noted at Morey's school for scholarship, industry and shyness. If a holiday were desired, it was not he who could be induced to ask for it, though he urged others to the venture, and if the requests were granted, he would first of all withdraw from the noisy crowd of his school fellows, learn the next day's lesson, and then, rejoining his comrades, begin the day's pleasure. 4. 
friends and associates, no specific record. 5. Reading. It is reported that by the time he was 15, Jefferson had read all the books in his father's little library, including the works of Addison, Swift, Pope and Shakespeare. From the first time, when as a boy, he had turned off, wearied from play and first found pleasure in books, he had never sat down to idleness. 6. Production and achievement. No specific record. 7. Evidences of precocity. Jefferson's earliest recollections were of his second and third year. At the age of five, he knew the Lord's Prayer, and this he employed on at least one occasion in the hope of achieving a special act of providence. AIIQ 145, relative kosher data, 0.60. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the age of 17, Thomas Jefferson entered the advanced class at the William and Mary College, and throughout his course he applied himself closely to his studies, maintaining his early interest in languages, and becoming deeply attracted to mathematics. At 19, he started legal study in preparation for practice and acquired unrivaled facility, neatness, and order in business. While he continued in this main occupation for four years, he did not neglect his athletic or literary accomplishments. He completed his self-directed course at 23 with a capacity for deep, thorough, and prolonged study in all branches of knowledge. At 24, he was received at the bar, and thanks to his erudition and the clarity of his ideas and principles, he made an immediate success of his profession. AIIIQ 150, relative kosher data, 0.75. August Frederick Ferdinand von Kurzbühel, 1761-1819, a German dramatist. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 150. 1. Family Sterning. The Kurzbühels were natives of Brunswick. The father, a councillor of legation, went to Weimar as secretary of the cabinet to the Duchess Anna Amalia. August Frederick said that he owed to his mother his intellectual gifts and the happiest days of his life. For although the daughter of a middle-class Brunswick family, she possessed a refined taste, with correct feelings and a mind well cultivated by reading. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Young August early developed a taste for reading. Even before his fifth or sixth year, he was more drawn to his books than to his rocking horse. He showed an early susceptibility to love, and at seven wrote a passionate love letter to a lady many years his senior. A period of pious religious enthusiasm occurred a little later, during which little August took much trouble to make sufficient variations in his prayers so that God should not be offended at being put off with the same things every day. This enthusiasm was, however, extinguished by attendance at church before the lad was ten or eleven. He began to doubt God's omnipotence, when told that he could not create another being greater and more powerful than himself. When some strolling players came to Weimar and produced Klopstock's Death of Adam, the boy was taken to see the performance by his uncle, the distinguished Musius. Although he was then so small that he had to stand on the bench to see over the heads of the others, he was stunned with delight and wanted some new mode of expression coined to make his feelings articulate. Not long after this occasion, a regular theatre was instituted at Weimar, whose stage company, one of the best in Germany, included the immortal Eikhoff. Young Kotzby attended whenever he could obtain permission, and was perhaps the most attentive spectator. Lessing's Emilia Gelotti, which he could repeat by heart, without ever having seen the book and Engel's Grateful Son became favourite plays, which August persuaded his companions to perform, he himself taking alternately every role. Pantomimic ballads, performed in superb style, were a great delight to him, and these two were imitated at home in a little puppet theatre. During college days at Jenna, he began to take part in amateur theatricals, and in these, women's parts were frequently allotted to him on account of his youth. From his seventh year, he was fond of writing verses and continued through his college days to forge rhymes. As a boy, Kotzbue was an ardent sportsman. He tells us that he had Goethe's permission to make snares for birds in the poet's yard. At Jena, when he joined in the usual student activities, he fought his duels with a bravado that is said to have distinguished him from the rest. 2. Education His father died when August was two, and therefore his mother devoted himself to the education of her children. She engaged as tutors, young divines, but these proved to be mediocre teachers who insisted on long hours of drudging at such works as Langdon's Colloquies and Luther's Catechisms, thus merely teaching the parrot to prate. 
Frau Kotzbühel herself taught the child to feel and early instilled in him a taste for reading. He began to learn French in his childhood, and Madame Louvel, a French governess, introduced him to Madame de Beaumont's works. August entered the gymnasium at Weimar in the third class, and there began to learn Hebrew. In the second class, he, with the others, began to learn the art of making Latin verses. Out of the tutorship of his uncle Morsius, at this time special instructor in the gymnasium, he was exercised in letter writing, and once a week in poetry, in which composition was voluntary. In the highest class, a scholar Heinz inspired his pupils with a taste for the Latin language, reading Terence aloud with a masterly manner. But the logic learned from an old scholastic and the dull, dry, universal history gave the boys an inverterate nausea. At sixteen, Kurtzbell became a student at Jena. Here, Wiedberg, later professor at Hemstadt, was an excellent teacher of Horace. The worthy old Boulet was an admirable French instructor, and Signor Valenti taught Kurtzbell Italian. 3. School study and progress. August never pursued his studies with greater acidity, nor made more rapid progress in them than when he was inspired by the hope of having his diligence rewarded with permission to attend the theatre in the evening. When this magnetic influence was lost through the burning of the theatre, Kotzbue sank for a while into extreme apathy and indolence. If his lessons were uninteresting, he stayed away to plan plays, or he slyly read romances beneath his cloak. At Jena he acquired great proficiency in French, and as he progressed in the, his classical studies, the high respect for the Latin tongue that had been gained from Heinz was increased. 4. Friends and Associates Moisius, the well-known professor and writer, Kotzbue's uncle by marriage, not only helped and inspired the boy in school, but out of school hours gave him valuable lessons in taste and morals, so that the boy came insensibly to imitate his worthy mentor's virtues. Fortunately, Moisius knew how to check his nephew's conceit, as well as encourage his genius, although it is doubtful whether he was as successful in the former endeavour as the latter. Goethe was a frequent visitor at the Kurtzbühel house, and was remembered for his kindness in talking to the lad and extorting him to diligence in his studies. Every word he spoke made a deep impression. Another poet, Klinger, whose honesty and ardour of temper charmed the boy irresistibly, was also a frequent guest. 5. Reading Kotzby used to run away from his playfellows to read undisturbed by the stable door until the sun had set and he could no longer see. The first book that impressed him was a collection of tales from various languages called Evening Hours, the favourite tale being Romeo and Juliet. This volume was read over and over again. Don Quixote and Sancho Panza became his companions, and remained his favourites until they were replaced in his affections by Robinson Crusoe. August was fond of Aesop's fables, and so delighted with the writings of Gleam, Uz, and Hagedorn, that very early they became objects of his imitation. With the age of six, he made his first attempt at writing poetry. The images employed were ransacked from all the poets with whom he was then familiar. Upon reading Goethe's Werther, the boy was affected with overpowering emotions and conceived a most enthusiastic attachment to the author. 6. Production and Achievement Kotzbue had made his first attempt at writing poetry toward the close of his sixth or early in his seventh year. Two of the lines particularly delighted him because they skipped so prettily. Es singet thy strengthen, lerch es hapfun thy schafgen amberg. For Daisy puzzled to make all the lines dance with equal agility but in vain. Soon he wrote a comedy, filling a whole octavo page, on the subject of the milkmaid and the two huntsmen. A love letter, C. 2. 1, written when he was seven, contained expressions and sentiments far above his years. Sometime later, an elegy upon the death of a lovely girl was written with such remarkable feeling that it won immediate success, and friends suggested that it ought to be printed. Thereupon, Kotzbue experienced a wave of vanity that supplanted all other feeling, even sorrow for the girl. When the theatrical mania came upon him, he influenced his followers to act out every new drama, and fell in his way. For the puppets and the panoramic ballads, he made a little theatre, first of wax, then of paper, and finally of wood, and set up wires to make the puppets dance. At the Weimar school, and while in the second class, 
he wrote a five-act drama on Catiline's conspiracy, and a comedy called All's Well That Ends Well, which Goethe asked to read. About the same time he took a small part in Goethe's Brethren, performed at a private theatre in Weimar. While a student at Jena, he wrote some verses upon the drowning of a fellow student, which were printed and set to music, and this success made him more devoted to the muses than ever. 7. Evidences of Recursity C216. As a lad, Kotzbue showed clear evidence of unusual talents. Unfortunately, his precocity was equalled by his vanity and impudence, which the training of his gifted mother and the poet Mosius did not suffice to check. AIIQ 145, relief quotient data, 0.60. 3. Developed from 17 to 26. At the age of 17, Kotzbue went to Duisburg University for a year, and immediately on his arrival instituted a private student theatre. Upon the invitation of the convent fathers, plays were given in the convent cloister, the first of these being the royals. At Duisburg, August continued to write without emitting one spark of originality, and a comedy and a romance confidently sent to a publisher were returned. Returning to Jena, the youth applied himself to the study of law, but continued to devote his leisure to the private theatre and to composition. He was more successful now. His plays were acted, and a small volume of his poems was published. With some of his friends, he instituted a poetical club, and his meetings original poems were read and discussed. Kotzbue was elected to the student fraternity, Grammania, a high honour. Before he was twenty, he left Jena, and returned to Weimar, was admitted as an advocate. A history in fragments and a collection of tales were brought out during the summer. Leaving Weimar suddenly, Kotzbue now served for two years, aged 20 to 22, as secretary to the Governor-General at St. Petersburg. During this period, a five-act tragedy, Demetrius, Tsar of Moscow, was received with applause, and a comedy, The Nun and the Chambermaid, was well played and pleased in public. From his 23rd to his 25th year, Kotzbue held the office of assessor to the High Court of Appeal in Raval. Here he again established a private theatre, which opened successfully with a play of his own, in which he took part. At the age of 24, he was ennobled and appointed president of the magistracy of the province of Estonia. During the year, he wrote a novel which was popular, and for some months he edited a monthly journal for the mind and heart. At 26, a serious illness threatened his life, but in an ensuing state of melancholy, he wrote one of his two best-known works, Mention Huss and De Rule. AIIIQ 150, relative coach of data point six zero. End of section twenty seven. Section twenty eight of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume two The Early Mental Traits of Three Hundred Geniuses by Catherine Cox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 18, Part 5 Pierre-Simon Laplace, 1749-1827, a celebrated French astronomer and mathematician. AIIQ 145, AIIQ 170. 1. Family Standing Laplace was the son of a poor labourer of Lower Normandy. Because of the scientist's own reticence on the subject, no information regarding his family and ancestry was preserved. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests C. 2. 3. 2. Education. Laplace owed his early education to the patronage of some persons of importance whose interest in him was excited by his early precocity, and who placed him in the College of Seine. From this institution he advanced it through the military school of Beaumont. 3. School standing and progress. It was at Beaumont that Laplace first gave evidence of his great mathematical powers. Previously he had been remarkable chiefly for a wonderful memory and extraordinary acuteness in debating points of theology. 4. Friends and associates, no record. 5. Reading, no specific record, but C23. 6. Production achievement. After he had completed his course as a student in Beaumont, he remained in the school as assistant professor of mathematics, completing his mastery of mathematical analysis and its application to dynamics and astronomy. 7. Evidences of precocity. C2, 2, 
3, and 6. AI IQ 145, relative quotient of data 0.20. 3. Development from 17 to 26. At the age of 18, Laplace journeyed to Paris, seeking there greater scope for his mathematical powers than a province afforded. After initial rebuff, he obtained an enthusiastic response from de Ellenbert, who appointed him professor of mathematics at the École Militaire of Paris. At 23, the young scientist communicated two papers of great value to the Academy, and the following year applied his mastery of analysis to the study of planetary motion, with the result that he made the most important advance on physical astronomy since the time of Newton. From the age of 24, Laplace continued for 14 years. Investigations which culminated, when he was 38, in discoveries that finally determined the stability of the solar system. AIIIQ 170 Relative quotient data point six zero. Metastasio Pietro Antonio Domenica Bonaventura Trapassi, sixteen ninety eight to seventeen eighty two, a noted Italian poet. AIIQ one hundred forty five. AIIIQ one hundred forty five. One family standing. Felice Trapassi, the poet's father, came from an honourable family of Assisi. He had served as a private in the Pope's guard. But after his marriage, he went into trade, setting up a little drug shop. There is no record of the mother or her family. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Pietro, when no more than a child, was fond of scribbling verses. On occasion also, he would hold a crowd attentive in the streets of Rome, while he recited impromptu rhymes on a given subject. 2. Education. Gravina, director of the Arcadian Academy, who adopted the talented boy when he was about 11 years old, decided to educate him to be a jurist. He made him learn Latin and Greek, and began the study of law, but according to the academician's plan, the boy was also permitted to exercise poetry, although only as an elegant pastime. At 16, Pietro took minor orders in the church. 3. School standing in progress. Pietro worked hard enough at his studies to injure his health. 4. Friends and Associates. As Gravener's adopted son, he associated with well-educated boys. Handsome, bright and winning, he charmed everyone. 5. Reading. No record. 6. Production and Achievement. At the age of 11, young Trapassi was taken by Gravina to literary assemblies in the houses of nobles and prelates, and there on occasion he would improvise as many as 18 stanzas in a single evening. At 12, he translated the Iliad into octave stanzas, and two years later, composed a tragedy in the manner of Seneca, which was published. 7. Evidences of Precocity, C. 2, 1, and 6. AIIQ 145, Relative Quotient of Data, 0. 0.53. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Upon the death of Gravina, Metastasio, aged 20, inherited a considerable estate. Tired now of the drudgery of study, he determined to obtain some employment about the pontifical court, and while waiting for it to amuse himself. He failed to secure the ecclesiastical appointment, and at the end of two years of fast living, his money was gone and with it his friends. Although he did not like hard work, nor the law, he was afraid of poverty, and so he determined to work as clerk to a distinguished Neapolitan lawyer. At twenty-four, he secretly composed a serenata, Gli Orti Esperiti, for the celebration of the birthday of the Empress. The authorship was discovered by the famous prima donna, La Romanina, who in consequence adopted Pietro, taking him and his family into her house. He now had the opportunity of meeting the greatest composers of the day, and of pursuing his studies in the art of singing and of composition. At twenty-five he wrote the text of an opera on Dido, Didon Abandanonata, the success of which was prodigious. AIIIQ 145, Relive Cultural Data, point five three. Michelangelo Bonarotti, 1475 to 1564, a famous Italian sculptor, painter, architect and poet. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 160. 1. Family Standing The Bonarotti family belonged to the respectable Burgo nobility. Michelangelo's father was an impractical, easy-going individual of no profession. Nothing is recorded of the mother or her family. 2. Development to age 17 1. Interests At school, Michelangelo devoted most of his time to drawing, a pursuit not included in the curriculum and which his father tried to discourage, 
as he did not wish a painter in the family. Michelangelo early sought the acquaintance of artists, and took every opportunity to converse with them. From his 14th to his 16th year, during the period of Lorenzo di Medici's patronage, the youth devoted most of his time to the study and practice of drawing, painting, and sculpture. He also cultivated the society of distinguished contemporaries as they met at Lorenzo's table, and through them he was introduced to the great men of the past in literature. It is characteristic of Michelangelo that, living among parasites, he never lost his independence of character. 2. Education Of Michelangelo's earliest years, nothing is recorded. At the age of thirteen, he was sent to school in Florence, where he learned to read and write, and was introduced to the elements of Latin. During the same year, his reluctant father was finally persuaded to apprentice the gifted boy to Ghirlandio and Curato, and from then he learned the principles of his art in a sound and simple manner, developing at the same time extraordinary skill of hand. At fourteen, he was chosen with Granassi from among the art students to attend the new art school of Lorenzo di Medici, then under the direction of the excellent teacher Bertoldo who instructed his pupils in drawing, painting, and sculpture. 3. School Standing and Progress, C2, 2, and 5. Apparently, Michelangelo attended the common school for less than one year. 4. Friends and Associates. At the age of 12, the boy found a congenial friend in Granassi, C2, 2, 2, two years his junior, who was already a pupil of Guerlain Dial, and who lent Michelangelo his teacher's drawings. At the age of 13, he was associated with Ghirlandio and Curado, and from 14 to 19, with the Medici and their brilliant artistic circle. Among the latter, he especially attracted the attention of the poet, Poliziano, who often conversed with him, and who took special care also to provide him with suitable instruction. 5. Reading At 14 or 15, the young artist began to read Dante and other Italian poets, and the Bible also, and these works continued to engage his attention throughout his life. 6. Production and Achievement At the age of 13, Michelangelo was so proficient in drawing that he received a salary. Although he was then in the first year of his apprenticeship, his passion for his art was so strong that every available space became a sketch service. It is written that he drew so well at this time that he caused wonder to all who saw it, and envy to the less generous. The young artist's first recorded work, a free coloured copy of The Temptation of St. Anthony by Schoengauer, belongs to his 14th year. Other drawings executed at the same year made his master exclaim, This one knows more about it than I. But in many years later, Michelangelo modestly stated that he had himself known more of art in that day than now. He made so clever a counterfeit of a borrowed drawing that he was able to return it to the owner or the original without detection. In his 15th or 16th year, Michelangelo carved the mask of a fawn his second recorded work, and his first known work in marble, and he worked on Masaccio's frescoes. Four works are known to belong to the period from his 15th to his 19th year. The Battle of the Centaurs, a really characteristic study, was executed when the sculptor was no more than 16 or 17. 7. Evidences of Precocity, C2, 2 and 6. AI IQ 145, relative coast data 0.43. 3. Development from 17 to 26. The young sculptor lived in the Medici Palace until he was 19, when he fled to Bologna, having foreseen, after the death of Lorenzo, the revolt against the weak and foolish rule of the younger Medici. At Bologna, he was befriended by Senator Aldovani, who took the youth into his house and there shared with him a literary feast, reading aloud the works of Dante, Petra, and Boccaccio. By the time Michelangelo was 20, peace had been restored in Florence, largely through the influence of Savonarola. Another Lorenzo di Medici now favoured the young sculptor with his patronage and commissioned him to execute a statue of St. John. This work had been preceded by a wooden crucifix card when Michelangelo was 17 and two small statues of perhaps his 19th year. The sculptor's next statue was a Cupid, which was sold, but without Michelangelo's knowledge, as an antique to a cardinal who prided himself on his capacity as a critic. At the age of 21, the sculptor arrived in Rome, bearing a letter of introduction to this cardinal, who, in spite of the deception that had been played upon him, received the young man cordially, and soon learned to value his judgment. In the following year, although still a poverty-stricken artist, the youth gave financial assistance to his father, who had contracted a heavy debt. At the age of 23, Michelangelo executed for Sino Gali 
a very fine pacos. A little later, the Pieter was begun, and when, in the following year, Michelangelo completed this marvellous work, he had indeed accomplished what no other artist then living could have done. It was probably during his 25th or 26th year that Michelangelo finished the Madonna of Gludes, which holds in sculpture the same position as the Sistine Madonna holds in painting. At 25, yielding to the reiterated requests of his father, the young man returned to Florence. AIIIQ 160, relative culture data point four three. John Milton, 1608-1674, a celebrated English poet. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 170, one family standing. Milton's paternal ancestors belonged to the gentry. The grandfather, a young man, was also a church warden, who disinherited his son John, the poet's father. A young man of character and education for becoming a Protestant, and later turned Scrivener, prospered rapidly, and had in the end a plentiful estate. The older John Milton was fond of literature and of music, and his musical compositions were published during his lifetime among those of 21 foremost English composers of the day. The mother, a tailor's daughter, and known for her charities, was a most excellent mother. 2. Development towards 17. 1. Interests. From his childhood, Milton was a poet, and Tanny was already a serious little Puritan, and he was noted two years later for his impetuosity in learning. 2. Education. John Milton was the pride and care of his parents, who destined him for the study of humane letters. His first formal instruction was received, before he was nine years old, from a private tutor, a university man who grounded him well in Latin, introduced him to Greek, and at the same time awoke in him a feeling for poetry, and set him upon the making of English and Latin verses. This instruction was continued till, at the age of eleven, John entered St. Paul's School, where he remained five years. Until he was thirteen, the instruction of private tutors was continued in addition to regular scholastic activities at St. Paul's. In school and out, Milton appears to have learned not only Latin and Greek, but also French, Italian, and some Hebrew. At sixteen, he left St. Paul's and entered Cambridge as a lesser pensioner. This was not an unusual age for entrance, for boys frequently entered at fifteen or even at fourteen, as did Milton's friends, Diodati. The daily college routine included in those days religious exercises, lectures, and examinations in Latin, Greek, logic, mathematics, philosophy, etc., and public disputation. 3. School Standing and Progress At St. Paul's, Milton, aged 11 to 16, took passionately to studying. He seldom left his lessons for bed until midnight, a practice which produced frequent headaches and was the first cause of injury to his eyes. No definite record is preserved of his standing in his classes at school or of his progress during the first year at the university. 4. Friends and Associates Gill, the clever son of the school director and a writer of graceful Latin and Greek verse, was Milton's first literary mentor and critic. Charles Deodati, a gifted youth, far advanced in school, was his most intimate and most devoted associate in both school and college. His first tutor, Young, remained a lifelong friend. 5. Reading From the age of 11 to 16, Milton read much English literature, finding congenial matter in such works as Spencer's Fairy Queen and Sylvester's translation of Du Bartas. Rhymes, images, and turns of expression in his verses, written at fifteen, suggest that Milton was then familiar with a wide range of poetical writers, for they recall Sylvester, Spencer, Drummond, Drayton, Chaucer, Fairfax, and Buchanan. 6. Production and Achievement Milton's first extant compositions, paraphrases of two psalms, date from his sixteenth year. Of these, Masson says, apart from the imitative faculty shown in the verses, they do have some poetic merit. What well, Dr. Johnson's characteristic criticism is as follows. They raise no great expectations. They would in any numerous school have obtained praise, but not excited wonder. A letter written from Cambridge when John was sixteen gives happy expression to devoted affection for his friend and also shows skill in manipulating a formal Latin style. 7. Evidences of precocity. Milton appears to have been regarded by his parents as a child of unusual promise. See also 2, 5, and 6. AIIQ 145, relative culture data, 0.75. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Milton attended Cambridge as an undergraduate from the age of 16 to 20. 
but the years were not joyful, for he found his companions on the whole uncongenial. Several poems in Latin and English were written at this time, and some noteworthy Latin orations, but the poet's future greatness was not yet anticipated. Continuing in residence until he was twenty-three, he received his master's degree at the end of that period, after studying so intently that he had seriously aggravated the weakness that was to become his affliction. Elegies and poems appeared in Latin and English, including the Ode on the Morning of Christ's Nativity. It is probable that his relations with his colleagues became more happy as his reputation began to spread. Indeed, during the last years at the university, and as the fellows of his own college recognised the extraordinary wit and reading he had shown in his performance to attain his degree, he was recognised as without an equal, and came to be admired and loved by all. At the age of twenty-four, John Milton returned to his father's home, and there, with abundant leisure, he studied not only the classics, but music and mathematics also, and wrote between his twenty-fourth and twenty-six years, beside many other poems, the Allegro, Le Penseroso, and Comas. AIIIQ 170, Relief Culture Data, Point 2. Daniel O'Connell, 1775 to 1847, an Irish patriot and orator. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing. The O'Connells were an old and prominent family of Ireland. Daniel's paternal grandmother related to Donal Mahoney, the terrible papist that ruled South Kerry with his 4,000 followers was a woman of great talent, and reckoned among her gifts that of song from her, Daniel is said to have inherited much of his energy and eloquence. Daniel's father was a third son and one of twenty-two children. His mother, a woman of a high order of intellect, came from an old and propertied Catholic family. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. As early as the age of nine, O'Connell preferred reading to play. He liked ballads above all things when a boy. See also 2.7. His devotion to his native country was early apparent. When no more than 15, he told a Frenchman who was surprised at his failure to object to violent abuse of England, that England was not his country, and he was therefore not offended at the abuse. He said that as an Irishman, he had as little reason to love England as a Frenchman had, perhaps less. O'Connell's interests were not literary or intellectual. He appears to have inspired among his fellow students a wholesome dread of his prowess as a pugilist. 2. Education At the age of four, Daniel learned his alphabet in an hour from an itinerant head schoolmaster. The next reference to his progress is a statement that he was sent by his uncle at the age of 13 to the Reverend Mr. Harrington's school near Cork. Being destined for the law by his uncle, who was also his guardian, he was sent abroad in his sixteenth year. He first spent a short time at Louvain, then entered the English college at St. Omer, where the curriculum included the study of Latin and Greek authors, French, English, and geography. O'Connell reports reading Mignot's Harangues, Cicero and Caesar, at sight, Domesthenes, Homer, Xenophon, Cenobasis, and Dagasso's speeches. When just 17, he entered the English college at Douay. 3. School standing on progress. Because he was so attentive, O'Connell was the only boy not beaten at school. Always remarkably quick and persevering, he could not book the idea of being inferior to others, and in consequence of his ambitious spirit, during the short time he was at Louvain, he rose to a high place in a class of 120 students. And St. Omer, as he reports, being second in Latin, Greek and English, and eleventh in French. Four friends and associates. O'Connell's two close pressing rivals at St. Omer's were Walsh, Artwood, Right Reverend Doctor, and Bishop of the Midland District of England, and Christopher Fagan, later a general in the English India Company's service and judge advocate of the Indian forces. Five reading. The first book he ever read was Captain Cook's Voyage Around the World. See two two for books read as part of his school course. Six production and achievement. At the age of ten, O'Connell composed a drama on the fortunes of the House of Stuart, and while at St. Omer's, he wrote a very credible essay upon the systems of education pursued in England and France, respectively. 7. Evidences of precocity. Until after his third birthday, Daniel was brought up by a herdsman's wife. The following anecdote is preserved from this early period. Just before he left the cabin, a wedding took place there. Being a precocious and observant child, Daniel noticed at home how frequently parties assembled under his father's hospital roof and asked, Is there a wedding here every night? 
from the age of seven or perhaps even earlier, the boy felt a presentiment that he would distinguish himself. At nine he remarked on one occasion, I'll make a stir in the world yet. He always had one object, and that was to do something for Ireland, for he hated Saxon domination. AIIQ 145, relative kosher data 0.75. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Because of the state of affairs in France in 1793, Daniel and his brother left hastily, wearing the despised tricolour cockade for protection against the Republicans, and returning to England, entered school there. A little later, the uncle reported that Dan is indeed promising in everything that is good and estimable. At the age of 18, O'Connell began the study of law, first entering Lincoln's Inn, and a year later, Dublin. He read very widely during the following years, and before he was 23, he was called to the bar. At the age of 19, he had been finally converted from sympathy with Toryism to popular opinions and principles. At 21, he was inspired by a visit to the House of Commons to write these words. I too will be a member, young as I am. I even now not appear contemptible. I will steadfastly and preservingly attach myself to the real interests of Ireland. At 23, attending a Catholic meeting in Dublin, he made his first political speech. The passing of the Legislative Union Act first stirred him up to press forward in politics. AIIIQ 145, relative kosher of data 0.75. Charles Augustin saint Beuve, 1804 to 1869, a French poet and critic. AIIQ 145, AIIIQ 155. 1. Family Standing St. Beau's grandfather and great-grandfather were town officials. His father first held minor positions in Boulogne, excised the custom office, and later was promoted to the position of chief controller of the consolidated duties. He was an intelligent man whose library, in the marginal notes which covered many of its volumes, bore evidences of his careful and wide reading. His expressed reflections and judgments showed moderate views. Some of his maxims are profound and admirably expressed. They give evidence of the same flexibility of mind, with the same vivacity of phrase, which mark the epigrams of his son. Little is known as St. Beau's maternal ancestors, beyond the fact that his grandfather was a sailor and his grandmother an English woman. The mother had a practical turn of mind, simple and quiet manners, and a very remarkable accuracy of observation. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. When at school in Paris, St. Beuve wrote that he found much consolation in religion, for having at this time no confidential friend to whom he might confide his troubles, he prayed to God, and thus opened a way to dissipate his sorrow. But before he was seventeen, he had become entirely emancipated from all religious beliefs. 2. Education A posthumous and an only child, St. Beuve was brought up by his mother with the utmost care. Although she was a Catholic, she did not hesitate to send her son to M. Balerot's secular school, for there he could enjoy this, the instruction of a good teacher and humanist, M. Cloet. At the age of thirteen and a half, having completed the entire course of study under M. Balerot, including also an extra portion of rhetoric, St. Beuve persuaded his mother to send him to Paris, where he entered the college Charlemagne. The next year, he reports studying in Greek the second book of the Laylad. Plutarch's Life of Cicero, and the Gospels, and in Latin, Sallust's Jugurthine War, and Thoughts of Cicero, and the third book of the Aeneid. In his third year, one of his teachers was Paul Francois Dubois, the modernist founder of the Globe, soon to be deprived of his teaching position because of his liberalism. When 16 St. Beuve transferred to the College Bourbon, attending, in addition, the Athene for three hours each evening, where he heard lectures and followed courses in physiology, chemistry, and other sciences. 3. School standing on progress At the college, Charlemagne saint Beuve was always first or second, rarely third, in the weekly compositions. At the end of the year, he received the first prize in history. He was very fond of his professor there, and the opinion of the boy, nobody could teach a class better than he does. At college, Bourbon, he pursued his studies with his usual application and success. Here he took first prize for Latin verse. Fifty-one of his college themes, both in French and Latin, were later published as models of their kind by one of his former masters. Because of his studious habits and the honours he won in the college, he was treated with special consideration by his patron, M. Landry. When at school in Paris, saint Beuve boarded with this gentleman, 
sat at his table and met his particular friends, who treated him like a large boy or a little man. 4. Friends and Associates The boy's teachers were attached to him and lavished much attention on him. With two of his schoolmates, whose interests were congenial, he formed close relationships warmly attested by letters. 5. Reading St. Beuve took an interest in literature apart from his regular schoolwork. Among others, he expressed enthusiastic admiration for the writings of Casimir de la Vigne. 6. Production Achievement A note written when he was 16 and entitled A Young Italian Poet at the Tomb of Tasso was thought worthy of preservation by his teacher, Du Bois. 7. Evidences of Precocity No further record AIIQ 145 Relative Kosher Data 0.75 3. Development from 17 to 26. At 18, St. Beuve's reading centred in the French Revolution. He had formulated his ideas of government, rejected the theory of the divine right of kings, and politically was a moderate radical. Having a decided taste for the study of medicine, he spent the next four years at the medical school, where in spite of the fact that he became introspective, morbidly curious and morose, a lasting advantage was imparted by the discipline of scientific training. Encouraged by this former teacher, the liberalist Du Bois, try his talent for writing without giving up his medical course, he began at 19 to write geographical sketches and book reviews for the Du Bois Journal. One at least of the reviews shows a singular open-mindedness and such an uncommon grasp of critical principles that its author was chosen to review Hugo's Odes and Ballads. These articles brought about a friendship with Victor Hugo, who praised some of his original verses, and won him over to that branch of the Romantic school of which he was the head. Friendships with Lamartine and de Musset followed. At 22, finding it easy to make a success of literary work, St. Beuve gave up medicine, and by the age of 23 he was already a learned man and a skilled writer. His life, poems and thoughts of Joseph Delamore appeared when he was 24, and the next year his second book of poems, Consolations, was published. For this time, and because it paid well, he began writing articles for the Revue de Paris. AIIQ 155, relative coast data, 0.75. Daniel Webster, 1782 to 1852, a famous American statesman, orator, and lawyer. AIIQ 145, AIIQ 150. 1. Family Standing. Webster came of Scottish stock. His grandfather was a farmer and freeholder. His father, a frontiersman, who rose to the rank of captain in the French and Indian Wars, and became a colonel during the Revolution, was an unlettered man of strong mind, sound common sense, correct judgment, and tenacious memory. From being a farmer and an innkeeper, he became a legislator and a magistrate. The mother was a woman of more than ordinary intellect, who possessed a force of character which was felt through the humble circle in which she moved. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. At the age of eight, young Webster listened to the political discussions of his father and his father's friends. The boy was not successful in farm work, and in the summer he found hanging so lonesome that his father sent him back to study with his tutor. At the academy he did not mix much in the sport of the boys, but he wept for joy when his father told him he was to go to college. 2. Education. The father's highest ambition was to educate his children to the full extent of his rather limited means. He sent all of his sons to the town school, but Danny was given further training because his physical frailty seemed to preclude a robust occupation. The boy entered his first school at three or four years of age, and his second about a year later, where he received instruction in reading and writing. He continued to attend school from time to time whenever he could be spared from the farm. When he was 13 years old, his father found that the improved family finances made it possible to plan a college education for one son. Daniel was chosen, and accordingly entered, at 14, Phillips Exeter Academy, then under the leadership of the eminent Dr. Abbott. Here he began the study of Latin under a brilliant tutor, younger than himself, and at 15 he received special instruction in preparation for college. Although he had studied Virgil and Cicero with much pleasure, we read that he entered Dartmouth at 15, miserably prepared both in Latin and Greek. 3. School standing and progress. Webster could not recall a time when he could not read the Bible. In fact, at a very early age, he could read even better than his master, whereas in writing he was so poor that he doubted if any master could improve him. 
From later school days, his teacher recalled that Daniel was always the brightest boy in the school, and Ezekiel, his brother, the next. But Daniel was much quicker in his studies than his brother. He would learn more in five minutes than any other boy would in five hours. Their master, recognising remarkable qualities in both brothers, told the father that he would do God's work in justice if he did not send both Daniel and Ezekiel to college. When a jackknife was offered as a prize to the one who would commit to memory the most verses in the Bible between Saturday and Monday morning, Daniel Webster won by repeating 60 or 70 verses, and even then was stopped several chapters short of what he had learned. On entering the academy of 14, he was placed in the lowest class, but was promoted after a short period. Daniel's manners and clothing subjected him to the ridicule of some of his classmates, but his tutor encouraged him by saying that he was a better scholar than any in his class, and that he learned more readily and easily than the others. Although he learned quickly either poetry or prose, he found it impossible to make a declamation, for he could not speak when all eyes were fixed upon him. At the age of 15, he learned Greek for college entrance in six weeks, under the tutorship of a senior from Dartmouth. He surprised his Latin tutor on one occasion by the length of a Virgil translation prepared in one night. Webster entered a college recommended for his abilities rather than for his attainments, and during his course there, although he was a good scholar and punctual in attendance at all exercises, he was never spoken of as the best in his class. 4. Friends and Associates A companion of his early boyhood days was an old English soldier who had deserted at Bunker Hill, and who taught the boy to fish, in return for having the paper read to him. Other associates were members of the family and schoolmates. 5. Reading At the age of seven, Webster entertained the Teamsters, who stopped at his father's inn by reading aloud out of the Psalms of David. At ten or twelve, he could repeat the Psalms and hymns of Dr. Watts. He read Pope's essay on man, and according to one authority, learned to repeat the whole of it in a single day. He said later, we had so few books that to read them once or twice was nothing. We thought they were all to be got by heart. Through a small circulating library, Daniel obtained The Spectator. He also read the criticisms of Chevy Chase for the sake of the verses cited. For the age of nine to thirteen, he read whatever he could lay his hands upon, and he read at all hours. Even while tending the sawmill, one eye was on his book, the other less attentively on the machinery. His speed was proverbial, and he himself recalled that at fifteen he read through in one sitting the common translation of Don Quixote in three or four volumes. 6. Production and Achievement At the age of sixteen, Webster wrote some verses which, according to his critic, exhibit no more poetic talent or power of versification or vigour of mind than any lad of sixteen similarly educated might show. 7. Evidences of Precocity. See also 2, 2, 3, and 5. When Webster was about eight, he bought a cotton handkerchief inscribed with the Constitution of the United States. Having read this, he remembered it more or less ever after. AIIQ 145. Relive kosher data 0.60. 3. Development from 17 and 26. At college, Daniel Webster had a good reputation for scholarship. He was recognised not only as the best writer and speaker among the students, but also as a skilled athlete. While attending Dartmouth, he persuaded his parents to prepare his brother for college. He himself assisted the project financially. By superintending a small weekly paper, he earned enough to pay his board, and he increased the family exchequer, doing vacation by teaching school. At the age of 18, Webster delivered a 4th of July oration, which is powerful in thought. He began to study politics, at the age of 19 entered the law office to prepare for the profession his father had chosen for him. He read as much as he was able, both history and literature. At four months of legal work, he took charge of an academy and an addition copied deeds in order further to help in maintaining his brother at college. From the age of 20 to 22, he was in the law office of Mr. Thompson, and then for a year with Mr. Gore, who was later commissioner to England and governor of Massachusetts. During all this time, Webster kept up his legal and literary reading. At one time, he carried out legal translations from Latin and Norman French. Always for recreation, he enjoyed fishing, shooting, and solitary riding. At the age of 23, he was offered a post at a good salary, but was persuaded by Mr. Gore to refuse it as unlikely to lead to anything better. Accompanied by the warmest recommendations from his employer, Webster was shortly after admitted to the practice of law at Boston. At 25, became attorney and counsellor of the Superior Court of New Hampshire. AIIIQ 150, relative coaching data 0.60.
Johann Georgian, Wickelmann, 1717-1768, a German critic and author, the founder of scientific archaeology and the history of classic art. AIIQ 145. AIIIQ 145. 1. Family Standing. Winkleman was the only son of a poverty stricken cobbler of Silesian descent and his wife the daughter of a weaver. 2. Development to age 17. 1. Interests. Winkleman's father wished to train his son to be a cobbler, but the boy showed no desire to engage in this occupation. He was intent on study, always slipping away whenever he could to read a book. He disliked childish sports and when out as the proctor of the younger children, he memorized Latin and Greek vocals from his little pocket notebooks while the children skated. From the Latin writers he copied passages he thought beautiful, and these he treasured as of greater value than all theological works. Indeed, during the hours of religious instruction, he was inattentive to the discourse, for he was reading classical works. Cicero was his favorite writer. 2. Education Wickerman attended the lowest school of the village, but his eager mind was not satisfied with the poor instruction imparted there, and he begged his father to send him to the Latin school, an almost unprecedented desire for a village boy. The request was granted, and he became the pupil of Rector Tabert, an enthusiastic and devoted teacher. In the gymnasium, the emphasis in instruction was on Latin, 20 hours per week, but Greek was taught also with some care while geometry, history, and geography were crowded into a single hour of private and paid instruction. 3. School study and progress. History, geography, languages, and the works of the classical writers held the youth entranced. In imitating the style of his favourite author, young Wickelman stood first among his classmates. 4. Friends and associates. The pastor, the teacher, and the head beadle, as well as other townsfolk, were all kind to young Wickelman. The boy was loyally devoted to his parents, and did not leave home until after his mother's death, when his father no longer needed his financial assistance. 5. Reading By the time he was fifteen, the boy collected a little library of his own. It was about the same age that he first came upon works on art and sculpture. 6. Production and Achievement Winkleman helped to pay his expenses at the Latin school by singing in the church choir and the village Carendre. A popular chorus, composed of poor children who sang publicly. Even as a boy, Johann's scholarship was so sound that he became Tappert's assistant with the younger children, and attended the private lessons of the two sons of a distinguished lawyer in order to help them. In his first reported thesis, written when he was fourteen and a half, the young scholar discussed the problem whether the image of God was created or added as a supernatural gift of God. When Wiggleman was fifteen, his teacher, Rector Tappert, lost his eyesight, and so came to employ the boy as his assistant and a minusis. It may have been about this time that Johann persuaded the other boys to help him excavate for archaeological treasures in the old mounds of the Huns. At sixteen he became choir prefect and assistant at the organ. 7. Evidences of Precocity. C2, 1, 2, 3, and 6. AIIQ 145. Relative cultural data, 0. 3. Development from 17 to 26. Winkleman went from the provincial Latin school to attend the famous Colonicist Gymnasium at Berlin, where he earned his board and room by acting as private tutor to the rector's children. Under a very unusual teacher named Dam, he learned Greek with perhaps even more than his usual enthusiasm. Two years at the Salzwet Gymnasium followed, interrupted only by a foot journey to Hamburg to attend an auction of some beautiful editions of Greek and Roman authors. At twenty, Wickerman attained a scholarship at the University of Hale. Again, he had to coach in order to meet his expenses. Disappointed with the theology course, he soon ceased to attend the lectures. Devoting his time rather to deep reading and eager discussions with his many university friends. In theology, his point of view was practically that of the deists. In philosophy, he was a follower of Wolf, and the lectures on this subject were the only ones he attended regularly. Wickerman's enthusiasm for classical study was equaled by that of one student only, Bruchart, later a distinguished military man. At 22, Johann was invited to the great library of the university chancellor. During the next three years, he showed the aspect of a homo vagus et inconstans, which the rector of the Colnicius Gymnasium had earlier recognised in him. After holding a tutorship for a brief time in a cultured family, he spent a semester at Jena studying medicine and mathematics 
than selling his books to defray expenses, he took his academy journey. As tutor to a young man of a good family, he got as far as Frankfurt. He was a wanderer, but apparently a wanderer with a purpose, for on one occasion he made the long journey to Hale on foot in order to look up a reference in the library. Although urged to remain at his old university, and promised assistance if he would do so, he refused. At the age of 25, he accepted an assistant rectorship in Seahorsen, which he had refused two years earlier. AIIIQ 145, relative kosher data 0.60. End of section 28.